So well, now you can hear me. Hello and good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first Applied Artificial Intelligence in Forestry, Timber and Wood Conference. My name is Matthias Gradner. I'm Director of Technology at Advantage Austria, the internationalization agency of the Austrian Economic Chamber. And I'm here with my colleague or organization partner, yeah, I'm Clemens Wasner from AI Austria, and we are organizing this conference together with Matthias here since quite some time already. Also, we are supported by a couple of other organizations, namely uh, Tech House, the home of innovation, who supported us in finding the topic and talks, namely Croatia AI, AI Serbia, AI Bulgaria, and of course, the Austrian Professional Association of the Timber Industries. And right now, I just want to get our organization partner who supported us along the way in this conference to be called Johannes Müller, Managing Director of Tech House. Hello, Johannes, can you hear us? Hello, gentlemen, good morning. Yeah, I can hear you very well. Wonderful. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, Tech House is uh, contributing to the forestry, timber and wood sector and what is your interest in organizing this conference together with us? Of course. So, so first of all, we think that uh, the timber and forestry industry has huge potential when it comes to implications of digital transformation. And that's what we do at Tech House. We work with corporates, with SMEs and startups, uh, when it comes to driving uh, innovation and digital transformation in various industries like the forestry industry. Uh, artificial intelligence is one of the key technologies that we work with on a daily basis, be it uh, for applications in, in machinery, but also to develop new business models in the in traditional industries and that's why we are very happy that we are allowed to support you guys um, in today's conference and uh, also uh, our partners along the way after this conference. Wonderful and we are very thankful for that and uh, Clemens Advantage Austria and AI Austria it's actually not the first collaboration in organizing this applied artificial intelligence conference 
and even not the first time to do this online. Um, maybe we can share a little bit about uh, where we come from so far. Yeah, so actually this is the first, first time we're doing an event together. We started two years ago in 2018. We called it the Applied AI Conference. And the aim was to, to focus on real-world application of, of AI, put in a global perspective. So from the, from the outset, we had international speakers from Asia to North America, plus uh, create a platform for B2B networking. So on the one hand side, uh, professionals from the specific industry, like today forestry and timber and wood industry, plus AI, uh, AI professionals. So yeah, our last big event was in May of this year with 2,600 participants, which was actually much larger than we ever ex ex expected it to be. And during the preparation of the event, uh, we received feedback or we got strong indications that there is interest in making a, a, a specialized event like the one today, especially for forestry, timber and wood. And so we said, instead of, of only having the large events once a year, this is now the first uh, topic specific event we are conducting. There, we already have some ideas what could be the next one, but let's say this is, this is now the first one. So, and when it comes to who is participating today and how does the interaction with the participants and between the participants work, I hand over to Matthias, who will give you a brief rundown. Yeah, actually to do this online is quite fascinating. I mean, we saw it this year in May that we um, achieved a participation number of over 2,500 people from around the world, as you mentioned. And, uh, if you look at the, participation, the participants that were interested in forestry, timber and wood, there were actually only 50 or 30 people that are really active in that field. What really enables us and those people with that special interest to come together in greater numbers is to do this online. Because today we look at around 250 participants from over 35 countries. We have uh, forest technology companies, forest owners, forest associations, institutions, the public sector, of course, forest technology companies, startups. Uh, we have sawmill owners and timber logistics uh, 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 entrepreneurs. We have the whole spectrum and that from five continents. And this is really impossible to achieve in a physical event because just imagine all the CO2 we would need to uh, use just getting you to one location. And right now you are joining uh, from the comfort of your own office or from your home. And uh, I uh, just quickly, um, because this is all live, you have to know we do this live and we manage 15 different time zones. So I hope everybody gets, gets their schedule right today. What I want you to answer right now, uh, as you see on the, on the right side of your screen, there's a little uh, a, a slido window. It's an audience interaction tool. And there we already asked you one question, uh, namely, uh, which part of the supply chain in the forestry timber and wood industries do you think will be most affected by uh, artificial intelligence? And you. Uh, uh, gave us some feedback and the, 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 the most popular feedback was actually forest management. Forest management, wood processing and logistics, also harvesting actually, I see, oh, logistics got even bigger. Um, that's, that's your first feedback. So thank you for that. And what I actually, the, the, the poll stays open. Uh, what I want you to answer now actually is um, let us know from where you are joining from. Are you in your office? Are you in the home office? Or are you in the forest? I don't know. Do you sit on your harvester and watch this on your iPhone? Please be careful. Yeah, office. But we are actually, we are actually in our home office, so to say, yeah, because uh, we are broadcasting live from you to you from a high risk area. Uh, that is Austria and Vienna <laughs> in our interesting new times. And I see most of you are also in the home office. So 
hope you enjoyed this conference today. Uh, keep listening in and uh, uh, stay tuned through the day. What I uh, want to go through with you today is the program. And But before that, we, we uh, just shortly want to uh, uh, touch a topic of how to collaborate with our network that we built up uh, with this Applied Artificial Intelligence conferences through the years. This is the largest uh, uh, AI conference dedicated for forestry, timber and wood. Our other events are also very successful and among the largest one in the German language area. Clemens, how do you stay in touch with our network? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, all the talks today will be recorded. And if you get back to the conference page in around one or two weeks time, we will inform you when exactly this has happened. Uh, the, the entire videos can be seen. In addition, uh, if you want to stay in the loop, like uh, downloads of speaker material, announcements of upcoming events and so on, I highly recommend that you follow our joint LinkedIn page. I think Matthias is showing it. Yeah, you can see it now where we frequently post on, on, on upcoming and past events or also on events which are similar or, or related. Yeah, I would also like to use this opportunity to, to thank our international partner network. Uh, so first of all, our European friends from AI Serbia, Croatia AI, then when we look in the direction of Asia is the uh, German Chinese Association for Artificial Intelligence and, and so on. Uh, if you would like to become a partner of future conferences or, or, or of AI Austria, please do not hesitate to, to ping me. I think the, the best way is to do this via LinkedIn. I think most of the speakers we also recruited in that channel. And good, yeah, that, that's it from, from that part. Now, when it comes to the B2B part of the conference, because when we made, when we developed the con the, the concept for the online event in May, we were thinking for a long time what is actually the key KPI we are using for this type of event. And pretty pretty soon we realized it's actually not the views we get on YouTube because that's, an, that's a nice number, but you don't know what's behind it. So we said we measure our success or the, the success of a B2B event uh, on the level of interaction between the participants. And how this works, Matthias will give you now a brief rundown. Right, and just to say goodbye to Johannes for a second, because he has to run to his first meeting. Uh, we see you in a little bit. Bye, Johannes. So what uh, is actually also to be added is the network of Advantage Austria, you Austrian companies that are the majority today know it. We are your partners for your internationalization worldwide. We have offices from Santiago de Chile to Tokyo, and we are also open for you, uh, non-Austrian companies, to collaborate with Austria and Austrian companies. So we're glad you join our event. So what differentiates our event today from, uh, from all the other uh, 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 virtual conferences that you might have attended already is the fact that you can see who else is, attend is attending you can see the other participants and you can actually meet those other participants in a video call. And our platform supports you in that. And I will just quickly go through some main functions of our platform with you, um, which you, I hope, already checked out in advance. And uh, so we are here on the main site of our event and I'm logged in with my account. The first thing I want to show you is your personal agenda. Here on the top, it says agenda. And if I click on that, I actually see today's agenda. I will just shortly filter for the conference. We are now in the opening part and here it says 10 a.m. This is my time zone. If you are joining from the US or from China or from anywhere else you have registered with your time zone and it will show your time zone, your local time zone. So don't start uh, uh, calculating what actual time this starts. The program helps you with that. 
So at 10.20, we start with our first keynote by Stora Enzo and go through the day with our other speakers that we will get to later on uh, from Canada to New Zealand, from everywhere in the world. Have a look. Another important part is the meeting sessions. If you are taking part of, in one of those meeting sessions, you will be able to request and be requested for one-on-one -on -one meetings with all the other participants. And let me just quickly show you how that works. If I navigate to the participant part here on the top, I can see a list of persons or a list of companies. I have a little filter here on the left side that can tell me who is active in the field of forestry tools and the value chain software development. And it gives me a couple of suggestions. I can look, sorry, Enrico, I have to check your profile. I hope it's GDPR, I confirm what I'm doing, I think so. And if I'm interested in meeting Enrico, I just hit the button after going into his profile that says request meeting. I go request meeting, I can uh, send him a little message and we have the time zone setting for Europe and Vienna because we're in the same time zone and I waiting, um, I'm now waiting for a confirmation from Enrico. What he gets now is a message saying that Matthias wants to meet you and I will just quickly show you how that looks like. I have some open meeting requests myself. I have here this meeting request from Marcel from Japan. And um, what I can now say is uh, cancel or accept yeah? or reschedule. If I accept the meeting, it actually lets me choose a time slot within the meeting time slot that I registered to in the beginning. So I say I'm available for meetings between 10 a.m. and uh, 7 p.m. on Thursday, which is tomorrow. I can select a 20 minute time slot here and all these time slots are available for me and myself. So the tool helps you in scheduling these meetings. You don't have to ask them, are you available at 12? No, nope, that's already been done. The system helps you scheduling these one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I say confirm time. The meeting is confirmed and will show up in my personal event agenda. Uh, let's see here, um, for, for Thursday, of course, which is, which is tomorrow, I have a meeting with Marcel at 12 a.m. And by hitting that green video button, I can actually log in and attend that meeting. So I have to give access to my camera and then I'm in a video call and you can hold your meeting. So. So far, so good. You are all watching us in the in the live stage where there's a YouTube stream. And we are already at the end of our intro, actually. Um, if you have any questions throughout the day on how to do meetings and uh, how to uh, um, uh, use this platform, don't hesitate to contact us in the questions, uh, question sections on the right side of uh, this screen. Good. And what I want to trail over to now is actually our first set of keynote speakers. We are very, very glad to have them with us. Stora Enzo is a household name in the worldwide forestry, timber and wood industries and also paper and pulp. They are one of the largest companies in that field worldwide headquartered in Finland and Sweden, but also with locations in 30 plus other countries in the world. And they have some really intriguing projects in AI, machine learning, computer vision, data science, etc., that they will share with us today. I'll give you a short intro video on our speakers. And uh, after the intro video is done, we will uh, um, see them directly. So bear with me for a second. So, all right. So here we go. All right, 
Welcome, welcome Martin Schagal from Stora Enzo, Jonas Isoketo and Mika Korbenranter. Hello to Austria and Finland, actually. Can you hear us? Hello, everyone. I can understand Hello. you well. Yeah. Wonderful. I can hear. Hello. I see. The, it looks like you're all in your offices. Yes, actually, today is a special day, being back for one day at least in, in the beautiful wooden office here mm. in, uh, in Lower Austria, in Ips, actually. We are honored. And actually, I think, Martin, you will start with your presentation. Right. And I will take it from the beginning. What we would do is just hand over to you now to do your intro. And we'll be back a little bit later with the Q&A sessions. Dear participants, remember on the right side of your screen, there's the Q&A area. You can ask questions to our speakers. You can upvote questions from other people. And we will ask them those questions in the Q&A session to follow. Part of their presentations will be shared later on. So we already answered that question in the beginning. And now please welcome Martin Schagel. Uh, Scout Digital Mills at Stora Enso, based in Austria. Welcome. Hello. Thank you both for your kind introduction. Um, hello, audience, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Martin Schagel. And um, as a digital scout, Smart Mills, I am catering for the production related digitalization agenda at Stora Enso Wood Products Division. Um, well, as I believe innovation never happens in isolation, um, I need to say many thanks to the organization team uh, for bringing us together here on, uh, on the virtual table and hereby initiating uh, networking around AI in timber and in forest industry. Thank you very much. So after a brief introduction, uh, I'd like you to take on a short journey through our digitalization funnel, our digitalization approach at Stora Enso, and then uh, that will be followed by two AI case examples presented by our forest digitalization manager, Mika Korvenranta, and then uh, the second case presented by my colleague, uh, our lead IIoT data scientist, Jonas Isoketo. Well, uh, everything that is made with fossil based materials today can be made from a tree tomorrow. That is our clear belief at Stora Enzo. And it actually highlights our opportunity to contribute to a greener economy. So, as being part of the bioeconomy, um, Stora Enzo is a leading provider of renewable solutions, whether it being packaging, biomaterials, paper, or, or also wooden constructions. And in that business, we are, we are actually acting global. So let me, let me introduce the wood products uh, division a little bit more detailed here. Um, Besides having our classical sawn timber business for many decades now, um, it is our new innovative massive wooden solutions like cross laminated timber um, that um, enables us building building even higher and stronger with with wood than ever before. So, uh, as you know, wood is the oldest, but yet also the most modern building material in the world. And actually it is the only one that is renewable and recyclable. And at this point, it couldn't be better. Uh, and please allow me to quote Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, um, because I think her speech that she just recently gave is perfectly fitting uh, to this event. So she was, um, stating the following. Uh, we know that the construction sector can even be turned from a carbon source into a carbon sink if organic building materials like wood 
and smart technologies like AR are applied. And here I'd like to uh, take a little bit a closer look now how we apply uh, besides our, let's say, classical products and services, even more digital tools uh, uh, and, and, and actually uh, emerging technology um, in the future. So here you can see just some examples of digital tools and solutions that we at Sora Enzo are already offering to our customers. And one of the tools is called CLT 360. So this is a tool that clearly adds value to the construction side by optimizing actually the, the logistics workflow. So as some of you might know, this is still a quite manually decision driven workflow at the construction site. But we are actually having the data and the information. So what we did is we we provide a, a digital tool um, that helps guiding or gives guidance on, on the on the logistics workflow and the process at the construction site. But this is just one of the tools. There are plenty of um developments still ongoing and in these developments we are not only utilizing let's say um digital technology um we are all we've already started to utilize also more ai uh, driven technology but more to come later on um i would now uh, like to introduce just briefly, the approach that Stora Enso takes for helping us and supporting us on developing digital solutions. So, Stora Enso already 2016 um, announced a so called digitalization strategy. And the cornerstones of the strategy have been, firstly, a clear commitment for digitalization. Not only a clear commitment, it's, it's also a yearly fund that is available for the whole company. So everyone can apply for digitalization funding by coming up with a new challenge, with a, with a novel idea. And that is then gonna be, be funded. And secondly, actually supported by strong capabilities. So that means that we've been installing centrally a center of excellence that um, holds strong capabilities in, in the field of AI as well in cloud technology, for instance. And those resources are supporting us on the way developing um, proof of concepts, pilots, and and at the end of the day, of course, it's all about seeing that scalable solutions running in the mills, in the logistics, but also towards our customer. So thirdly, we are having this, let's call it development funnel here that helps us running fast experiments that can be stopped, of course, at any point in time if they are not supporting the business. Um, but clearly the focus must be and actually is on the realization of value. So um, I think uh, many of you might have experienced that the jump over from the more explorational phase to the real implementation is really challenging. And actually that is also something that we experience. Uh, just mentioning a footprint in wood, a footprint in wood products by having 17, 17 meals uh, spread all over Europe. So this is clearly a point where we are now focusing on and trying to improve. But I think now um, from here, it's, it's a perfect point now to, to take you a little bit deeper uh, and give you a little bit deeper insights about actually solutions in the field of AI 
that we are successfully running. And now we are going, going to show you two different use cases. One is focusing on AI in forest monitoring. So the very beginning of the value chain, which in this, you know, challenging times with changing climate and changing environments is a really, really uh, important topic for us in the wood industry. And secondly, then uh, a topic from, from the mill operations where we utilize AI for, let's call it the next, the next step in, in developing our maintenance. So a case called predictive maintenance. But now, Mika, please take us uh, through AI in forest monitoring. Thank you, Martin. And hello, hello to everybody. My name is Mika Korveranta. I'm working in uh, Stura and Forest Division as a digitalization manager, and my uh, well responsibility area is precision forestry, which is covering basically this uh, this kind of remote sensing, GIS, and, and uh, analytics combination. So also different kind of AI cases is in my my table, and now I'm sharing a approach related to forest monitoring what we have been working and, and a bit different aspects in in that forest monitoring how, how we are seeing that uh, development area and uh, next slide please uh, first i will speak about drones how to how to utilize drones in in forest monitoring and uh, then i'm going to the satellite data case, how to utilize satellite data in an efficient way, and then about the combination of, of different kind of data sources and uh, how to create actually value with, with different uh, approaches. But firstly, about drones. Uh, so we can basically utilize the drones in forest business uh, to, to get the single image from the air to get the, actually the overview of the area and, and what is going going on in, in the forest so that is basically the first step first step uh, utilizing the, the data but in mono, many cases we need pretty detailed information about the forest that we can do correct decision making how the how the forest is actually what is the situation in in even in tree level? So in these kind of cases, we need to to do really advanced analysis of of the data, and then in these cases, the AI solutions comes into the into the table. And how the drone process goes, we have been developing standard uh, uh, process to to collect the data, how to how to do the flight the, the high altitudes and, and the, the flight image parameters with the drone devices and we are using RGB camera and multispectral camera when doing the data collection so that is the, let's say the first step to to start to, to collect the data in in correct format that, that can be analyzed so and based on that data we are doing the analysis and uh, we have uh, automatic analysis to, to provide actually the, the results uh, what is what is the situation in the forest and in here we, we see the one example uh, of the output results we have we see here uh, dots with uh, with green yellow and red telling the the three health situation in this case so so we can we can identify this three health uh, in in classes in in three level and the, the accuracy uh, we have succeeded to, to to get is, is pretty pretty high and we are quite quite happy about the the results in in this area and uh, before doing the tree health analysis we need of course to find find out the the locations of the trees and that is the first step. We need to find the locations. Then we need to find out the three species. What is the three species in the area? And then 
then do the do the tree health analysis and then also other analysis based based on those informations and these three three health accuracies and three species estimation accuracies are, are pretty pretty high and and the three species accuracy please note that it's uh, basically in, in nordic forest that that species accuracy so we, we have a bit less species in, in nordics to, to to identify which are the most most crucial species for us okay next slide please and uh, different approach for the satellite case as drone is quite small scale analysis and uh, satellite data is more when we are interesting in large scale we can we can get the good good overview of of the areas where we are operating and we are we are interested and ai solutions that that we have been working for instance are forest damages mapping and um, in in the left image is uh, this kind of risk mapping compared to different uh, satellite data data sources and, and and calculated what is the what is the risk for the uh, bark beetle damages in, in the area and on the on the right hand picture actually the the red areas are not so clearly visible but there is as a red red areas this kind of windfall detection areas so we have been doing this change detection analysis and and to to map where is the windfall uh, detection so windfall damage is basically to identify those those from the remixes so and uh, basically when when we get this satellite let's say large scale monitoring analysis we can then focus on the correct correct areas and for instance we can go go and check in the forest and do uh, more detailed analysis with the drone devices and so these are quite closely related uh, technologies and next slide please and this is a bit about the about the overview of of the data sources so i was speaking about the satellite and drone data uh, ai tools in this area and one uh, one area which is really crucial in this modeling cases is the labeling data and for the labeling and to do the actually the training of, of the models we have been collecting or or well co collecting and, and visiting in the forest to get this training material to to train the, the model uh, so basically what is the tree species what is the tree health condition so we we have plenty of or, or thousands of trees to this kind of training material and what what is uh, like really large scale like labeling and, and training data material for the for the future uh, is this harvester machine data to, to use that efficient ways because we can get really precise information about the about the forest stand when we are doing the cutting and use that as a as a training data and, and do doing more more advanced analysis so that is one crucial area for the for the training of, of the models and how to actually to get get the value out from the modeling is is that we need to provide this analysis to the, the actual users and, and of course this kind of uh, uh, applications where where we are sharing the information comes to the to the place in that sense that when we are doing the analytics we need to have really like simple way way to utilize that that information in our business and there is there is then for instance mobile and desktop different kind of map map solutions for instance to to visualize that that information and also we have been working with this virtual forest uh, case to to get the digital twin of of the forest visualized so that is one one aspect to to show 
uh, that uh, analyzed information from forest monitoring side. And that, that was briefly my presentation and thank you. Thank you for giving the opportunity to present this case. And now I hand over to, to Jonas. I'm working as a lead IIoT data scientist at Stura Enso. So my, my job is to uh, develop data-driven solutions for our uh, meals uh, that they can, they can uh, boost their operations. And today in this presentation, I will uh, go through our uh, predictive maintenance uh, solution that we have uh, in place. Uh, next slide, please. So we, we in, at Sturans, we are a very big company and we have very uh, huge variants in, in uh, our products and also our operations, how to produce those products. So we have paper, board, pulp, uh, sawmills, etc. So good point being a, such a big company is that uh, we have power to uh, experiment something in one place, then uh, monitor its uh, performance and then decide uh, whether to uh, scale it out or terminate the solution. And, and Martin was showing you the, our digitalization funnel, funnel approach. And I'm, I'm proud to be here to present this the, uh, predictive maintenance, which is in the uh, rolling out phase. So we can really, really uh, enjoy its uh, value that it's generating and the value that it's generating that is uh, we can say that it's it's way much bigger than its cost. So our journey started two more than two years ago at one of our paper mills uh, in Finland. Uh, we didn't know, uh, so we wanted to uh, test if we can uh, improve our uh, maintenance operations and especially their timing, optimize that. So we didn't know can we do that uh, with the help of data, but we tested that. And uh, we executed a pilot in the paper mill and the results were very promising and we were happy. So that is why we wanted to develop that further and productize the solution and take that into an use in other mills as well. That is why uh, we implemented our solution to uh, board mill and, and then it was the second implementation that we, we like expected the implementation time uh, was way much faster. So there is always a learning curve when, when we are scaling out, then the effort is, is uh, the ma margin effort is always smaller. And again, in the board mill, the results were very good. And that is why we want to extend uh, our solution to pulp mills, uh, which is basically biomaterials in this picture. And, and when extending our core solution to pulp mills, there were some new features that we needed to develop. For example, uh, time delays are a little bit different in case of uh, pulp making than, than uh, paper and board. And, and now, now uh, uh, this is up and running in pulp mill, and now we are extending that to uh, sawmill, which is wood products in this picture. Uh, 
in in sawmill the problems are are lit, quite same in maintenance point of view uh, but the data uh, sawmills are not so data asset heavy uh, and the, and the, of course the manufacturing type is discrete manufacturing when the others were uh, process industry so we need to uh, add add new sawmill specific flavors to our solution but still the core core is same and also because the sawmills don't generate those huge amount of data uh, we we have uh, added uh, new instruments to our our saw lines uh, to to monitor also some critical points and now now uh, uh, previous slide please now we are uh, rolling rolling out our solution globally globally and now now we are in the middle of the feasibility study where we prioritize uh, our work where where to go first and uh, put our solution in place next slide please uh, i'm not going to talk too much about technology but i want to say say shortly to anchor or strategic IT suppliers what we are using because uh, we see that we at Sturans are a big company and we, we want to uh, build our own platforms and that is basically Azure Cloud. We have data platform, IIoT platform, AI platform, computer vision platform, uh, you name it. And, and we want everything to reside in our own own Azure subscription. Uh, of course, we could use the uh, existing uh, vendors technologies, uh, but we prefer to uh, own everything and 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 run in our own subscription because we want to make uh, our scale outs uh we want to optimize our scale outs and 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 uh, reuse uh existing modules uh, via platform thinking and and we want to avoid vendor logins and there are several reasons why why we want to keep everything in our own hands of course we are using vendors but they, they are willing to work inside our Azure tenant. And the next technology, what I am briefly, I will go through is SAP. That, that is because that is the, the de facto uh, technology for our maintenance, in our maintenance context. So that is operational system that our maintenance technicians uh, are using. If, if some maintenance notification is not in the SAP, then it, then it's, uh, then it doesn't exist. And, and uh, that is why we, we need to have very solid integration between bidirectional integration between SAP and Azure. So if we want to uh, output our analytical results, we want to close the loop that, uh, uh, that, that uh, results are written into, into operational system because otherwise this Azure is and AI it's just a nice nice standalone tool without uh, strong connection to daily operations next slide please and and uh, because this is advanced AI conference I want to I want to highlight that we have we have real uh, 
AI in place instead of some just some some rule based. Uh, uh, we, we, we use deep learning models. Uh, for example, I can tell that this this uh, predictive maintenance solution that uses LSTM. If there are data scientists in in line, you you know what that is. Uh, and and we do not uh, use AI just because that it's it's sexy and nice nice to use AI nowadays. Our main reason is that the prediction power is not good enough in classical methods, and that is why uh, more sophisticated uh, 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 methods are needed. And and uh, business case is that. You know that already in case of predictive maintenance. So we want to avoid non-planned shutdown. So every minute when when our machines are not producing uh, our products due to technical failures, those are costly. And and now this our tool tool shows it beforehand uh, which functional location needs. Uh, needs uh, maintenance and when. Next slide, please. I doubt that there might be some some time pressure uh, to close and open the Q&A. So I will very quickly share my screens because I always want to present uh, not not. Uh, slide where but actual things so i hope technology works and and uh, and and uh, i saw real thing very quickly i don't go through the details but to, just to show that we have something really in place so this is this is something that our maintenance technician, technicians are able to see. They use that daily. They see our algorithm is, is highlighting the most uh, biggest anomalies. And, and maintenance technicians can see that, OK, this functional location in Finnish, I don't translate that now. But this shows that there is some anomaly going on. The actual value is not something that it should be with the given, given conditions that we have in other sub processes. Uh, I think we are in overtime, so I close my, my session now and I'm handing over to Martin. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your uh, for listening in now. And um, I would just like to to open up uh, for the rest of the time to ask your questions. If, and if uh, we cannot take all of them, we are more than happy to reach out to you via the networking opportunities. So, thank you. Yes, and we actually got a lot of questions. And people seem to be very interested in your services and have very specific questions. So please, uh, everybody, now you can vote the questions that you want to have answered. We don't have much time. And I go into the first question. Kevin from Kenya asks, which satellite technology can you use if you are interested in monitoring fragmented small-scale woodlots? For example, one acre but covering an extended coverage. I think, answer. I think that goes to me that question so in when we have a, like cover really small we need to can you hear my voice by the way good so, so that goes to me and then in this case when when the area is, is pretty pretty low uh, small area so we need to have satellite resolution with, with high high resolution so one uh let's say like uh, planet.com satellite data source is, is for instance one one uh, source 
for doing the analysis, which is three meter uh, resolution. And uh, well, it depends on the on the case and also the accuracy what is needed to have in in each case is because. Uh, when we go really detailed satellite data, it also the cost will go high. So we need to, the, the business case needs to be identified with the level of, of accuracy is needed. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. The second uh, upvoted question we received is now going rather in the direction of business, team building, organizational structure. It says, what's your approach to make versus buy? Because many companies, especially in the classical manufacturing industries, struggle in, in Europe to find a clear line here, how to define core competences and so on. So, so what's your take at Store Enzo? I can take this one. So <clears throat> I think we need to decide a little bit uh, between, between our business divisions, but um, historically we are uh, clearly coming from, from, from a make, from the make side. So this is uh, the traditional side. We are we are still, let's say, providing our products in this way. But um, of course, I mean, make and buy is um, still something that is continuously uh, needs to be needs to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, valued internally. But um, uh, to 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 discuss that in more detailed uh, in a more detailed way, I think we should take this on a one on one. Okay. As far as the next questions are concerned, they're basically, they're quite similar. The first one is, how do you determine tree species via heat signature and so on? And then the follow-up question would be, what is uh, recall and precision for each class of tree health classification? And how many tree classes are there? Uh, I can start with the tree health classes. So we have been working with uh, three different classes. So health, like stress and, and the dead tree. And uh, well, of course, there is a difference between the, let's say the, the recall and the precision accuracy between the classes. And uh, for instance, a dead tree, that is pretty, let's say easier and, and easier to find, which is clearly dead. But then the, the class, which is the, let's say stressed class, that is the, of course, the, the most tricky tricky one and because we want to of course to find out the early infested and early stressed trees so that is the let's say the area where we have been focusing and then even maybe to to have more categorized for the early like uh, stressed trees but that, that, that is the let's say the tricky tricky part to, to find out and did I answer all all the question what was in in that yeah I, I there are actually a couple of even more technical follow-up questions so i suggest if if someone is uh, interested they can always book a one-on-one -on -one with the three of you uh the last question i would uh, take is regarding the satellite data uh it's using which satellite data are you using which provider and if this is also publicly available for our other companies or how difficult is it to get this type of data? Uh, one, let's say, key data source in, in satellite is, is Sentinel data, which is uh, like open open data, to, but it's possible to, to get, get for the other, let's say, commercial purposes as well. And uh, Landsat is, is Let's say one one option, but then the resolution is pretty. Let's say it's large larger resolution. So uh, Sentinel data, which is ten meter resolution, that gives pretty pretty accurate results. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah, lo looking looking at the time, uh, we unfortunately already reached the end of the first session. Uh, definitely, thanks a lot from our side to you. Uh, to the participants, please feel free to schedule bookings with the three colleagues from Stora and so. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the, the session and also enjoy the rest of the day. So goodbye from Vienna. Pleasure having you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for listening. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. And 
we head on over to our next speakers, which we will shortly introduce using that intro video. Namely, Professor Petuchnik from the Salzburg University of Applied Sciences. He's the head of department for forest products technology and timber construction. It's quite a long title. And he's also joined by Rudi Schrammel, who will be also presenting and is also active in the forest products technology major of Salzburg University of Applied Sciences. And let's see if we have a connection to Salzburg. Hello, Alexander. Hello, Rudolf. Hello. I hope you can hear me. On your microphone, then we are set and ready. Can you hear me? We can hear Rudy. Okay. And we can't yet wait. Let's. Uh, you have uh, muted yourself. Maybe try unmute your microphone with the button on the on the, on the bottom. Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. We can hear you. So, did I pronounce that correctly? The Salzburg University of Applied Sciences, Forest Products Technology and Timber Construction. Yes, perfect. Thank you. We will head over uh, to your presentation. Uh, we will restart the Q&A session. It will be a shorter presentation and we'll see each other in about uh, 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 yeah, 30 minutes when we will answer the questions that we get from the audience. Yes, perfect. Pleasure to have you and talk to you a little bit later. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Alexander Berutschnik. I was introduced so far. Many thanks for that. And uh, today I will give you a short presentation together with Rudi Schrammel, my colleague. Uh, we are presenting results we achieved so far to, with the aim to get traceability from the forest to the sawmill. I will give you more information while the presentation. Um, we got the funding for, for more projects, especially from the um, FVF, the Wissenschaftsfonds in Austria. And it's always important to give the names of those who finance us. So. That will be our um, timetable. At first, I will talk about data acquisition in the forest. Uh, we know this is a harsh environment. We know there is a lot of uh, things going on and we need specific data to achieve traceability from a specific log. So we try to get the information from a specific log in the forest and then be able to identify this log in the sawmill or whatever the next step after the forest is. And we have two main tasks to solve. One is data acquisition. That will be my part of the presentation. And then the algorithms, the usage of artificial intelligence uh, models, as well as other uh, preparation models, that will be the task of Rudy, who will talk after me. So the main questions we would like to solve is where do the specific log come from if then the customer the end customer who buys a wooden table he would like to know is this tree is this wood from a specific forest by where i have to um, have um, some concerns due to radioactive uh, things or or it's not uh, used uh, sustainable so a lot of questions occur in the head of our end users and we have to be able to answer if our tree is from a specific region where there are no concerns necessary. And to be honest in these questions, very often we cannot do this because the logs are not coming from one um, forest to one sawmill. And we can say absolutely for sure this is a log because we know papers can be uh, changed or get lost on the way from, from, the, from the lorry and so on. So, what is the guarantee for the end customer to know this log is from this forest? And it is like a fingerprint. So our approach was the fingerprint approach and an inherent property of a log is its, uh, its uh, appearance. 
And we tried to solve this question or to get ideas what will be the main tasks on this way. So at first we got into the forest and we were um, felling trees or we were at the forest side where the trees were felled and we collected data there. It was done by a cable lift. This is uh, in, 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 in mountainous regions. This is a typical way how um, logs are uh, produced and hauled and transported. And you can see the information on this slide. I will not uh, talk too long about this, but I will give you some images what happened. So in the forest, we have the tree. Then we cut it into different sortiments. That is, if you uh, make this uh, type of transport, you have to do the, the, the sortiments in the forest. Then we transport these different logs to different sawmills. And we were getting data, images in the forest, and we were collecting the same images in the sawmill. And such equipment has to be cheap. That is one thing. It should not cost too much. It has to work also on harvesters. So we have a very harsh environment. And that was our approach. We would like to have an image of in the forest. We would like to have an image in the sawmill and then make the clear connection. Because as we have seen from Stora Enzo and so on, if we are in the sawmill, then it's quite easy to, um, to follow the way through our industries. But the, the very complicated thing is the, the direct uh, application and the direct identification from forest to sawmills. So that was our task to achieve here, the clear traceability. We produced a specific equipment for this uh, study, for, the, for this part of the study, and we tried to collect images here in the forest with defined um, circumstances for image collection. You can see here it was winter and it was very nice, so we enjoyed it very much. But now we come to our first um, observations. Here we got the image in the forest. And here you see this image, this is done in the sawmill. And usually in the sawmill, you have a cut, a cross cut that your saw plates and so on, they are uh, not damaged too much because of dirt and so on. So then you have a, a, uh, a cross cut of two centimeters and you see here, this is the same log and it has totally different appearances from the forest to the sawmill. And you have different appearances and you would like to identify this log again under all these thousands and millions of logs that also occur and that is quite a huge task. So we were looking on a lot of different logs. It was more than 100 logs and or more than 100 images. And we tried to see what are the main questions. It's we have dirt, we have colors that are applied. We have, you can see here, light influences due to sun and so on. We have the surrounding. If it's a lot of bark and other logs are around, then you have to find these edges. And you have different cuts or mechanical uh, cracks and so on that will occur after the, um, the situation in the forest. And this led us to the, um, to the question, how can we get a really information like a fingerprint or an iris scan of the human, uh, if, you, if you identify humans, that is very, really one image that you can identify over the whole process. And our approach was to use different spectra. In chemical analysis of biogenic materials, we, we lose a lot of um, spectrometric methods. And we produced images of different of a log in different spectra. You can see here from the visible spectra, starting the visible spectra at 445 nanometer uh, wavelength, up to infrared spectra, so we did hyperspectral imaging. Every image has specific information. So if you make an, an image at uh, 444 uh, nanometer or at, uh, for example, 989 nanometer, you get an, another image. The same here, we have two different camera systems, hyper, um, um, hyperspectral camera systems where you can get all of the spectra. And what this chart is showing 
which spectra are the same and which spectra are different. And what we can what can we see here? Here can we, we can see if we are that is the visible visible um, wavelength. That's the light that's visible. Here the images are nearly the same. And then we have the IR spectra, and here we have different images. So if we take an image here and an image here, we get two different information of one log. And if we go more in the infrared um, um, wavelength, then you can see we have three different uh, images. So our goal was how many different camera systems do I need to have really good information about the log? And here you can see, uh, based on a measure, uh, on, a, on a metric, based on artificial intelligence, it's a specific neural network. We have, we have heard uh, something about uh, such structures now, so that's nothing to, that I will talk about now in detail. Here we have one, two, three, four peaks, four peaks where we can get very good differentiation. And that means we need a camera system where we have four different cameras to achieve good information about the different tissues and so on on such a cross cut. Here you can see then a system we built up. It's a um, hyperspectral camera system with four cameras and three different types of lightning. So which light do I apply on the log? And here you can see first examples. We took at first uh, examples of wood species where we thought we will get very good information. And here you can see, for example, um, Robinia pseudoacacia on in UV light, in infrared light, and for example, a halogen bulb. And here we can see the images in the different spectra. And that's very important because now we can maybe get more information out of the images because we get different images and can do analysis on this. Of course, we need then um, re image registration and so on. So that means we get for these different camera images, one image that is bearing all of the information and uh, therefore we have to, to build up uh, a stack of images. and. That was the thing so far we were able to do. So we developed a system to get very good cross-cut images that we can achieve um, very easily because these camera systems, uh, maybe all of you know the GoPro camera, such action cameras, they are really uh, also functioning in a harsh environment. We are using Im camera systems with not a very, very high solution that are very expensive and sensitive. Sensitive. We have cheap solutions developed to gain these images. And now we have the image and I will pass over to Rudi. Rudi Schrammel will tell you now what we are doing with these images and our approach to be able to make a clear identification. Also, if there are uh, things cut away, if you are when two centimeters cutting away with the log, can you still um, still identify the log and so on? That will be done by Rudy. Rudy, please take over. Okay. Thank you. So, so hello, nice to meet you. I, I will start uh, soon with the, with the presentation. So, ah, okay, the, the slides are here. Um, so I'm part of the Tree Trace project, so where, the, where Alexander is the head of the project, and I'm doing the computational stuff um, at the University of Salzburg, and I'm working in the field of computer vision. So artificial intelligence has already a very long history, so the beginning was in 1950s, and then in the past 50 years, the, there were different stages of developments within the field of artificial intelligence. So the first step was machine learning, um, which, are, which is basically a mathic, mathematical way of, of doing decisions in, in computer science. And since 2010, um, we have the new field of, of deep learning, which is a change in, in, in paradigm. And I want to point out how this change also affected 
um, the way how we do the identification of, of roundwood based on on log end images and what also happened in other fields of applications. So I will, I will try to explain this now. So basically we can we can distinguish between machine learning and deep learning somehow. Um, machine learning is more or less a, a math mathematical way to, to find a decision based on a model. So if you want to, to distinguish between a car and a, let's say between a cat and a, and a dog, then you need some, some data, a lot of images of dogs and a lot of images of, of cat. And then you extract features which represent um, a cat and features which represent a dog. And then you have the model which, which enables to classify between cat and dog. Um, and deep learning is somehow different because um, it's, it tries to, to, to simulate how the brain works. And the difference is mainly that in classical machine learning, um, the, the computer scientist tries to define the features which, which represent the things we want to classify. And in deep learning, the system itself tries to find the, the most representative features of a dog or a cat itself. And that's really a change because we do not, do not longer need to, 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 to find these features. The system itself finds this, these features and this al al already improved um, a lot of, of fields of applications. Um, recently, there was a... Um, a survey among thousand companies and, and they asked um, which technologies they use in the company. And it was very interesting for me that within the, the, the thousand companies, there were only 30% which already use um, artificial intelligence and, and more specifically analytics. So I thought it would be more. And this is why I'm, I was a little bit surprised because um, AI is in the middle between um, cost and, and how it improves the, the production. So it's not that costly, but on the other hand, it, the, the, the companies stated that it didn't improve the, the performance that much. So what we did in our project was that um, the goal was to, to transfer concepts of human biometrics to other fields of applications. Uh, so in human biometrics, the goal is to, to recognize a human based on, on a characteristic. So there are a lot of different characteristics uh, available now. So the most common one is a fingerprint, um, which has a very a long history now. And other more sophisticated um, characteristics are iris recognition, or if you think of, of, of veins. So um, you can also use the, the vein pattern on, on, on the hand for recognition of, of a human. And in the project, we tried to transfer these concepts to, to recognize um, single logs. So a four meter long roundwood log um, is one individual, or can be considered as an individual. The, the tool chain is exactly the same as in, in biometrics. So if you have, so let's focus on, on roundwood. Um, the, the first thing is that you have to capture the, the characteristic. So in case of roundwood, where we focus on, on the annual ring pattern, we take pictures of the cross section and more specifically of the annual ring pattern, which is our biometric modality. And this image is then used to, to generate a biometric template and the template is a compact representation of the biometric information in the, in the image. So it should be smaller than the original image and should only comprise the, the essential information to recognize the, the, the piece of round wood again. And the first time, so let's say in, in the forest, you see a, a log for the first time, you capture the, the log end image then you generate the, the biometric template. And to recognize the, the, this specific log again, 
you have to enroll it in a biometric database. So here, this is shown here. And then the, the log is transported to, the, to, to any log yard. And then at the log yard, to, you take a, another picture of, of, the, of the log end. Then the, the biometric template is generated. And this the biometric template is, is, is referred to as probe template is compared to all enrolled templates in the biometric database. Okay? And then the, the identity of, of the log is, is specified by the, by the match which shows the highest similarity. So in case that there is another log which shows similar biometric information, it can be that the similarity to this log is higher, and then we would have a mismatch. In the best case, this, this, these comparisons um, enable to detect the identity of the correct log. So here, this, this, this is the same procedure. The, the same scheme is shown again. So the first image is taken in the forest, then you, the, the image is taken, then the, the log template is, is computed, stored in the database, in the log yard, an image is taken again. The template is computed and compared to all templates in the database, and the best match specifies the identity of the log. So this is the basic idea. OK. So and as I mentioned earlier, we tried to transfer concepts of human biometrics to this field of application. And essentially, there were two different um, 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 types of approaches. The first one is inspired by fingerprint recognition, same as the second one. Um, uh, if you think of human fingerprints, our fingerprints show some types of crossings, so the minutia, these, these lines you see in the fingerprint are called minutia, and these show different types of crossings, and these crossings are detected, and the pattern you can see here in the, on the right-hand image, um, the, the minutia points here, they specify the biometric information of, of, uh, of a fingerprint. And, and of the person which wants to be identified. And the second approach is a more general one. Um, you, for this approach, the, the textual information is captured. So there are, we use different types of filters, and the filters somehow capture the, the textual information, orientation, and scale of the minutia pattern in a specific region. So this is a, this is a completely different approaches, and both can be applied for for log recognition. And depending on, on the characteristic you use to identify human or a log, there are different quality criteria which are listed on the top right side here. So the first one is universality. It means that the characteristic enables to distinguish between different individuals, so in our case, logs. And very important, permanence means that the biometric information is not lost over time or cannot be changed. Um, and the, the third one is, and this is very important in the wood industry um, and other fields of applications, that if someone proposes a new system, he also has to come up with numbers on the performance. And in case of biometrics, we always talk about errors. So it's not that much interesting how much accuracy you achieve, it's more interesting how much errors you, you produce. So I will try to, to, to show this later again. So, and these two types of, of biometric features uh, can be denoted as handcrafted features. So um, a computer scientist or some researchers decided this can be um, good, good biometric features which represent the information we see in the images. So we assume that these features can be good for biometric recognition. So um, this is the second approach shown for, for the log end images. So we, we applied it for, for the log ends. So we denoted it as text, texture pattern based approach. And the, this, the, the different approach, the key point based approach, so shown here in the, in the top row here, inspired by the, the minutia points. Um, was tested by another company in Sweden, and they denoted it as, as, as rocket technology. 
and but they did never came up with numbers. It, it was very interesting approach, but you can see in the slide they presented that the key points which are detected in a log end image strongly depend on the saw cut pattern. So, and one quality criteria here in the, in the middle is permanence. So it means that you, if you cut the log end again, you will somehow lose the biometric information. So if these key points here strongly rely on the saw cut pattern and you, you lose this information when cutting the, the log end, it's not a good uh, characteristic for recognition of, of logs. So on the other hand, the texture feature based approach, I will show some results then, um, enables that if you cut the log end, you can recognize the, the log um, again. It does not matter that much because the annual ring pattern itself does not change that much rapidly along the length axis of the log. So, and there is this change in, 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 in the paradigm because since, since this, this, this trend of, of deep learning and, and convolutional neural networks, there is another way of, of how to extract biometric features. So, and here's an example for, for digit recognition. Um, the, this is called the MNIST dataset and the goal is to distinguish between uh, the nine numbers. And basically you can see it in the four, four rows there. Um, you have different types of, of numbers which are written slightly differently. And the goal of the, of the neural network is to learn the biometric features um, to distinguish between the different numbers. So it's not the, the, the commuter scientist which defines what are valuable, what can be valuable features. The system, the, the network itself, um, trains these features um, itself. And what, what is done now is that you can see here the change from the, the, red, the red rectangle to the blue one. So if you have trained the system with the, with the data which is available, the system itself um, learns the, the most valuable um, representation of the biometric features and then enables the, the classification between these digits here. And we can do the same for, 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 for log ends. So let's say if we have 100 logs and for each log we have 10 images captured at different stages of the, of the log processing chain, then we use these images to train the, the neural network to distinguish between the 100 logs. And at the end, we throw away the, uh, we keep away the, the, the blue rectangle here, seen here, and we only keep the red rectangle. So um, in case that we want to identify a new, a new log, or we want to, to enroll a, a new log in the, in the biometric database, then image is, is taken, same as here for the digit three, and then we use this, net, this pre trained network to extract biometric features as done before for the 100 logs. And then we keep this, 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 this um, representation um, and store this uh, representation in the biometric database. So it's no longer the um, the commuter scientist, which decides which are the uh, good um, features to recognize the, the log. It's a neural network which trains or which models the best representation of biometric information. So it's really a change. And we, have, we already have some first results for, for this kind of feature extraction. And it was very interesting because the, the results are somehow in the same range as for the hand grafted features. And I will try to point out why this is um, very surprising. Um, a little bit later, um, first I want to, to, to show why, why this in general is very difficult tasks as, as pointed out, out by Alexander. Um, the, the, the visual appearance of, of the inner ring pattern changes uh, depending on different influences. So the first class of, of variations are capturing variations. So you, you have um, difference between, the inf uh, between images caused by sensor, light, shadows, distance, and rotation. So affine transformations are a big problem. 
Then you have these environmental issues, snow, rain, sun, dirt. Everyone knows the, the, the inner ring pattern changes rapidly. And this also can be caused by the by gross section variations. So the change due to snow, rain, color, cutting pattern, if you cut the log end again, moisture content and so on. So we have to handle with these variations if they appear um, in this scenario where we want to recognize a log. And what we did, we investigated experimentally um, longitudinal variations and temporal variations as shown here. And the results showed that for these kind of images shown here in the, in the slides, it was, it was possible to recognize um, the correct log again. And the same was shown for these longitudinal variations. And the result showed that if you cut off, let's say seven, so up to, to, to seven centimeters of the log end, you still can recognize it again. So it does not matter if, if you cut off um, a thin slice because the annual ring pattern information does not change that much in this distance. So here are other types of variations. So the first image is, 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 the, is the original one. The second one, as I remember, was um, when we sent it the, the, the cross section. And the third one was, was is when you change the, the capturing modality and you use a different type of sensor, as shown here, a CT scanner, then the biometric information can be different. So it's, it's quite difficult to, to recognize a log if you enroll it with the first image and you want to recognize it later with a, a, with a cross-section image cap, captured via a CT scanner. So it, it depends on the scenario, what, how you want to recognize the log again. And the last thing I want to point out is that if someone proposes a, um, such a technology, which is very important um, in the scope of Industry 4.0, um, he should come up with numbers because it depends on the data acquisition and the type of and the scenario where he tested the, the, the identification performance. And if someone proposes a system, he has to describe exactly how the images were captured and how the experiments were carried out and what the results are. So in our research, we try to make that very clear so that everybody can see how it works and what are the, the remaining problems at the moment. So, and we had one um, experiment with 279 different logs and which can be divided into three different test sets. So where two are quite similar. So you can see it here, test set one and two. And the third one was the most realistic test, test set we had in our, in our scenario. So it was, it were trees which were captured at a log, log yard at different rotations, different scale, and different lighting. So, and as you can see that for test set three, uh, it's the, the gray bar here, the performance is always the lowest one. So for, so this, this method here was one of the best. Um, and you can see for test set three, we had an, an recognition accuracy of um, 92%. And for the other two test sets, which were captured on, under more idealistic um, on conditions, the performance was much better. So it strongly depends on the, on, on the scenario where you capture the data. And in our case, the, the rotation was a big problem because for test set three, we rotated a lot and we had to compensate for this rotation. And this is where I want to come back to this deep learning stuff. Um, for this test set three, we repeated the experiments without compensating the rotation. And we tried if the, if the neural networks can somehow compensate these, these rotational variations itself. And we just um, plugged in the data with different rotations. And then we, we looked how is the accuracy, same as for the previous experiments with the handcrafted features. And the result showed that the that, uh, that, uh, identification accuracies were in the same range. So it's, it's quite a an, an 
promising um, approach to use these deep learning features for our future research now. So what we did so far is that we could show the, the principal feasibility of, of this approach to identify logs based on, on cross-section images of the log ends. But what we are doing at the moment in the follow-up project is to prove the industrial applicability. So we have one camera installed in a French sawmill and the camera actually captures, um, let's say, 10,000 logs and then we try then we will have a look if we still can distinguish between these, these 10,000 logs. Because at the moment we can make a statement for 279, but if we go into the field, we have to, to show this uh, for a larger amount of different logs. So, and finally, this is a short um, overview on our current project. So, what we do at the moment is we test different um, um, sensors, which are used to capture the, the log ends. So we used uh, mobile devices in the forest and industrial cameras in the sawmill environment. And the question is if we can bridge this gap between um, forest and sawmill, even if we use different types of cameras. Second, for 100 logs, we also took um, CT scans. So the question is if we take an, an, an RGB image, image in, the, in the forest or in the sawmill, and then we only have um, a CT scan in the, in the sawmill, then if we can um, identify the log based on CT and RGB image. And another big um, position in the project is if we can somehow lose, uh, use the, the information of the cross-section images in the forest to make some predictions on the, on the quality of the log. So the goal is to, to, to perform early quality estimation already in the forest to improve the, 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 the assignment of the logs to the further processing companies. Yes, so this is just a short example because we also used hyperspectral cameras. So for the 100 logs in the project, we took um, um, images with mobile devices, with the industrial um, cameras, and with the CT scanner and the third type of, 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 of camera type we used were um, hyperspectral cameras, as pointed out, out by Alexandra or Alexander already. And these, these sensors are really valuable because they, they, they give information at different wavelengths of the cross section. And as shown here in the example, you can use the, the, this information to distinguish between different types of, of, of properties you see on, on, on the cross section. So, here we just have marked um, some, some type of reaction wood, um, um, bark, um, yes, and early and late wood could also be detected, I think. So this is just a, a short motivation for the future. So I'm, I finished and I would like to ask the, the host to take over. It's muted. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, first off, there have been some questions whether you could share those slides and my answer is yes. We provide you with your permission, of course, with the slides of the two presenters. Uh, Alexander, please turn on your microphone. Uh, we will head on to the questions that we received. Clemens. Yeah, the first one is actually uh, quite a technical question. Uh, it's asking what is the F1 score or error rate you achieved when building the system? And furthermore, how do you plan to scale the system later on when it comes for log registration? Okay, so for the, for the first question, so the equal error rate, um, so the, the results I showed here were ident identification accuracy. So this is different. So in biometrics, you distinguish between verification and identification. And in our publication, we have results for verification and identification. But shown here in the presentation were the recognition rates, because these are the rates you have in a, in a, in a realistic scenario. And mm -hmm. the second part, how to scale the, the, the system, this is Will I do? really a, yes, please. Yes, uh, the thing is, uh, 
we are not really prepared now to give here a final answer, but it's a good question that we are following. It's depending on how much data has to be collected by which system and with which question. Because if we go into registration, the main question will arise, do we have to store the information of all logs there are existing in whole Austria or is it company specific or whatever? So here we cannot give a clear answer because we do not know how much we can reduce the information of one image because we will not take the whole image in the future. We will uh, work here with encoding and so on to get less data. And so we cannot answer these questions, but what I tried to give you is an idea which directions we will go. One thing is reduce, not the information, but the quantity of data per log. And the other thing is how will, the, or who will use the system, who will have the whole access to all the information and what are the parts that we can subdivide per company or per forest area and so on. I hope this mm -hmm. answers the question uh, as far as we can do now. And the last, the last, the last point is very interesting. Um, can, could be for, for, for my supervisor. So the question was if there is any specific spectral band or range which is valuable for identification. So we now have the uh, scans from 400 to 1,700 nanometer of the 100 logs from both log ends. And one research direction is that the moment we compute um, the best bands for biometric identification. So, and this is very difficult because we, we again need a, a neural network to find the best combination of bands because this is quite computational intensive to find the best, comp uh, the best combination of bands. Mm -hmm. But this will this will be done in the in the near future. Great. I think the second question is going a little bit in the direction already that you mentioned before. I think it's sort of a semantic compression that you're uh, achieving mm -hmm. here. Uh, could you give us some indication what is the compression rate you achieve versus a classical, let's say, stupid compression algorithm like JPEG or so on? Uh, Rudy, maybe uh, Rudy can give mm. uh, some information about the vectors we we have then as a uh, term. At the moment, this is really a funny question because if you extract biometric information, it can be that the information is bigger than the than the image. So there are some types of feature descriptors which which do not compress the information. Information they enlarge the information, and the overall goal is to compress the information because you cannot store that much data in a system. But but in our stage of the research, we do not care that much about um, biometric template size. So this has to be done in, in future research projects. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that answer. And since we are already at the end of the session, maybe one final question. Uh, what is your expectation how the future sensor lineup will look like really in the forest or in the wood? Because nowadays everybody's talking about cell phones and image recognition. You have LiDAR with the mm -hmm. coming generation of smartphones. So what do you think, what, what's realistic to expect? Alexander, do you want? Yes, I will start and you will finish because we. Yes. this is also one thing uh, what we did with, with handies and, and, and low quality uh, imaging uh, devices or high quality images devices uh, if you look at the data quantity. But the thing is we, we try to get good images in the forest and that is the first uh, task where we have a lot of uh, complexity and here we did so far, as you have seen the, the, the equipment we did, we used uh, low quality uh, camera systems in the forest. And when we do, did uh, scientific analysis, what, what uh, Rudy mentions, we had very high resolution uh, image uh, data equipment. So I think, it will only work if it's easy to handle and if it's um, withstanding the harsh condition in the forest. And in the sawmill, it might be much easier to be uh, implemented. And in the mm -hmm. forest, we have the we have good experiences with with um, with our uh, GoPro cameras. But 
there is the, 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 the sensors are the wrong one or it's only one specific band uh, area we get. We have to go into infrared. We have to find out the, the, the bandwidth where we get the most information based on, on, on chemical uh, things and on our, our neural network. And I cannot answer it now, but it should be easy um, system in the forest and we will start with um, harvesters and not with the with these cable lines and so on because maybe we will be able to make a system that is functioning for 80 percent of logs um cut it and, and 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 produced in the forest because if you would like to 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 achieve it for 100 percent now with the first system then you have so much problems so so we will try mm -hmm. to go step by step okay you? So yeah, I really, uh, I really like all the questions here because they are very interesting. But but the sensor question is is something we cannot answer at the moment. Um, there are, I'm happy that there are so different research directions at the moment. So with lidar and infrared, and the future will show which sensors will will show the best performance. But it can be everything. I don't know at the moment. Okay, and if you yeah, if the participants have more questions, you're still afterwards available for one-on-one -on -one meetings for a sensor privatissimum. Good, yeah, with this, I would like to hand over to Matthias, like next program point. Yes, well, uh, the next program point actually on the agenda is a short lunch break. Um, we shifted around the program a little bit to uh, uh, make room for the next presentation. If you move to your agenda, you can actually see uh, what uh, is up next in your time zone. We are right now at the end of the second presentation from today. And at 12.40, uh, this is Austrian time, or in 55 minutes, we will welcome our next speaker, uh, Markus Leunig, CEO of Sensoro, on our virtual stage. Um, if you are in the office or in the home office, I'd like to invite you to, uh, no, I don't invite you, sorry, but I would be happy if you get a grab to eat uh, some a little lunch and also use the time for uh, seeing through your personal one-on-one -on -one meetings or also arranging additional one-on-one -on -one meetings with our speakers and with the other participants from around the world that are meeting today. Right now, at this time, the Americans are getting up. We already have a few viewers from North and South America with us. And uh, it's getting late in Asia, but not too late to network. So head over to your own uh, login, click on participants, see who's there and who's available for meetings. And uh, yeah, let's take a few steps to the future of forestry and of real world uses of AI in forestry, timber and wood together. Enjoy your lunch break. And see you later. In 52 minutes. Huh? 52 minutes.
Hello and welcome back from the lunch break. I hope you had a little time to refresh yourself, uh, at least the ones of you that are joining us from the European time zones. Uh, good morning to North America. Some of you are now awake. Uh, my colleague Clemens is a little bit late. Not anymore. Not anymore, because he actually missed that there's a little lag in the stream. And uh, we uh, continue with the second part of our conference, Applied AI in Forestry, Timber and Wood. And uh, we are very happy to welcome our next speaker. Um, let's see if he's already online. Markus Leunig, he's CEO and founder of Sensoro, uh, Austrian-based company, and he will give us a little talk about how ultrasound and AI can help reducing maintenance costs. Markus, can you hear us? Yep, Markus is connected and he's out in. Well, in the meantime, um, all of you who are listening to this stream right now, I hope you use the chance to check your personal meeting agenda. Uh, on the top of uh, this menu that you are looking at here right now is a section called participants. By clicking that, you can see who is attending today. And when going into their profiles, you can request a personal meeting. So let's see, Markus. Markus Leunig. Can yes, I finally uh, was able to uh, plug in. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, how is it going? I already made a short intro. And uh, basically for the next 20 minutes, the floor is yours. Please leave some time for Q&A for our audience. And uh, you uh, listening to the stream, you can actually ask questions anytime using the Slido widget on the right side. Um, ask your questions, put your name if you have a very specific requests and uh, upvote questions from other people that you might want to hear answered by Marcos. We will pick the most popular questions and uh, go through them when time allows. Marcus, the floor is yours. Okay, fantastic. So I tried to do the application sharing, which did not work. So I um, share my entire screen. So you should see the presentation now. Is this working? Works like a charm. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Okay, hey, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Marcus, uh, founder and CEO of Sensora. We are an uh, Austrian-based company doing predictive maintenance uh, with ultrasound and AI. And as you can see at the bottom, we did receive some uh, nice media coverage the last few months because actually no one had this crazy idea to combine ultrasound with AI. Uh, it's actually a very disruptive technology. Um, and I will share a few uh, insights, uh, especially at VM Holz, which is one of our clients. All right. so. I brought with me four points. Uh, first of all, I will a little bit talk about what we do and where we do it. Then uh, a quick overview about the ultrasound technology in general. So what's special about it? Um, then I will spend most of the time at our farm holds use case. It's a major timber processing player in Austria. And of course, last but not least, uh, I will answer any questions that you may have. So what do we do? Um, we do uh, combine ultrasound with AI in order to reduce the maintenance costs. What's special about it, we do not install fixed sensors, uh, which makes it a zero investment approach to predictive maintenance. Uh, and last but not least, the data acquisition is done with a mobile measurement device and AI derives a health status. Uh, where do we do it? We are active in the German and Austrian market. As you can see, it's a cross-industry technology. We use it in uh, paper, uh, automotive, in utilities, as well as, of course, the timber industry, which is the focus of today. Why do we use ultrasound? Um, ultrasound is a technology that exists for many uh, decades, um, and it started here. Um, already in the 70s, NASA had a problem. They wanted to test their equipment on Earth, 
And at the same time, they needed to make sure that everything works fine before they shoot it into space. So they conducted a big research uh, project uh, to find out which is the best technology. And the result, you can see it here, is ultrasound uh, is the superior technology. As with ultrasound, uh, you can detect building failures as early as with no other technology. So this was our starting point. And if you take a broader look at um, predictive maintenance technologies, you can use ultrasound, you can use vibration, oil analysis, and so on and so on. It's a common knowledge that ultrasound is uh, the technology that gives you the most time to react. So this was our starting point. Um, so what we did change is, as ultrasound is a very complex field, you get a raw data, you actually get an audio file, which is very complex to analyze as a human. You see it on the left side. So we built an AI that derives a health status, a simple health status, which we report to our clients. And of course, behind this is classically AI. So we extract up to 400 different features from the time domain, as well as the frequency domain. And based on those features, um, the AI classifies, uh, in this case, the bearing. And we do actually have the biggest ultrasound uh, database in the world. It's made up uh, by about 10,000 different samples. Of course, it's increasing over time. And we collected this data about two years. Uh, on several thousand assets. So this is the base of our AI has learned more or less uh, the characteristics of a good and a bad bearing over two years. Okay, um, enough uh, talk about the AI. Let's, uh, let's get to a use case uh, to see what, what can we actually do with this technology. I may introduce you to Farm Holz. It's a major timber processing player in Austria, well located in the heart of Austria. Um, and what we do there um, is simple. So we predict the remaining lifetime of roller bearings. Um, and by that, we transform the maintenance from a time-based approach to a prediction-based approach. Um, which machines are in scope? Um, the answer is, is, is really short. Everything where roller bearings are used. So you see the classical assets in the wood industry. There is a wood chipper on the left. Um, there is a saw motor which saws the locks in half. Uh, you see huge support bearings, and you see like several uh, motors that do some uh, some processing of wood uh, and turn stuff. So this is uh, this is just a selection. So in total, we have I think seventy or eighty assets in scope. Um, how it works? So um, roller bearings are measured with a mobile sensor device. Uh, you see on the left side this is actually me. So we take the ultrasound samples. This data is then processed by AI, and the result is a simple health report that I will cover later uh, in more, more detail. But this is, this, this is the process, and this process is repeated about every two months. Um, so every two months, uh, one of our team members gets at Farmholz and takes the new round of, of samples. So let's make it specific. At Farmholz, uh, it's typically Martin is, is arriving at 10 o'clock. So he knows uh, the assets he needs to measure. So he walks to the first motor, takes the measurement. He walks to the next motor, takes the measurement, and so on and so on. He also knows that at 10.30, uh, he needs to be at the saw motor because the saw motor can only be measured during the breaks. So he makes sure to be there. Then he measures all the other roller bearings and about 1 p.m is done with taking the measurements. So he has collected, in this case, um, 75 ultrasound samples. On his way back, uh, the data already arrives at our servers and gets processed by AI. And about two days later, um, Farmholz gets a uh, report. And typical action items are to change a bearing, or to lubricate the bearing, or to check uh, fastening uh, of, of a motor, for example. What's in such a report? So we try to keep the complexity out of our clients. So we have a simple traffic light logic. You see uh, a green point means there is no failure to be expected in the next three months. Uh, red means it's a critical condition. Uh, you need to expect a failure within the next three months. And yellow is a problem indicator. Uh, it could be a lubrication problem or it could be an imbalance problem. So just imagine on the right side is Thomas, is the head of maintenance. So he knows based on this report, okay, great. Uh, 55 of the bearings don't require my attention, but I have to change the outer bearing of the chipper 
and I need to lubricate the inner bearing of my saw motor. So this is the, the procedure and this is the way this information is processed by Faumholz in this case. In order to give you an indication how fast we can implement things, um, I did put on paper like uh, a few numbers on, on cost saving potentials. You see the saw motor here that you have already seen. This saw motor has three bearings. The bearings are actually like this, yeah, so pretty large. So they are expensive and it takes long to change them. Um, and based on the recommendation of the machine manufacturer, those bearings have been changed every 2,000 hours, operating hours, um, regardless of their actual condition. Uh, and based on the measurements, we did already extend this to 2,650 hours because the AI told us everything is just fine. Because this is a very critical asset, uh, because if it fails, the entire production stands still. We decided to change it prematurely to see, okay, if uh, EI uh, fits to the bearing results more or less. The bearing was okay, um, so the target now is 7,000 hours. Yeah, so based on the first measurement, we already increased it by 30 percent. And if you calculate this down to a cost saving, it's about 1,800 euros at this stage and for this motor alone. So you can imagine there are a lot of motors, there are a lot of bearings, so the overall cost saving is much, much higher. And uh, believe me, our cost is just um, a fraction of this. Yeah, so um, the disruptive part about this technology is surely the fact that if we get a call from a client, we can go there, we measure his assets, and he gets the results on day one. So there is no need for client data we deliver from the first second on. Okay, so um, Matthias, um, I don't know if there are any questions because I only see my screen, but I would be more than open to answer all them. <laughs> yes, we are back with the questions and we have received some very specific ones and more are coming in. Mm -hmm. So far it's four. Yeah, I think there's enough time. So let's just start from the top. The first question is regarding the, the data set. If it's available open source for benchmark testing, for example. Uh, no, it's not available open source. Uh, it was uh, quite some hard work to collect. So it's, it's, it's our proprietary data set. So it's not available open source. Um, and I think it's a good thing not to <laughs> make it open source. Um, because this is more or less, you cannot build the AI without data. So this is what we try to protect as hard as uh, as, as we can. <laughs> uh, I understand. This is basically the secret yeah. sauce. <laughs> this is basically the secret sauce. Uh, we uh, internally, we often uh, try to challenge ourselves. Let's say Google wants to copy us. Uh, uh, the, the first difficult part is how do you extract relevant features out of a file? I think uh, if, if Google uh, brings up their five best minds, it would take maybe two months to get uh, to the same level. But even then, if they don't have the data we have, they cannot build the AI. So uh, without a data set, uh, you cannot do what we do. So we try to protect it as hard as we can. <laughs> Very well. Uh, the next question is a little bit more specific. Is there any benchmarking study conducted to compare the various sensor data like audio, ultrasound and so on to, to see which one really outperforms the other? Um, the first part of your question, Matthias, was uh, uh, it didn't get because of bad audio, but I understood if there is any benchmark available, right? Yeah, from ultrasound versus other, let's say, data sources like normal audio mm -hmm. so uh, we actually did i mean I, I don't know any open source or official benchmarking uh, studies but uh, we did uh, a lot of uh, audio analysis in let's say in in what we humans can hear and in our experience this is always it gets very very specific because if you if you enter a factory it is very, very loud for humans. So whatever you do with normal audio analysis, you need to train AI to ignore this background noise. Yeah. So this could be the machine. This could be a, a radio. Yeah. Uh, or this could be the forklift driving by. So this is something that AI would need to learn with audio. Um, and thinking about ultrasound uh, from a factory point of view, 
ultrasound. There are no sources of ultrasound in the factory. This is the one thing. And the other thing is uh, just uh, remember NASER. NASER did a big research study. So it's the technology that you need to use if you want to analyze bearings. Um, but we also extend this knowledge to, for example, transmissions. Uh, but transmissions are a bit more specific. So we try to do the same for transmissions, but we, let's say, are halfway through it. Yeah, so we, for transmissions, we need three measurements and not, we cannot do the same as with roller bearings now, but it's also the goal to measure once and get the same result. Very well. Uh, next question. Uh, how do you make sure that your models are generic enough to work with different types of bearings, for example? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So uh, we actually started to be, because everything was new, uh, we started to be, be very, very careful. So we needed to actually find out how much data are we able to put together. So first we started only to put, let's say, the same motor in the same model. Then uh, with, get it, with more and more data, we tried to put the huge motor together with the small motor. Then we tried to uh, put together the first type of bearing with another type of bearing. Um, and we found out that the more data you have, of course, yeah, the more uh, data we could put together without losing uh, confidence in the model. Um, so I think at the beginning, it was very, very specific. We even did like for one certain type of motor, we, we had one model, but then we started to put everything together and with 10,000, something like 8,000 samples, certainly it was like this all capable model and that model doesn't care anymore if this is like a 10,000 RPM motor, a huge motor, a small motor. Um, so it was a small step process, um, but now more or less everything is in one model, but you need enough data for it. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, final question, uh, what is your strategy if the AI predicts falsely and major damage occurs? I think this is a the, yeah. A general question you hear very often, especially towards AI startups who are relatively small and new on the market. So how do you handle this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is actually a very, very uh, critical point. So, um, I mean, I want to take like two point of view. So the first one is what did actually happen? So our prediction is, uh, will the bearing fail within the next three months or not? And what happened until now is, there was no single wrong prediction, so to speak, in the sense that we said, okay, it will uh, last another three months and then it failed. This did not happen so far. And we had like, maybe like 1,500 of those really predictions that we needed to hand over to clients. So this, so the, the worst case did not happen. What did happen is if we say, if we also had like two or three cases where we said it will fail the next three months, but then it took five or six months. So. It, it was uh, it was the wrong prediction, but it was wrong in an okay way. So this is more or less, we are good. So it, it didn't happen. So the worst case didn't happen. So uh, it, it, we are fine on this uh, regard. Uh, the other question is, we of course, uh, we have like a, a big disclaimer that we don't take any responsibility for blah, blah, blah. So we cannot take the responsibility, for example, uh, uh, an asset, failing in a big factory, we would, we would go bankrupt immediately. Yeah. So we, we tell every, every client, okay, uh, we don't take any legal uh, uh, things out of it, but we educate our clients to work with probabilities. So the, the dashboard that you have seen, the, the traffic light logic is more or less like a translation of, of, of probabilities. Um, and we try to educate our clients to say, hey, this, this, uh, this green uh, traffic light has a prediction of 99% uh, and the other has a 99.5%. So they start to uh, get a feeling for the confidence of the AI and based on that, they make their judgment. But it's not our call to either change or leave the bearing as it is. So this is the approach to educate the clients a little bit to, to to handle more or less the confidence and the probability of the of the AI. Okay. Yes, are you there? Oh yes, we are still there. Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah, Marcus. So 
thanks a lot for joining. I hope you're still available for one-on-one -on -one meetings. Yes, sir. Later on. Already booked. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to see you in, in real life after this whole thing is over. <laughs> yes, Good. I hope so too. Matthias, Cleves, take care. Uh, we surely see each other again. <laughs> Pleasure having you. Have a good day. Yeah, have Bye. a good day. Bye. And we are about to introduce our next speaker. Please bear with us for one second. Uh, we'll just get this setting right. Okay, we'll be back in a minute. All right, and with us now, joining us from Estonia, we have Anna-Greta Zanka, the CEO and founder of Team Beta. Hello, Anna-Greta, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you very well. And what I would like to say, you have done an excellent job because this, this conference has been very, very interesting. Thank you for that. Awesome. Well, Anna-Greta, thank you so much for being with us today, for, for taking the time. We're super excited to have you here. Uh, Anna Greta is for one actually a, a veteran when it comes to applying uh, artificial intelligence in the forest and the timber industry. That's one thing. And we're also looking forward for also first touch points and potential collaborations with Austrian partners. That's why we're super excited to have you here and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much for being here, Anna Greta. Thank you. Before we start your presentation, just one more hint. During the presentation and also afterwards, you can ask questions using the question tool here on the right, learnwidgetslido.com. Uh, you can upload other people's questions and we will answer them in the Q&A session after Anna Greta's presentation. So join in and Anna Greta, the floor is yours. Let's see Thank if you. your presentation is working. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, uh, talking about the uh, timber, it is a solution that enables to um, measure timber quickly and accurately and manage all the data in digital format. It's something that is very easy to use. The person simply needs to have an um, application downloaded uh, to its phone and can start making pictures uh, and with the picture uh, Timbeter automatically de detects the number of log, uh, calculates the volume and uh, detects each and every diameter of each log. All the measurements are stored in the cloud and they are having a geotag so it's always easy uh, to track the origin of the timber. The uh, detection of the diameters is based on uh, artificial intelligence. So this is the reason why we are part of the conference. And uh, it enables uh, to get objective and accurate digital measurements in a really uh, short time. So each detection is based roughly on 2000 points. We detect uh, the uh, contour area of the log under the bark, we convert it into a symmetrical circle and from there we calculate the exact average diameter of each and every log. So I think the most important here is that uh, uh, it has been really taken some time to uh, develop uh, this solution. So we started off in 2013 and the more our database of uh, measurements uh, have grown, the more precise our detection has become. So uh, today we are talking about roughly 700,000 pictures in our database where we are training our detection algorithm to work also in the most, um, 
how to say, extreme weather conditions or even with the most uh, exotic uh, species. So um, I think it's actually um, our solution is not really about the measurement, but it's uh, more about the data that you can quickly capture from the field with the help of Timbeter. And as I said already, you have all the measurements uh, with the geotag, so you can track down uh, the origin of the timber, which can also be used very efficiently for the logistics planning. You always have the number of locks, uh, the volume, um, uh, that enables to conduct transparent, fair and controllable measurements, because unfortunately the forestry sector tends to be still pretty vague and shady. Uh, you have all the information regarding the different species and assortments that enables you to make quick pricing calculations, for example, and you have the data available for the quick company reporting. And again, when it comes to the transactions, you can be sure that the data is uh, uh, or the volume information is objective and it's not harming anyone's position. So basically, as a summary, you always know what was measured, where was measured and how much was measured. I guess uh, today we have had so many interesting um, presentations already, so nobody needs to be convinced why the artificial intelligence is a good uh, solution. But uh, looking from the measurement side, I would uh, point out that it's important that uh, all the decisions are made on objective data and uh, the data is not being corrupted or it's not dependent on anyone's um, mm, Bad, uh, bad day or a lack of time. Uh, the measurements are consistent, meaning that uh, you don't need to have uh, like a extra long experience and know-how, but basically anyone who could, uh, uh, who needs uh, the quick measurement can do it with the help of our solution. And of course, as all the data is uh, in digital format, it is so much easier to use it for any other next step when it comes to the logistics, sales or production planning. And last but not least, all the process takes a um, uh, very short time. So all the measurements are done 15 times quicker. But of course, I mean, uh, the AI doesn't help only smart devices to be uh, effective and used in the timber measurement. But uh, in our case, we are also working with the company Sint uh, from Sweden and our detection works on their stationary solutions that enables to measure trucks uh, quickly and efficiently. And there our algorithm uh, acts in a way that it helps to uh, count uh, the number of uh, it helps to count the number of logs, uh, get each diameter, as well um, divides the diameters into uh, different classes to enable the uh, efficient uh, or optimized uh, production uh, planning. And of course, very very important that this solution is up and running and also certified already by Biometria, which is an independent third-party measurement company. But nevertheless, if we talk about um, Forestry 4.0 um, revolution that uh, is based on data, I still strongly believe uh, that we have to see that this will happen only with the help of this kind of uh, lightweight mobile solutions because uh, especially in the developing uh, countries you cannot really rely on heavy machinery and uh, i think this is also problematic when it comes to the forestry sector that there's still um, a tendency to make uh, investments mostly uh, to the heavy machinery and less to the it side so definitely I see a huge potential here and I think all the previous speakers have pointed this out as well. So uh, 
why uh, the mobile devices are the key uh, uh, to get uh, data from the field is definitely that first of all it's easy to access for everyone so you don't need to have any high investment into special machinery but basically you just download and uh, get data it is easy to use because otherwise no one uh, will use it. And I think uh, this is also an important point that all the digital solution providers in the forest have to consider that the users tend to be uh, a bit more conservative and less techy. Definitely, it's a reduction of the human error, uh, as in digital means. Again, less uh, people uh, uh, work uh, included. Also, it enables a very quick rollout in a sense that uh, hundreds of users can be connected into one account within minutes and uh, start capturing the data from the field. Uh, all the information comes to together, comes together to the cloud. Uh, so there's uh, enough information for the optimization when it comes to the sales or logistics or production. Again, transparency both sides having an equal position, uh, less arguing, uh, hopefully, and of course, data available for uh, the control and monitoring. And here I would uh, show a very practical example. Uh, so how, with the help of Timbeter, um, illegal um, logging can uh, be prevented in a better mode. Um, and here we use uh, the help uh, of the QR codes. So each and every uh, QR uh, log has a QR code. Um, so all the trucks are being measured when they start the route uh, from the forest. Uh, Timbeter enables to capture uh, not only the characteristics of this specific pile, meaning the number of logs, uh, diameter distribution, but also each and every QR code. So all this process is done in parallel. And then again, the next checkpoint is when the timber arrives to the company, uh, whether a sawmill or a pulp mill. And then again, it can be uh, easily checked whether this load is the same that was um, uh, starting uh, the route from the forest. And of course, it's very important to point out that as the data is being digital, not on papers, then it's harder to corrupt it. And secondly, uh, the more uh, you have this kind of um, random control points where, for example, law enforcement agencies are also using the solution uh, to control, is this uh, load the same as it started from the forest? It enables in a better way to, uh, to keep the bad guys away from the market. Um, I think it's, uh, we're talking about the sustainability and, uh, and being efficient in the field. It's very important that it's uh, also uh, the value of each log is being considered. And um, recording uh, uh, to the different reports, for example, in US, 25% uh, of the timber cut is not being used. So what we see is that uh, with help of Timbeter, for example, it's very easy to sort out uh, which are the logs uh, that are supposed to go to, um, uh, to a saw, saw log uh, pile instead of ending up as a pulp wood. So each and every log which has like 20 plus centimeters diameter is suitable for solo and can be uh, having a greater uh, value. Also, uh, when it comes to logistics, then it's very uh, problematic that uh, either the truck drivers uh, have to wait for hours because the information or the timber that they need to uh, pick up is still not uh, ready for being loaded. So in that, uh, in that sense, uh, this kind of more precise information state from the forest enables not only to maximize the value of each log, but also uh, help to save the hours uh, spent, uh, spent on the field. 
And from the uh, practical um, practical uh, experience, I'm very happy that we have been uh, working uh, with one of the most important uh, forestry corporations in Latin America, CMPC. And um, uh, we started our cooperation back in 2017. And uh, uh, for the first year of, uh, of usage, uh, they reported that, of course, I mean, all the, um, all the processes were uh, conducted in a very efficient uh, manner. It also, uh, using the solution, also brought a greater transparency to the whole supply chain, which meant that uh, uh, different disagreements uh, were solved in a much uh, quicker way. Uh, they planned their logistics, uh, not uh, based on the storages, but actually based on each pile, which of course helped them to save costs. And uh, one very important uh, benefit that they brought out was actually the safety issue, that uh, they managed to uh, reduce the time people spending on the heavy, uh, nearby the heavy machinery, and therefore any fatal accidents didn't take place. But what was the most biggest surprise for us, I must say, it was that actually they um, managed to um, save also a lot of um, paint because uh, they used to mark an each and every diameter uh, with the help of spray. Uh, but now as everything was done in a digital way, there was no need for that. So already in the first year, they actually saved 22.5 tons of paint. And in a sense, with CMPC collaboration is very important as well, because they are also one of the uh, leaders of this forest uh, sector uh, sustainable development goals uh, roadmap companies who are leading the process, uh, uh, helping forestry uh, companies to be more sustainable in their operations. Uh, secondly, I would bring an example from CM Semen Group. Uh, where they are using our solution to buy the timber from the local farmers and each and every load is being uh, pictured with the help of timber and automatically uh, it is set the different diameter classes uh, from where the correct pricing is made and they print out the paper so both sides have the clear evidence um, of the sales transaction. So that is us, Timbeter. Happy to answer all your questions. <laughs> and there are plenty of questions. Thank you so much, Anna Greta. Uh, they're just flying in over here. And, and since we're also pressed for time, I'm just going to straight away start with the first one. Um, also, because the first three are kind of going into the same direction. Do you need to put a reference marker somewhere close to the box before taking the image? which you already know the real world dimensions in order to compute the log circular dimensions. If not, then how is it possible to get the real world measurements only from the image? So what we do is we uh, use uh, two kinds of references. So first of all, whether it's a simple measurement stick uh, or then the QR codes. So po both are acting uh, uh, as a reference, helping to calibrate the diameters. And of course, I mean, uh, whenever there is a suspicious uh, activity, so to say, then it's uh, easy to check it with, uh, um, how to say, comparison to the real, real life objects. Very good. Then I'm thinking we're already moving on uh, to the next one. What does triple timestamp mean exactly? So this means that uh, we are capturing the time, first of all, uh, when the measurement uh, was made, secondly, when it was uh, uploaded uh, uh, to the cloud, and also, uh, thirdly, uh, the timing from the device. So you have, again, these different uh, variations of data, and again, if something is being corrupted, you can check uh, what has been taking place and uh, understand what's going on. Very good. So let's move on to the, to the next one. Consistent measurements. 
you are using 2D pictures to measure 3D objects. Are there any downsides to this approach? <clears throat> well, I guess uh, so this is something uh, that our previous speakers has been referring as well. And uh, now we see that the issue is still uh, in a way that uh, we need to manually insert the length. Uh, and of course, I mean, there can be issues. Something is put incorrectly, deliberately or not. But as well, the others, we are working on the different sensors to, to create the 3D model. Okay, and, and maybe also uh, continuing on, on that question, how, uh, how about the length of the uh, individual logs? Uh, so, uh, pretty much uh, what we see is uh, companies are using the, the standard length, so 3 meters, 4 to 5, 4.5, uh, 6 meters. And when it comes to the length uh, with a how to do, different length in one pile, then of course the uh, uh, volume cal calculation may not be so uh, correct, but still you get uh, the number of logs and you can compare the diameter characteristics. Awesome. Well, there are still a lot of uh, questions on our radar here. Uh, unfortunately, we can't answer all of them right now, so uh, please reach out um, in the one-on-one -on -one meetings as we are moving on uh, to our next speakers. Anna Greta, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, amazing presentation. We're looking forward to the synergies in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, to all of you who didn't get their questions answered, as mentioned, please contact Anna Greta directly. We will share the slides and see you in 30 seconds with the next speaker. Thank you, Anna Greta. Bye to thank you. And we are back again, and we say hello to Michael Hettegger, CEO and co-founder of Autonomous Machines, based in Austria. Hello, Michael. Can you hear us? Can we hear you? Yes, I can hear you very well. Wonderful, wonderful. You will tell us a little bit about process automation in sawmills today. Exactly. And you already are sharing your presentation. Uh, dear everybody, Pay attention, don't forget your meetings and ask your questions to Michael at any point during his presentation or afterwards in the Q&A session. We'll see you in a All little right. bit for the Q&A. Thank yours. you. Um, yeah, so my name is Michael. I'm one of the founders of Autonomous Machines AI. Um, we use industrial AI for the wood industry. So our mission is to empower machines to operate autonomously and efficiently. Therefore, we offer different services and products. So our main focus is process optimization in sawmills. And I will today show you two use cases where we optimize throughput and lifetime uh, of components. Um, we also offer a product that optimizes wet storages in terms of saving resources. I will also go into detail about this later. And the third pillar is, um, is customized solutions uh, for predictive maintenance. All right, so let's start with process optimization for sawmills. Um, sawmills, especially in the, in the, at the end of the process where the lumbers are transported and sorted, it's very important for them that those lumbers, um, they are transported accurately, so they are positioned as they should be. There's no manual work needed. Also, they want a high throughput of the parts. So here are three goals we identified if we want to optimize processes in the sawmill. First, we want to increase the throughput. So we want to you know, have many pieces produced, many logs cut, and uh, many lumbers sorted and packaged. But we also want to have a high accuracy. With accuracy, I'm talking about that lumbers especially are sorted uh, and positioned as they should be. There's no overlaps and there's no manual labor needed in order to sort lumbers. And the last goal is that we have a lot of components and machines and we don't want a lot of downtimes. We want to increase uptime. We, want, we don't want too many maintenance tasks 
and we actually want to increase the overall lifetime of components. All right, so the first um, use case is a lumber sorting process step. So here on the right side, you see this is a machine where the lumbers uh, slide down, and this machine then um, transports the lumbers, positions them, and sorts them. And um, there, so actually, we want to here have a high throughput because we want to you know, move the lumbers quickly to be, to be packaged. And the problem is also that we don't have a good accuracy. We see here that many lumbers are actually overlapping and manual work is needed to sort them out. So how can we increase throughput while maintaining high accuracy? And um, this machine can be controlled with different settings. So the rotation speed, the angle, and so on are different settings that change you know, or affect the throughput and the accuracy. So first, um, we try to do this. Uh, we try to identify the perfect settings for the machine using, let's say, classical machine learning approaches with historical data. So we, we had machine data. We tried to find quality data. We wanted to combine them, clean them, merge them, analyze them, and develop a machine learning model that learns which settings on the machine leads to high throughput and high accuracy. The problem that we had is, first of all, the quality data. So the data that tells us how many lumbers were transported correctly and how many lumbers were transported overall was not available. Um, the second problem is the machine data. There was some sort of machine data available, but um, we didn't have a long history of, of machine data. And even if we have both of these uh, data sets, the biggest challenge is that how can we know if the best possible combination of accuracy and throughput is in the data set? Because if it's not in the data, the model cannot learn it anyway. So actually, we tried a different approach. What we did is um, we, we had a CAD file, a 3D CAD file of the machine that tells us how the machine operates. We also had uh, the source code of the automation of the machine. And we created a virtual environment that, uh, on the one hand, has a physics engine behind. And this physics engine helps us that we have um, you know, a real uh, simulation of the process with physical, um, you know, physical laws and, 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 and measures. Also, we have a virtual SPS that helps us that the, that the virtual environment also acts exactly the same as the physical. Uh, machine. So our AI then tries different control settings and determines which control settings for which product leads to high accuracy and uh, best possible throughput. Let me show you how in detail this looks like. So we have here our virtual environment. This virtual environment um, continuously creates time series data. So this data, the sensor values, the accuracy measurements, and so on, are created on a continuous basis. We then calculate the metrics. Our metrics are accuracy and throughput. So again, throughput is the number of pieces that were transported, and accuracy is the number of correctly transported, transported pieces. This information is fed back to the AI, and the AI then tries different control parameters um, until it finds, let's say, the best combination that leads to high accuracy and the best possible throughput. This loop has been done a couple thousand times, and it actually takes quite a while until the best combinations for each product are found. Because we actually do this loop for different products. So a product is defined by a wood type and the measurement of the lumber. Um, so the result then looks like it's kind of like a curve. Um, we have on the x-axis the throughput and on the y-axis the accuracy. And you can see clearly that the higher the throughput is, the, the worse the accuracy gets. But as a customer, I can decide now if I want high accuracy while having the best throughput or high throughput while having an OK accuracy. Here I have a video of how the process then looks like in the end, or the virtual simulation. On the left, you see the original process. On the right, the optimized process. What you see is, first of all, it's a bit hard to see, but the process, the throughput increased by about 10%. Also, you see on top 
how many pieces were transported wrong. On the right side, we have five pieces. On the left side, we already have 14 pieces, 15 pieces that were transported wrong. So we actually increased throughput as well as accuracy. So how can this solution then be integrated into your machine and process? First of all, there's two options. The first option is that we can integrate our algorithm into the um, automation source code. We embed it into your machine. This way, the machine would actually um, react dynamically to changes in accuracy and throughput and changes control settings based on that information. Um, the more easier option would actually be to have to export some sort of a CSV file that contains the best, the best uh, settings for each product, right? So each product is defined by wood type and measurement. And with this, it's kind of like a handbook that tells a machinery operator for which product, do, which product do I need which control settings in order to have high accuracy while having the best possible throughput. So this was the first uh, process that we optimized. Uh, now I'd like to show you um, a second process that we optimized. This time, um, the goal is a bit different. What you see here, this is the process. It's called a saw feed. So basically, these red big screws on the right and the left, they transport logs into the saw. Um, so basically, once from the left, once from the right, uh, they transport the quite heavy logs. And as you can see, these red screws, they are quite heavy, big, and they have some sort of a start and stop mechanism. They start, they stop. They start, they stop. And because they are quite heavy uh, and they need quite strong drives, there's a lot of mechanical stress on these components. And because there's a lot of mechanical stress, obviously, those components have to be maintained more often. And also, the lifetime decreases because um, the mechanical stress is quite strong. So our goal is here to actually increase the uptime. So we want less maintenance tasks, and we want to increase the lifetime of the overall components. And we want to do this by reducing the mechanical stress that is on these components. But of course, we still want to ensure that the accuracy and the throughput stay the same um, as before. We also um, tried to, or we also uh, did this project based on a virtual simulation. So again, we had a CAD file of the machine. Uh, we had uh, the source code of the automation system. So we had a virtual simulation of the whole process. And then we tried to identify how can we operate the screws differently so it actually leads to less mechanical stress. So let me show you how the result looks like. On the left, again, you see the original process and the start and stop mechanism of the screws. On the right, we, we don't have this start and stop mechanism anymore. Actually, the screws continuously move. They only change the speed. Um, so it actually has to know when do I need to be in which position to receive a new log? When do I need to send a log to the saw feed? And also, how do I control the speed? And because we no, don't have this stop and go mechanism anymore, we are actually able to reduce the mechanical stress by quite a lot, and therefore we can increase lifetime as well as uptime. So these were two use cases in terms of process optimization. I also told you in the beginning that we just we, we are developing a product that helps to save resources in operating wet storages. And I'd like to show you now how this works. So the wet storages are usually temporarily, sometimes also permanent places where logs are stored. And sprinklers try to keep um, each log um, with 100% wood moisture. The reason for this is more or less in terms of quality. If the log is, has high moisture, it means that it cannot be affected too easy with fungus or with bugs. So as you can see here, um, usually they're quite, or these wet storages are quite inefficiently. They waste a lot of resources because these sprinklers, they're turned on 24 seven. And um, no one really wants, to, no one really knows when do I need to turn it on or off. I mean, of course, there are some wet storages who try to optimize it themselves, but it's still very tricky to know, you know, based on weather forecasts and other information, you know, when do I turn on which sprinkler? So we want to actually optimize this wet storage. And therefore, we created a solution and teamed up with two other companies. Uh, here on the right 
is our first partner, Line Matrix. Line Matrix uh, is a company from Austria who develops wireless sensors. And um, Line Matrix will place sensors all over the wet storage. Uh, these sensors collect information such as humidity, temperature, and other information. The data of these sensors is then sent to the cloud where we actually determine the overall moisture of the wet storage. And based on this information, as well as the weather forecast that we include, we know the perfect um, settings. When do I need to switch on or off which sprinkler? So we have an information-based control of the sprinklers. We actually send uh, this information to the automation system. Our partner Springer is building the um, automation system on top of existing automation systems and then controls the, spr the sprinklers uh, based on the information and the recommendation that is um, provided from our side. We also have a web platform where a storage operator not only can see how is the overall moisture in my wet storage, but they can also see if there's problem with some mechanical uh, parts, because it's also very important that if a machine breaks uh, and there's no sprinkler turned on and nobody realizes the damage can be quite a lot, quite high. Yeah, so these were the solutions I wanted to show you today. Um, let me drop a few words about the team behind autonomous machines. First of all, we're a company based in Vienna. Um, we're currently 26 team members. 20 of us are engineers and scientists. Also, behind autonomous machines are actually two companies. One is called Kraftwerks, which is one of the leading industrial AI suppliers in Austria. And the other company is the Springer Maschinenfabrik, a known machinery manufacturer for sawmills. Together, we want to apply domain expertise as well as AI expertise to create perfect solutions for the wood industry. So this was it from my side. I'm happy to discuss questions now. Excellent, Michael. S thanks a lot. This is this is really super interesting what you've shown. This is also reflected in the questions, questions we received. I hope we can breathe through them in the next four to five minutes. So the one with the most upvotes is question number one. If you have tried to apply uh, reinforcement learning on the first problem, the sorting, or do you see this in general as a problem that could be solved or yeah, with RL? So the problem with, with, so what we're trying is we also use advanced algorithms to, to find the perfect settings, but we did not use a, what you would call a deep Q network. Uh, the reason for this is that the simulation, one simulation run just takes too long uh, to, to, to use deep Q networks. So one simulation can take from, you know, depending on the hardware, but it can take from 10 seconds to 30 seconds. And for those who tried reinforcement learning know that if you want a proper reinforcement learning model, it could take 100,000 tries until it finds the settings. And that would take us months <laughs> until we have the first result. Okay, now this is actually a per perfect handover to the second question. How long does it take to set up a virtual environment for a new machine and or process? So if the customer provides a CAD file, a 3D CAD file, as well as the automation code, um, the virtual, the, the set up the virtual simulation shouldn't take too long. So, I mean, we, we've done it with a couple process steps. It took us somewhere between two weeks and three weeks of work. Hmm. And also keep in mind that behind is a physics engine that we also uh, bought. And this physics engine helps us. So with all the physics, all the wood, uh, wood characteristics, as well as mechanical characteristics and so on. So this is not coming from us. Okay. Yeah, this is, it's cool. Actually, the, the questions are very organic one after each other because you, you explained why no deep Q the short uh, throughput time. And now comes the question, how about the return on invest on this type of optimization project and how it is calculated? Mm. So right now, you know, it's still one of the first projects we have. And um, right now we still, let's say, haven't figured out 100% how can we achieve the results very fast. But in the future, we believe that projects like this 
um, should cost somewhere between, let's say, 50,000 to 70,000 euros. And if we really are able to increase a throughput by 10%, I think every sawmill operator knows that the return of invest is most likely done within a couple of months or half year. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, the final question round, I'm just thinking, yeah, one is, are you considering the real time state in the simulation? And this also goes hand in hand. How accurate is the simulation and is the optimization considering the real state when running online? So maybe you can answer these two together. Um, right now we use, I, I think I told you that there's two ways to integrate the, the solution into the, into the process. So right now we're using this um, handbook where it says which settings do I need to, to set for which product. So it's kind of a half automated, half manual way where the machinery operator, you know, if there's a new product coming in, he changes the setting and the process is optimized. For the future, and it should be in, let's say, three to six months, we want to integrate the system really into the machine. And this would mean the system would consider real-time state it would measure accuracy and change control settings in the real process. So this would come in the next next month. Okay. Yes. Thanks a lot for the for the for answering the questions. Uh, yeah. As usual, there's if there are further questions to ask or if you would like to get in touch with with Michael, don't hesitate to book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him. So All right. thanks a lot from my side. Thank, Thank you, very you much. Thank you, Matthias. And Hope you stick around for the one-on-one -on -one meetings. I will. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. And to a short introduction of our next speaker. All right. Hello. Good afternoon to Sweden. We have here Hello. with Christa Lindquist. He is the yeah, CEO right. of Forest X and so far as I can tell, he is one of the best networked people in the field of AI and forestry, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Hello, Christa. Hi, thank you for that introduction. Uh, there's one thing that we need to change. I'm not the CEO. I used to be a CEO in my former company, but now I'm just, just the, the uh, sales and marketing and the founder of Forestex, and I'm happy to not be a CEO. I've done that before, so I know about that, all about that. All right, no well, problem. We, uh, let uh, me update your... That's your okay, platform. that's okay. Uh, I have it updated here. Uh, what I would like to talk about here is a little bit different than we had before. Uh, there has been some really great speeches and I'm eager to, to get in contact with many of them. Uh, I will give you a little bit outlook of the forest industry in Sweden uh, and I will touch around AI. Uh, and I will also talk about how we in ForceX are combining AI and optimization with Forest Solution. Uh, and as you know, AI in 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 a sense is is a lot of mathematical algorithms that are used now finally with with powerful machines. So we see a lot of potential in that in the forest industry. Uh, and as I said, I'm a founder of the company ForceX, and and uh, I will talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, so yeah, here we are. Uh, I've been around for a while, a uh, very long time, 1985. Uh, I've been working, I, actually I'm, I'm an IT guy, uh, but I've been working with the forest industry more than 30 years now. Uh, and I love the companies. Uh, and I'm also passionate for, for startups. I've been around for several startups myself and I'm always looking into different kinds of startups. Uh, and again, I'm sales marketing in, in uh, Forest X. So the Swedish forestry industry is, is pretty big. It's, uh, it's one of the biggest, you know, uh, Sweden, Finland, and, and uh, also where you are in Austria, Southern Europe, uh, middle, that is also quite big. So we have a lot of uh, companies to visit uh, if you look in a map like this. Uh, but, but most of all, uh, what I know is that the, the, it's also a, a very, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a market around very big companies. And these big companies in, in my world, they are, they, they are like 80, 90% of the possible market in Sweden. So the market is a lot of logos and we'll be listening to Storanza today, mm -hmm. uh, which was a great speech. 
Uh, but you can also see there's a different kind of other companies and, and also the uh, Timberter mentioned Biometria and everybody that will enter in Sweden needs to understand the role of Biometria mm -hmm. as an independent uh, measurement uh, organization uh, and, and also the, the, uh, the, the, the information hub in Sweden. So, so they are doing a lot of uh, diff uh, cool stuff as well. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. what I would like to say here is that when it comes to AI in this area, and you know, from, from my experience is that there, there, is, uh, there isn't so many uh, natural uh, initiatives around AI. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, many of the big companies have their own, like we listen to Store Answer, if you go into SCA, they have their own AI strategy and so on. Course, and yeah. that, is, that is a lack uh, that, that we need to, to, to make uh, consider uh so so it's a just dis 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 uh, disrupted market when it comes to ai and and that's why we are trying to 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 approach in that so not only large companies and corporations but ai is also a topic for the small and medium enterprises and smaller forest owners etc it is but but they don't have the the uh, financial muscles of course like the big ones so so they are relying on the companies like to be listening today that they can enter the market and, and help them in that uh so a few words around us uh forest x you, you can you can mention about the name do you do you have some slides for us to share or oh d d d oh did didn't reach us now, but let's let's try it just in case you have some. Oh, sorry, I've been I've been talking with slides. You don't you don't see them? No. Oops. Now we now we see them. Now we see them. Yeah. You see them now? Oh no! Uh, now they are here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I would say that the is yours. You have about ten minutes. Yeah. And you can ask questions to Krista in the meantime and we will answer them in the end yeah maybe it would be great if we leave a little bit more time for question and answer so see you in a bit Krista the, the stage is yours okay thank you, thank you. Uh, I, will, I will so what I but I talked about that no one saw my slides I was actually going through my slides I do it again then for everybody else you for sex uh, as again I will do an outlook on the Swedish forest industry uh and i and this is what i try to say about me myself uh and i've said that this is a map of the swedish forestry in sweden uh and i says and i also told you that when you're looking in map you see there's the swedish for swedish forest industry is, is a lot of big companies and I, I just talked about them briefly before that uh and also to to, to add on that what i just said that ai is not there is no natural uh initiative run AI, the big ones are doing their own AI strategy, uh, more or less. The only thing that we see here in Sweden is, is that Biometra and, and AI Sweden is the one that trying to do that. Uh, otherwise, the, the, the big ones are, uh, are doing the, the, uh, they by, by either uh, their own uh, program or they, they share it with, with some, some uh, partners like us. Uh, so it's a disrupt, disrupted market when it's come to AI, and that's why it's, it's so important that people, uh, companies like you, what I'm listening to, is could have a chance to enter this market uh, in a proper way. So again, uh, Forest X, yeah, who are we? Why are we here? It, it's uh, something that we we just started up. You can read by the by the uh, by the name Forest X. We are on somehow an IT company uh, or management IT company but that's totally focused on one business. That's the forest industry. Uh, that leaves us, we can't go out and find a uh, project in outside the forest. So we'll be there. Uh, so, so the forest industry is, as I said, this is something I've been living in for, for many years and I'm, I'm really engaged in that industry. Uh, and what we're seeing right now is that Digitalization and AI and all this buzzword is really entering the forest industry heavily right now. And, and we will be in that uh, area as well. So the idea for us is, is that we would like to, to be an, an entry point to different kind of initiative uh, entering the forest industry, uh, helping them get in there and, and also integrate in that, uh, integrating in, in their business uh, processes. 
So our value proposition will come from a network of services and product uh, with, with partners like, like we listen to here and get into this industry. Uh, short about us, uh, a couple of years ago, started up, but we've been in the business for many, many years. Uh, and and uh, we are growing quite heavily right now. We have some strategic partners. One of them is Trimble Forestry, which has a, has a great portfolio in when it comes to forestry solution, even some AI uh, solution. And we are you, uh, entering that in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Uh, but we're also using offshore capabilities from, from different kinds of areas, uh, Poland, Bulgaria, and we also have a team in, uh, in India that has our own theme. So, what I'll try to get to here, uh, uh, I don't know about time, but I, I hope you, you can stop me if, I, I sh uh, if I'm running out of time. But it's, uh, we have some forest solution that we're entering with our partners. We also have a, a very strong focus on AI uh, or AI ML optimization, which is something we, we are trying to, to, uh, to enter market. And we have some partners there. Uh, one of them is a, is a, is a cube there called 1050, which is a very competent uh, bunch of, of uh, bunch of competent data science uh, skills here in, in Sweden. We're also doing uh, quite good cool stuff together with a, with a startup called Collective Crunch, and I know that Collective Crunch is, is in this meeting as well, so they're listening. So so please uh, set up meeting with Rolf there. They have some really cool stuff they're going to talk about a little later. And we have our own tool as well, uh, which is an optimization tool for the uh, optimization AI tool for the for the sawmilling industry. And then we have our services, uh, our consultancy comes from our own network, together with, with partners as well. So what we are we are trying to enter in this market is is, is a, bu a bunch of, of selected partners and, and specialists uh, to get in, in, to, to leverage in this market. And, and uh, the idea of, of ForestX is that we will, we will have this enough business skill. We know the processes around forestry and uh, forest management and, and also the, the uh, industry. Uh, we have pretty good, pretty good partners and own skill around IT and digital solutions and, and also products. And, and the idea here is, is that we will entering the market with with a, with, a, with intersection between all these skills. And AI is, is again is one of the the, uh, the services that we have. So what I what I see here that that I've seen and listened to many 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 uh, smart and and uh, good AI initiatives that 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 uh, will help this market uh, this industry growing and and. Uh, uh, make it uh, make it better. Uh, but what we are trying to do in ForestX is we we will integrate and and connect this value chain together. Uh, since we have the the focus on that. So uh, to to my main uh, topics here, what are we doing around AI, machine learning, and optimization right now? Uh, which is could be some some really cool stuff for you to listen to. Uh, we have uh, we have a tool called OptinX. It's it's uh, it's it's really a, uh, a planning and calculation tool where you simulate the sawmill or a production unit uh, to optimize and, and using uh, different kind of, of smart technology and uh, mathematics to create the model of the of the organization. Then you can you can optimize uh, the value for for the for the uh, for the for the, uh, for the plant. And, and uh, that is using in every step we have uh, using optimization and AI to, 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 for example, for the planners to get the the, the, uh, uh, the right tool for decision. Uh, so it's it's something we we we, uh, uh, we are entering. We have that and we have that on the market right now. Uh, and now so I will I will also talk a little bit about the operational planning part of that some key functionality that we're also uh, using for glue lab and, and uh, functionality for, for planning of that. Another part of that is that we, we, uh, we're working with a company called 1050, uh, 
that we have done some trial using AI as, as a method for estimation of the of the of the area, basal area, when you are at forest and trying to predict how much volume we have in the forest. And in that trial and in that application we, we did, we saw that the, the we could we could be much better than a, than a, than a physical planner around uh, how to, to predict uh, the, the forest. And we, the improvement was really astonishing. Uh, we also saw that there is much less variance when using this technology and, and uh, there is no bad optimization estimation of that. Uh, the thing about that is that when you come to this kind of solution, uh, you often see that the, 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 the main problem is not the technology or the, the calculation or the application. It is around this change management process. How should you introduce these kind of tools into an organization? Uh, that have been using the, the, the same method for many, many years. So, so in this case, in this specific particular case, the, the, the client said, this is so good that we want to use it today, but it's sorry, but it's two years uh, early. It's too early for us to use this. It's at least, at least two years early for us to, to start using this. Uh, but the result was good, and we are now trying to, to, to um, uh, focus on the next phase of that. Another solution that we have uh, coming up is, is how we continuously optimize the bucking instruction when you're out in the forest, when, you, when you're harvesting by using a and uh, advanced optimization algorithm. And we have two initiative, initiative, initiative in that uh, already. One is, is, uh, is, is, is in production and the other one is, is in the R&D status where we're trying to use uh, modeling. For, for, for changing the, AI, the optimization, uh, the backing instruction, backing patterns uh, in real, real time. Uh, and, and, uh, and as again, the result is really good for that. Uh, we're doing that with a couple of uh, two different kinds of partners today. And, and uh, as, uh, but what you what would like to do there is you, you want to find would like to find the most optimal point between the value for the forest company and, and the yield for, for, for uh, and yield has come out and find this Pareto front uh, by number of iteration. Uh, today you know when you were doing this bucket instruction, you're using quite old data uh, like steam data that you have in, in your save for for, for uh, for, for you have in, in uh, using the same steam data, for example, when you're doing this. Uh, but what we like to do is that, that you update the, the, the data uh, when while you're harvesting. So you, when you're harvesting uh, half of the the, the, uh, the area, you will get a much better view of what's really actually in this uh, forest, what's coming up in this forest. And and so it's a continuously optimizing the the, the uh, backing instruction for the harvester. Uh, Again, it's, 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 it's something that we are quite early in right now. We also have a partner in Collective Crunch, which is which have a really cool uh, GI solution that you should lean to called Linda Forest. And, and uh, we are doing the first project with, them, project with them today in Sweden that we're using that for, 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 uh, for different kind of analysis, especially around forest inventories. Uh, where we're using the, their method of, of seeing how much uh, the inventories you see uh, uh, in, in, your, in your GI system uh, with different kind of layers. They also, uh, there's a tool there for, for predicting the climate changes, what's happening with the climate changes, what is the value of your forest in, in the one to five to 10 to 100 years ahead. Uh, and, and uh, so, so that is something that, that we would like to, to uh, explore a little bit more. This kind of solution is often a single solution that, that helps the, the clients in, in, in a specific part of the process. Uh, and we see that uh, to integrate these uh, solutions in, in, a, in a larger scope, that will help us uh, and, and help the Forest Institute to get the, the, uh, the, the better value uh, for that investment. And, and last but not least, the, the, uh, one of the, the most uh, interesting solution we see today is the American solution for Remsoft that we are trying to, to uh, explore. That, that's a tool for, to help, uh, uh, help the, the, uh, the forestry for optimization, the, the special run, uh, tactical and, and uh, strategical planning uh, values before harvesting. So it's, it's more of a 
we are all, unfortunately almost at the end of our time slot. Yep. So I'd like to um, um, uh, ask you to jump maybe over to your conclusion. Or your the last the slide. Clu conclusion is like this. This is actually, thank you for that. I'm, I'm actually there right now. Uh, what we see is that AI will, will absolutely not radically change the business model in the forestry industry. Uh, it, it's only going to improve many of the processes today. Uh, when, especially when you when you when you succeed to connect connect it to the value chain uh, without technology, and and uh, but, but again, my, my message to you is is that don't under, underestimate the change process. I've seen so many proof of concept project coming up right now and have happening around AI, but but the, the real change will never come unless you have the people with you uh, doing the changes. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much me. Sorry about the, for for a bad start, but uh, this is what I would like to say, uh, and and also introduce us as my introduction. That's that's a very important point. Don't ask them, underestimate the change process. Uh, you can start yeah. interesting proof of concepts, but actually integrating AI into existing workflows that's a challenge we always faced. Uh, 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 also from the side of our participants of our applied artificial intelligence conferences we have we have quite a few questions and no mm -hmm. time at all mm -hmm. clemens pick one question for a quick quick answer uh yes then i will pick the first one uh when it comes to applying ai and digital technologies in the forest um, where do you see differences and similarities to other european uh, countries famous for wood and or Canada. Uh, there, there is, there is, there's a lot of similarities, absolutely in that. When it comes to, to how to, 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 uh, to uh, when it comes to technology, but the difference is, is often it's, it's regional specific. In in Sweden, I can only talk for Sweden. We don't see so many foreign solutions here in Sweden because Sweden has a, a lot of things, especially around this biometric thing. So, so both similarities and differences. Uh, I will say uh, in that. So it's um, so to make it easy to connect the value chain is a little bit different, but in each step, it's, it's a lot of similarities. If that's a good answer on that. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for being with us today. Mm -hmm. This concludes our session because the next speakers are already waiting. Yeah, again, the invitation goes out. If you have further questions to Christa, or if you, Christa, have questions to other participants, please don't hesitate to book one-on-one -on -one meetings, which are still yep. open tomorrow. Thank we you. appreciate it a lot that you are part of this conference today. Thanks for taking the time and also joining in, in the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Yep. Best wishes to Sweden. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. And we move on with a little intro for our next speaker coming up. Yes. And Hello. Hi. Here we are. Hello, Timos Platzas. He's the Corporate Social Responsibility Manager Western Europe for Microsoft. And he will explain which countries are entailed by Western Europe. Uh, Timos is located in Athens and uh, has a lot of interesting projects to share that Microsoft is involved in. Um, how is it going, Timos? Hi, hi. Thank you so much for your invitation. It's a great honor to be here today with you. Uh, before I start, I have to admit that I have a small technical issue. I'm not able to share my presentation. So I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, okay. Is there any way? But we can we can try. Um, have you tried sharing your screen? The, yeah, the... that's what I'm doing. Let me try it again. Um, mm -hmm. So while I'm trying to, um, this is happening when it's live. Um, so um, I'm very. Yeah. Uh, just try uh, hit share screen, and uh, uh, otherwise we are working on a solution. Don't uh, worry. To uh, yes, we will forget it. Uh, now, give me one minute so that I can open the presentation again because I tried to switch off and switch on the presentation again. Oh sure, don't worry. Well, um, how about how about you start your presentation? Yes. 
So, um, yeah, that works. All right, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Timos Pilatas. I'm from Athens, from Greece. Uh, my job is, just a few words about myself, is uh, my job is to uh, build sustainability programs in Western Europe. And Western Europe is a cluster of 12 countries. Um, Italy, Spain, Austria, of course, is part of this uh, cluster. And um, the big chunk of work that I'm delivering in those countries is uh, skilling and employability. So we're trying to build some programs that will enable people to learn about AI and get those type of skills that we need. And, and I think Krista made a very good point that you know companies today they don't have finance resources but I would add here that you know we see that they're struggling with skills at the same time and the second piece of my work is to build some what we call the AI for good uh, projects where we're trying to leverage artificial intelligence and try to um, build some programs that will tackle some important societal issues like environmental sustainability for example or like sustainability so this is pretty much my job. I'm not going to claim that I'm I'm an expert in forestry, uh, and I, I'm I've learned a lot of uh, throughout the process, and I'm I'm really looking forward to learning more through this conference. But uh, what I hopefully uh, aiming to achieve by the end of this presentation is to help you understand what Microsoft is doing in the sphere of artificial intelligence and environmental sustainability, and what you could potentially add to your projects and hopefully uh, achieve your goals. So um, there is no doubt. That, you know, we have your slides now. Uh, yes, you I've already the next slide, and we'll display your slides. Okay. Uh, I, I'm 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 already showing my slides. Can you see my slides? I'm on the second one. Oh wait, wait, wait. Yes. All right. Now it works. Perfect. All right. Great. Uh, so uh, without a doubt, you know, humanity faces some serious issues. COVID-19, I know it's on top of all of us, but, uh, you know, environmental sustainability is also becoming an emerging need to take an action. And it was like, uh, I think it was last week where the European president uh, made this public commitment um, about the sustainability future of European Commission. And she made the, those big um, ambitious goals uh, which are co-signed by some important companies, 170 companies in Europe have co-signed this, this um, uh, sustainability commitment, which is really important and a very good sign that you know society is waking up. And uh, a lot of environmental challenges, including the forestry um, uh, piece, is something that we need to, to tackle uh, as soon as possible. Now, before I go into the AI for Earth, I would like to spend a few minutes to share with you where do we come from in terms of the AI for what we call good. So AI for Good is obviously uh, an initiative that we we started a couple of years ago. It's 125 million uh, commitment and that Microsoft has made uh, in order to leverage artificial intelligence and create some societal uh, um, uh, changes, help the society to tackle some of their uh, important uh, issues. The reason why we believe in artificial intelligence is because simply we believe that by amplifying human ingenuity, we're able to help people to uh, assign some of their difficult tasks to what we call the machines and then leave them much more time in order to dedicate to strategic decisions or some other most important things that make more sense for them. So this is the reason why we believe in artificial intelligence. We have adopted this uh, in our business sphere, of course, and without a doubt, we also believe that this can be extended to uh, create some societal change. Based on this, uh, of course, there is a lot of conversation around ethics and how, how, to what extent we use artificial intelligence and whatever we do and what we will see in the next couple of slides is always uh, under a very specific context of maintain the ethical rules that will uh, allow us to use artificial intelligence. And I really like this quote from our president, uh, Brad Smith, which says that, you know, it's not about what computers can do for us, but what computers should do for us. So uh, of course for us, uh, this is a, a very important um, principle and we try to follow in all of our partnerships. Um, AI for Good has uh, five pillars. Uh, one is our AI for Earth, which obviously I'm going to share with you more on how this works. How can you be part of this uh, um, 
program, how you can benefit from this program. Uh, and of course, uh, at the end of the presentation, I have a couple of examples to share with you. Artificial uh, IA for accessibility is an important piece, helping people uh, either with visual impairment or with mental impairment to become independent and uh, promote the inclusive society. Humanitarian action, uh, helping uh, the NGOs working on the front line of the um, of the humanitarian aid and helping them to uh, leverage artificial intelligence. Of course, cultural heritage and health, especially nowadays on the occasion of COVID-19, we announced a couple of months ago, I think it was April timeframe, uh, a new program uh, around helping uh, researchers to um, uh, talk, find some solutions around COVID uh, using AI. So this is, um, I thought that would make sense for me to share where we stand as a company in terms of AI and how AI for Earth fits to this. Now, uh, what is AI for Earth? So AI for Earth, I'm not sure if everyone uh, in the audience is familiar with it, but this is a new, not a new, new program. So we launched this, I think it was like three years ago. And uh, of course, ultimately what we aiming to achieve is making sure that we empower people and organizations to leverage technology, use this innovative solution so that we can solve some of the um, uh, global environmental challenges. Um, the way that we see this, um, Actually, there are, there are four areas where we're pretty active. One is agriculture, of course, um, how we help farmers, how we help forestry, for example, um, to uh, use technology so that we can be more efficient, so that they can, for example, for farmers, how we can help them to improve their, their yield, but at the same time, make sure that what they, whatever they do is sustainable, it's not uh, against the environment. Water, water preservation is another big issue. On Monday, um, we, we were very happy to announce a big partnership with World Economic Forum and, and with um, uh, c 4 I are on how we work with nonprofits and organizations to uh, build some sustainability programs around water preservation, uh, biodiversity, how we help um, protect some uh, species that are about to uh, to extinct in the next coming years. I, I recently read a, a, a data that, you know, um, a survey that will say that um, if we take no action, 38% of uh, our species on Earth will get extinct. So this is very important. And of course, climate change is in the, in, is in the center of our interest. Uh, what, are the, what does this mean for us? How we work with you? So uh, there are essentially um, three main pillars that we work with the organizations. And I would love to, after the, 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 the event, but it's also um, in the future to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with each one of you that we would love to learn more about this. But let me give you a glimpse of how this is working. Uh, so first of all, we, we increase access. So this means that the organizations that are coming and work with us, uh, first of all, they need to have um, a social mission. And so the reason why they want to build this application is because they want to help the, the society to thrive in, in the, into the forest or real estate space. So increased access means increased access to technology. One very simple example is that we're offering Azure credit, for example, to those who have enough data to use and build those applications. Uh, the second piece is provide education. The skilling piece is, is very important in the IT industry, generally speaking. So it's not that we just um, um, hand over, if I may say, um, a bunch of technology to people and then we let them uh, do their own stuff. No, we're trying to help them educate them how to use those technologies, how they can create a thing out of the box and what, uh, what those resources that we are offering them can do for them. And then the third piece is the fuel innovation. We really, really keep an eye uh, not only in Europe, but across the world, I have to say, to some uh, what we call signature projects, projects that really have the characteristics, if I may say, of scaling uh, and helping other countries, have the characteristics of tackling some important issues. So this is where we step in into those kind of projects and we try to partner with those um, uh, organizations or, or customers to build together something that will be collectively helping tackle the serious societal issues. There are a bunch of programs that we have created across the world all these years. Of course, you see that there is a lot of, of, of concentration in the US and, and Europe, of course, um, in different areas. Uh, I would say that it, there are spread across all the, um, the areas with the exception of, of Africa, where you see that there is a lot of focus on agriculture. But if you see in Europe, for example, you see that water by diversity and climate change comes on top of, their, of the priorities. I think that this is quite equal. Um, 
Now, uh, the, I, as I said at the beginning of, of our um, of our meeting, um, I'm not aiming to um, pretend like I know everything and you know I'm the expert to answer to all the questions. But I thought that I would share with you a couple of two examples that I feel like may really make sense and probably inspire you to understand how you use AI in the future, not just through Microsoft, but with any company that uh, can offer you this opportunity. Uh, and I would like to start with a program which is um, uh, very much uh, focused on, on land cover mapping. Um, and I would take the, as an example of an area in the US, uh, which is called um, uh, Chesapeake Bay. So it's a, it's a watershed, uh, let's say, area where um, it's, it spans, it's like 64 square meters, uh, square, uh, square uh, miles, sorry, not meters. And um, I think that there are, I heard that there were around 17,000 um, people that their lives are dependent on this uh, uh, watershed. And the problem is that, it, 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 that uh, it occurs over there is because of the climate change and because of the of the um, uh, people that are using the, the land, uh, this, uh, there are some problems that are creating in this watershed. So for example, overflows uh, that uh, create some serious issues uh, in the land. So you understand that this requires a detailed, precise um, um, carving map on the, on the region. Uh, and what the, the team, what I will share with you, and there is a video, uh, if, if you help me to play this video after I finish, um, so what, what uh, an organization tried to do over there is to create, um, uh, let's say, a precise model where a persistent conversation uh, a model where um, the land cover, uh, which is only available for 30, 30 uh, meters uh, resolution, can be, can be reduced to one meter. So they can have a more precise tracking of how much land is covered and what are the, 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 the corrective actions that they need to take in that particular area in order uh, which is the, the, the big interest for the uh, conservations. So um, I would like to uh, share with you the video. Uh, if you could help me to play this video. Is that easy, Matthias? Or I can... I've been a waterman on the Chesapeake Bay since 1995. When you're out there on the water every day for that long, you see how things have changed. It's hard knowing there's nothing you can do but watch. My name is Bob Ingersoll, and I'm a farmer. The demand for our kind of work is only going up, and we're constantly looking at how to expand our yield without stripping the land or polluting the bay. The Chesapeake Conservancy has been focused on creating tools that help answer some of these questions. In the infancy of the Chesapeake Bay program, scientists built a scale physical model of the bay to understand how processes worked and to simulate potential solutions. A lot has changed since then, and technology has been the catalyst. The Chesapeake Conservancy has been a pioneer in the field of precision conservation, getting the right practices in the right places, but it hasn't always been easy. Until recently, land cover data was only available at 30 meters resolution and represented what the landscape looked like seven years ago. Not great for precision planning. We raised the support and spent 18 months working with our partners to create a one meter land cover database for the Chesapeake Bay program. This unprecedented project took a lot of effort and massive computing power. Now we are working with Microsoft and using AI and deep learning to accelerate our work both in the Chesapeake and across the country. Our collaboration is aimed at providing partners with the information they need to make informed decisions. Taking advantage of advances in AI, we are working towards a process where land cover mapping could be done anywhere, anytime, almost instantaneously. The Microsoft Cloud is freeing up organizations to spend less time on technology and more time on conservation. Working with a conservancy, I am now able to restore and protect my lands with the same level of precision that I grow my crops. This allows me to focus on what I need to do, provide food for people while sustaining the land and the bay. I love this water. I love this work. It's a special place out here, and it's up to us to protect it.
Great, thank you so much. Let me share my screen again uh, and jump on the slide where um, I can share how, how especially this works. Um, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, if not, Matthias, please let me know. Uh, so um, does it work? Works like a charm. I hope it works. Um, so essentially, uh, I just want to um, share with you how this system works. With, where it's the, the first step is the landing area where the, 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 the organization is identifying in the area. And then, and then there are different means of how you take some uh, pictures of this. It could be through drones or airplanes or satellite. And those applications are then those, sorry, uh, imaginary, uh, then it's stored in the Azure Cloud store, uh, store and then, there is the model training, which is the basic, um, and the most constituent, I would say, part of this process on how you train the model to understand what it's seen. And then the model um, um, is trying to process the imaginary and identify where the areas where they, they see some changes. And based on this, it provides the insights to the researchers. Um, I'm happy to share with you more on this story, and there are a lot of uh, things that have already been written on, uh, about this story after after the uh, the event. I know that I have only uh, ten minutes left, so I'm, I'm just going to try to hurry up a little bit and go into the Sylvia Terra project, which is mainly, I would say, uh, most closely to to uh, to this uh, to today's event. Um, uh, so Sylvia Terra, actually, what is aiming to uh, to achieve here is to so here was the here's the challenge that you know uh, conserve. Uh, conservationists and landowners, uh, they need some inventory um, in order for the forest in order to understand better what is going on and so that they can make a, a better decisions on their management goals. Um, so Sylvia Terra would want to um, uh, build an application uh, based on which it will allow to give all this information around the quality of the of the forest in the area, specific areas and uh, and make and essentially empower um, um, uh, conservationists and land owners to understand uh, the challenges or the opportunities uh, that they see in the forest and then make the decision that they want to make. Uh, I'm not going to spend more time on this. I think that the video is very um, self-explanatory. Um, so I would like to ask you, Matthias, if you could help me also to uh, pass to the next video, please. There are hundreds of millions of acres of forest in the United States. What's happening with them today is the result of centuries of past decision making. Forests are made up of complex interconnected systems. And there's never been a way to measure all of these systems. And you can't manage what you can't measure. Through Microsoft's AI for Good initiative, we've created the first high resolution inventory of all US forests to provide better data and to make better decisions. We've been timbering this land for over 40 years. The watershed provides drinking water to all of the citizens of Duncannon. It is not maintained in a sustainable way. Duncannon came to the Nature Conservancy because they had no forest management plan. Using Sylvia Terra, the borough will know how many trees are per acre, waterways will be mapped and buffered. This will be sustainably managed working forest forever. Working with Microsoft AI has been transformative because it allows us to scale our process globally and to democratize access to this kind of information. We have the forest that we have today. We can't change that. What we can change is the future. Microsoft AI and Sylvia Terra are empowering landowners so they can grow the forests of the future. Every single person has a stake in this. Great, thank you so much. Let me share my screen for a last time. Um, um, <laughs> it's now in the last minute that it's not gonna show up. So just give me one second, please. I'll reopen my presentation. Um, so this is pretty much while I'm trying to open my presentation. This is, this is the solution that uh, we have co collectively created with uh, Sylvia Terra. 
Um, uh, it's essentially an inventory of uh, forests, and there is a very great uh, map, an interactive map that they have created, and uh, I can share the link uh, on the chat box um, uh, with you later on uh, so that you know uh, where to find more information around this. Um, I'd like to, my last uh, slide uh, is, sorry, just one minute, please. Um, I was hoping to give you some, oh, there we go. Um, so how Sylvia Terra works essentially, um, let me, so the way that uh, Sylvia Terra works, it's that they are um, satellites capturing high resolution images uh, those those uh, imaginary is is going into the Microsoft Azure, which is our cloud, if I if I may say, uh, where um, it, it it goes through the necessary processes, and then there is um, a detailed uh, forest map that uh, Sylvia Terra um, um, uh, creates by using some of Microsoft technology, and this is what provides the um, the uh, details and the insights that um, everyone needs to know. Uh, I know that was a very top line description, and obviously uh, that's not fair for the for the gravity of this project. But I'm just cautious of time, and I just don't make want to make sure that I'm used the the time not against the rest of the speakers. Um, now, I would like to end by by sharing with you those three links. I think that uh, those are very important links that you can go through and check what are the offerings that we have and, and identify where are the offers uh, for you, how you can match with your programs. Uh, by all means, please reach out to me. I've already received tons of requests on my LinkedIn account. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate your, your appreciation and your, and your interest to this. I'm happy to reply to everyone and happy also to meet with uh, some of you where you think that we have the common areas uh, to work together. And with that said, uh, also thank you, uh, Matthias and the team, for inviting me in this great event and hope you uh, all the best for the rest of the event. All right. Hi. Thank you, Timos, for the interesting presentation. We got a lot of information here, and especially with your call to action to actually take part in the project, we got a lot of questions from our other participants of this event. Um, questions are still coming in. Um, Guys, you can still ask questions and upvote other people's questions. Let me just display them here quickly. Uh, all right, well, Clemens. Yeah, I mean, the first two questions are pretty much covered cover the same topic. Yes. Uh, is the project open source? Actually goes for the both project and, and or do you plan to outsource or open source parts of the underlying technology? Uh, this is a very good question. I have to cross-check this with uh, with the team that have created this. I think it's open source, uh, but I have to check about the future. I have to check this with the team, what their plans, because I'm not owning this project. Mm -hmm. There was talk about democratizing the data or something. Maybe the person meant this reference. Yes. yes. And we'll move on. Good. Then the, the second one we just had. Uh, Third question by Rory. Is it possible to use Silvia Terra in other countries, e.g. E East Africa? Uh, we always try to, I think that's a very good question. And what we always try to do is to leverage whatever we work successfully to one region or one country and take the, the good learnings and amplify those learnings to another region. I, in my experience, I've, this, I've seen this happening, so I would be more than happy to um, to help. And if there's something specific that Rory has in mind, please reach out to me and we can investigate this. But most of the products that we develop, that's the aim, to scale them. Okay, this brings me also actually to the last question here, but it's a direct follow-up question. What is the rollout plan for Silvia Terra in globally? Like I think... Yeah, I think we've made a bigger commitment around environmental sustainability. We always try to see how we can maximize the partnerships that we have with our partners. Uh, so um, I haven't talked to them recently, but I think that, you know, obviously their plans is to expand. And again, if there's anything that you have in mind, please reach out to me. I'm happy to to connect you with either Sylvia Terra or uh, the team, the, the engineers who have worked from Microsoft side on this project. Mm -hmm. The next question is actually more going in the direction of call to action. Uh, is it possible to take part in the AI for Earth initiative and who to contact? 
So uh, yes, under some specific circumstances, uh, you are eligible. I'm not sure what what's the type of the company that is asking this question, but um, those are uh, pretty much for everyone. This program is pretty much for everyone. With the, the prerequisite is that whatever you will create, it, you need to deliver a societal impact. Uh, so not for commercial purposes. And the se- and also you need to have a, a big chunk of data, all right? Enough data so that you can build AI. And I think that this is, this is, makes sense. Now, if you want to conduct, I would say start from the, the, the links that I've already shared. And I, I don't know, uh, Matthias, how you would like to share those links. And yep. if you have any questions, uh, there is, of course, a team that can help you answer those questions. But please feel free to contact me on LinkedIn and, and also to jump on a call and have a, a more thorough conversation. We will, we will actually, uh, with your permission, share your slides uh, with uh, our participants. And those slides contain the links that you mentioned on the last slides. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not these slides. Let, let me fix a little bit those slides because there are some insights inside there. I wouldn't like to make them public, but I can give you the final version after the event. Obviously, corporate right. media has to check. Yeah. All right. <laughs> if there is a concrete call to action, we can also use the the conference LinkedIn channel, of course, and or, or the and the nonprofit LinkedIn channel that, that you see here behind me, sort of. So yeah, there is we we can surely make matchmaking. All right. Good. The second question, or the the second to last question, again from Rory, is uh, rather technical. Can you identify plant types through the final resolution imagery and AI combo? Uh, That's a very technical question. I'm sorry. I have to ask this. Can you pass me the question and I'll make sure I'll I'll get the answer for for Rory? Yeah, sure. Because we. I wonder if Rory can do that. Yes, please, on LinkedIn. And I can get this question for you, Rory. Get this answer, sorry. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. And the yeah. other one is if it is uh, available in other areas. Uh, yes, I think it is the same like I set up the previous one. There was a great example from Sweden. I will make sure I'll post it on our, on the event. Um, it was just a little bit more complicated to share on this in this conference. That's why I didn't pick it up. Um, but I'll make sure I'll share it with you. Okay, noted. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Communication works. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, Timos, to My share pleasure. projects with us. Uh, we pleasure. are aware that you have an ongoing conference this week, the Microsoft Ignite. Uh, of course, as we speak. Now, yeah. it's happening. <laughs> Day two. You know, we are the largest conference for AI in forestry, but you are one All of right. the largest virtual conferences. <laughs> No, it's still interesting. Uh, congratulations on the great job that you have done here. And we spoke offline anyway that we will keep on in touch and we have a lot of things to discuss in the future. Thank you so much for having me and have a great day. Yeah, thank you. And all the best with the initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Bye. All right. And we have a short break of about eight minutes before we continue on with our next speaker who is running a very interesting company based in Kenya. So see you in eight minutes. Take the time to review your own personal meeting agenda. If you don't have any meetings yet, use the chance now to check out who's there, including Timos from Microsoft and contact him. See you in a bit.
Hello and welcome back everyone to this next part of our Applied AI in Forestry, Timber and Wood conference. And right now it's my special pleasure to actually switch over to my colleague Eric Weinana, who is sitting in our office, the Advantage Austria uh, office in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Eric, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, Matthias. Wonderful. Uh, how is it going in Nairobi? Oh, it's a bit warm. We are very lucky. Uh, it's not been like this for the last couple of weeks. So uh, it's a good thing for us. We're very excited about it. How is Actually, how's Vienna? Yeah, it's, it's yeah the last bit of summer. We enjoy it. Okay. Actually, I already talked to somebody over the phone today who is... Uh, uh, in the forestry industry in Kenya, and he was in the forest actually working. <laughs> very, very quite, lucky. We have a lot of participants from Kenya and Eastern Africa, yes, thanks to you. And I will just uh, hand over the stage to you to introduce our next speaker. All right, thank you. Thanks, Matthias. Um, so think about it. Uh, Kenya is at the very forefront of ensuring uh, of increasing forest cover. So uh, in this period in time, we have about 5.4% land cover uh, in terms of forest and trees. And the government has a very ambitious plan of uh, taking that to up to 10% over the next two years. So this is by uh, 2022. Um, these ambitious plans have seen the government uh, particularly invest in planting about 1.8 billion seedlings um, of trees over the next two years. Uh, but then the challenge is the models in which uh, this has been done or the models that have been used to do this. Um, well, there have been a lot of investment in uh, in, in getting um, school-going children and farmers across the entire country to play their part in increasing forest cover. The only challenge has been in terms of um, the application of technology to do this. And so when you see, uh, when you think about that challenge and we think about forestry um, in general, and you start to think about what companies and what kind of technologies can be applied in doing this. And that's why um, we thought Komaza is a very exciting company to be able to do this. And our next speaker is going to be uh, from this company that sits in the coastal belt of Kenya called Komaza. Uh, they've been in this space for the last uh, 10 years playing the microforestry space. And given and granted what has been exciting about them is not actively just thinking about uh, building forest uh, covers alone, but then turning it into a sustainable, taking a sustainable approach towards doing it, towards increasing forest cover. And without further ado, allow me to introduce Esther Mutuma, uh, who will speak a bit about what her company does. Um, what was pretty much um, the idea behind it and what kind of success they have seen. So um, Esther, very, very welcome to Advantage Austria and very, very welcome to uh, the AI in Forestry Conference. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's a great opportunity and um, looking forward to a great discussion this afternoon. So as I start off, um, I'll say something small about myself. Um, I, I started out as a banker, but uh, I realized that there was need to really um, change a lot of things about the way we look at um, the world, especially in this part of the world where we have a lot of people who are disadvantaged. So I got into the space of forestry and working with smallholder farmers and um, I joined Komaza and I would, this afternoon I want to talk about what Komaza is all about. and. Um, I'll, go, I'll, I'll be sharing some screen, screen with you for a presentation through my speech, and uh, we'll leave some time for a question and answer. So Komaza is about a social impact of uh, people. It's about sustainable business uh, profits, and it's also about environmental impact. Um, what we want to do with the people we work with is increase their incomes, because basically they are smaller farmers, um, they're utilizing their land, and we would want to see that their lives have been improved because that also becomes an incentive for them to want to do uh, forestry. In terms of profitability, we look at the uh, operations that will guarantee a sustainability um, uh, as a business and uh, as a going concern. And we know that you cannot grow a business that's not sustainable. So if you're making some money, then it's easy to uh, make the business sustainable enough 
uh, and to continue to grow it and to even attract investors. We are also very conscious of the environment and we look at the environmental impact on the planet and we think about um, environment being um, everything around environmental conservation but also around sustainable wood sourcing, especially in this part of the world. I'm going to share with you the business model uh, of the Komaza um, business, what we give and what we get. So we give inputs, we give expertise, and we give training to the farmers that we work with. And in turn, the farmers give us land, they give labor, and they provide security for the trees that they grow. So it's a, it's a give and take. And um, when they give the, the, the land, labor, and security, they get zero costs uh, for the in inputs that they get and the expertise and the training. And at the same time, they get a really fair price for the trees that they've planted over the period of time that they've planted the trees. And what does Komaza get? Komaza gets to own the trees and uh, to be assured of um, reliable source of supply for wood uh, to be able to uh, set up wood processing facility. Now, why does this model work so well? Simply for two reasons. Um, the major reason being that it has an environmental impact, but at the same time, it has a social impact and it's also a sustainable business. And uh, having said that, we have found out that forestry is really great for farmers, but also that farmers are great for forestry. And so it becomes a win-win uh, kind of situation where farmers get something and farmers get something in return. Now, this is the how of the equation it becomes a business. It becomes a business because as long as the Komaza has a reliable uh, raw material supply, then there can be value addition and then there can be um, money paid to the farmers. Why is this a big solution in terms of an environmental perspective? That is because Africa is already the world's largest wood consumer. Uh, 1.5 1 times of Kenya's total land area of deforestation and degradation is going to happen in the next 15 years. And if you think about it, if you think about uh, places like the Congo Basin, which is currently the source of a lot of the wood that is consumed within the region, you're, you take the map of Kenya and you're technically utilizing a whole of Congo um, every, every year just to supply the wood that is required for the country. So basically speaking, if nobody does anything about replenishing all this wood consumption, then we are going to deforest the entire uh, planet, uh, starting with Africa. And that is where Komaza decided to step in and try solve this problem. The problem is really um, in the use of wood because of the growing populations. And we thought that Komaza can become the next uh, face of African forestry by using small older farmers. And the reason for that is because there isn't so much land left for plantation forestry in Africa. And therefore, we have to work with what is available, which is the smallholder farmers that can come together and get involved in this process. The greatest change of our time, um, like Hans Rosling put it in uh, 2015, is that Africa's population is going to increase from just 1 billion people to about 4, 4 billion people. Now, when you think about that increase, you're thinking about um, a huge global population that needs to have beds and infrastructure and furniture and all manner of uh, things that are supported by wood. And therefore, there is need to supply um, that sort of wood to make it feasible for Africa to really sustain uh, the growth, the, the growth of population by 2050. We are looking at things like building and fencing poles. We are looking at sawmilling lumber. We are looking at uh, infrastructure in terms of electricity, getting electricity to people's homes is going to require use of wood. We are looking at charcoal as one of the things that's utilized a lot in uh, the African setup, just to mention, but a few. And so that massive use of wood and wood products calls for a very innovative solution. And that is what Komaza is all about. Our business model is uh, purely based on innovation. And we believe that using technology and data 
can give us the excellence that we require to run an organization in a company that cuts across a number of countries in Africa that will be providing the solution. So I'm going to talk a bit about how do we apply technology? Um, why is technology coming in? Why does it even matter in this context? Now, for, for us to be able to work with small scale farmers, we found out that we needed to build scalable systems to support this particular model. And those scalable systems are supposed to be integrated in such a way that uh, from seedling nursery production to the training and field extension of our workers to the harvesting and wood processing, the entire value chain can be supported by use of technology. And that is what we have spent a lot of time building to make sure that, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's a scalable system that we are building because we are only working with 25,000 farmers right now, but we are looking forward to working with hundreds uh, and millions of farmers across Africa in the next couple of years. And therefore, we needed to spend the first couple of years really um, working on technology, figuring out how we can use technology to get us to the next level. So basically, um, it's, it's, very, it's very complicated. It's not uh, ABC. It's having all the data, all the information that you can think of on a simple mobile phone and uh, rolling that out and making that massively scalable across the region that's gonna make the difference. And it, it's really um, a lot of data sets. If you think about 25,000 farmers, if you think about 5,000 hectares that are subdivided, not in one big blockchain of uh, a plantation, but in very small two acre, three acre pieces of land, it becomes a very complex uh, uh, issue that must be you know, figured out, thought through, and uh, for us to get a solution. We are, we are talking about uh, data types like Shamba data, trying to figure out the seedling count, in millions. Uh, this year alone, uh, Eric has mentioned that Kenya is uh, aspiring to 10% uh, tree cover and we have billions of trees to plant. Um, this year alone, we planted 1.5 million trees in Kenya, making us one of the biggest commercial planters in the, in the country. And we have to have a lot of data to support that. We have a field extension network that we assign the responsibility to work with all these farmers on the ground and they have to create and um, uh, collect all this data in their, in their systems. And really that is for us, the technology, that, that is where technology comes in to fast track what we are doing and to get us there sooner rather than later. We are talking about collecting people's bio data uh, in terms of images and in metadata. We're talking about location data, GPS, uh, Shamba polygons. A Shamba is a farm and uh, everybody, every farmer needs to know you know, where the trees planted, uh, where the exact boundaries and things like those. And it's a lot of data to put together um, and to get the process going. So I'm going to talk a bit about how mobile technology has solved the problem for us. So our field extension network, like I've said earlier, is already catalyzed by technology. We leverage technology to effect effectively and very efficiently implement and scale our business model. All our field extension network staff have smartphones that they use that are custom designed uh, with mobile applications to help them gather all this data. And soon we are going to be launching um, a technical checklist and training videos and logistics and pharma communications and all manner of uh, solutions that are going to help us to get to the next level. Uh, currently, what we are able to do with this um, uh, web uh, a mobile application includes selecting the right site for planting the trees doing something we call species matching to make sure we are planting in the right places um field operation management work planning for the field officers and and trainings even for the for the for the rural farmers and with all that we are able to match um the farmer enrollment activities on a mobile app and that is translated into a forest management web app, which is working for us in the back office monitor, as a monitoring and command center that helps us to use the data uh, with the BI and the data team, supporting the frontline and the field staff and the field extension network 
to, to carry out, um, uh, whether from enumeration, signing up the farmers, to following up how they are planting, to doing the counts, doing uh, the checking how the process is going from start to finish. And we're talking about a process that takes about six months from the time the farmer is enrolled to the time the tree has been planted. So all this has been facilitated by use of the mobile apps and uh, the forest management web app that we are using for our back office support. I would love to show you um, a, a simple picture of what that looks like with a, these trees are called melia. They are great trees for uh, agroforestry model. That you can plant your maize in there. Um, this is one of our farms, and we have some eucalyptus in the background. And this is kind of the end result of a single farm. However, thinking about how we use data to make sure that we are collecting all of that information that is on that one single farm across geographies has really been the game changer for us. This is what has really changed the way we work and the way we scale our systems that we have built over time. Um, in 2017, in, in 2007, when we started out, the green dots you see are where we started out. A few farms that, were, that went onto the ground the, the following year in 2008 in terms of planting. Um, I'm going to keep moving and all the green dots are going to be for the new plantings and the Old dots are going to, in purple are going to represent the old plantings. So in 2009, uh, you can see the expansion starts to happen. We were still within the same geography, not moving further out. 2011 kept uh, growing around the same area. Around 2012, still the same area. Uh, the systems were not scalable enough because we are not really figured out the artificial intelligence part of the solution to the problem we were trying to solve to get to more farmers. But then things started changing around 2016 because 2013, 2014, nothing much changed. But I would like you to pay attention to the transition that happens in 2016. Uh, look at all the purple dots in one old geographic region. And then 2017, that is what happened uh, once we launched the first initial use of artificial intelligence for our data collection, data management. And you can see all the green dots, they are almost overdoing the purple dots. And in 2018, we were able to move into a totally new geographical location, which is a different county within the country on the coast region across uh, Mombasa towards the Tanzania. So you see all the new green dots are a representation of what we were able to accomplish by 2018, simply thanks to use of uh, technology and uh, data management tools. So technically speaking, we are saying that um, so far we've really benefited as a company uh, in terms of uh, using artificial intelligence, but we are not yet there. We have uh, aspirations and our next big steps are in this. So we believe that really the, the way, the, the route we are taking is moving away from traditional commercial forestry models, which are like typical large hotel chains like the Hilton or others, which have a huge establishment. Um, and we are looking at microforestry being a lighter version of the traditional commercial forestry model. And this is, you can compare it to the Airbnb of this world. Um, uh, right now, Airbnb, Airbnb has been able to spread across the world simply because of the lighter uh, model in terms of what they focus on. They don't focus on owning hotels and buildings, but they focus on using technology to get more people to book rooms and to stay in their, um, in their accommodation. That is what Comasa is aspiring to do. And with that in mind, also we look at other companies that have inspired us like Facebook or Uber or Alibaba or um, Airbnb, which I've already talked about. What really happens is that these companies are not creating any content for Facebook. Uh, Uber doesn't own any cars. Alibaba doesn't own any inventory, but they're using technology. So thinking about that and thinking about Comasa, we're saying to ourselves, what is um, the deficit in the market that we can meet? We're talking about $50 billion. Um, we're talking about 80% in savings or six times, 6.5 times, higher return on investment compared with um, commercial forestry plantation model. 
which has always been, you know, the go-to. We are talking about a system that is massively scalable, that we can expand to other countries within Africa and actually become Africa's biggest forestry company without any plantations. So that is our dream. That is what we aspire to be. That is we, where we want to go. We are also um, right now working on a special purpose vehicle that allows us to have zero assets uh, in forestry, zero assets in forestry to make this um, a possibility. Now, many of us in this conference uh, are thinking about the artificial intelligence side of things and wondering uh, how does that fit into the Comasa model and into Comasa's whole business uh, plan. What we have learned with time is that uh, artificial intelligence will really support us in a lot of things, including uh, us having a remote sensing platform that allows us to do growth monitoring on the trees that we plant, that allows us to do automated tree counts uh, and tree inventory, that allows us to do predictive site selection, uh, wood flows and asset valuation, and that can actually be used as an investor platform for the special purpose vehicles and things like carbon monitoring. Now, that is huge. And this is really where we want to be in the next couple of, of years. And um, the journey to get there is quite long. It's going to call for a lot of partnership, a lot of working together with uh, some of the organizations and companies that are already in the space, that have already discovered what we haven't yet. And uh, it's going to take a lot of hard work on our side and hard work on um, our supporters, investors, and partners. But this is where we want to see ourselves in the next couple of years. And we are not only stopping at this establishment, forestry establishment. We'd also like to move into the value addition space. How do we use technology, artificial intelligence, in terms of uh, wood processing? And we all know, especially for countries in Austria, um, in Europe and other places, that um, there's a lot of AI that's being utilized for processing. And that's also what we want to be looking at. And we will be, you know, at the end of, uh, at the, end of the, 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 the cutting edge technology where they're using CT scans for sorting and for log storage and selection and recognition and deciding what so patterns based on what is the shape of the log and so on and so forth. So across the entire value chain, we are looking at utilizing artificial intelligence and technology to make sure that we are getting into that space where we are making the most out of the trees that our farmers plant with us and doing so very sustainably. One of the um, most recent development for us is um, support and funding to expand and scale our operations, especially in terms of uh, processing and value addition. And we are looking at adopting kiln drying systems that you know are purely based on AI, complete AI, uh, where we can have people seated in uh, places like South Africa monitoring kiln dryers in uh, central Kenya, um, some remote village in central Kenya. But we know that this is what is going to be a game changer even from a perspective of market and uh, adding value to the products that are made within the country to get them to, you know, export quality um, uh, products into other markets outside of Kenya. So basically, I'm sure everybody's wondering who's behind Komaza? Uh, how did you guys get there? So I'm going to uh, spend the next, uh, the next few minutes talking about that. We have um, partners that we work with, but we also have investors. Uh, we are really highly regulated in Kenya in forestry. So Kenya Forest Service is one of the very key partners that we work very closely with, as well as the Kenya Forest Research Institute in terms of figuring out, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the planting technology side of things. Um, we also work with Gatsby Africa. Gatsby Africa is um, working in, in, the, in the region to make sure that the sector is competitive and they are one of our very key partners. We support each other, we work together. Um, they've been very instrumental in us getting to where we are, supporting us in terms of uh, benchmarking and learning what the rest of the world is doing to be able to get um, to get to do similar stuff. We've also been in partnership with JICA, who uh, had been supporting a special project with the Kefri 
for a product, a tree species called Melia volkensai. They've done research for over 20 years and we wanted to commercialize and utilize that research uh, that has gone into um, in, uh, that has gone into over the years. And so they are also a very good partner as well as the Nature Conservancy. They are quite active in the region and we also work very closely together. In terms of uh, investors, uh, for the longest for our seed investment in seed capital, we worked with Novastar and FMO. FMO is um, the, the Dutch Development Bank uh, program. Uh, lately, we were able to raise uh, funds from um, AXA and uh, Mirova. So those are the people behind our success to date and our supporters and, uh, you know, supporting us to move on to the next step. I'm going to stop there because I'm sure there's lots of questions and I'm going to allow uh, people to start bringing in uh, the questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Esther, uh, for that. Uh, it was uh, both a very interesting session, um, even for me, who knows Kamaza as a business, uh, getting to learn about these very large milestones that uh, so far you've made. Um, I think it's very, very interesting. And once again, congratulations on the recent uh, closing uh, of your round of funding. And maybe that would be a nice point uh, segue to start with before we venture out into the other questions. Um, and uh, so, of course, you raised quite a hefty amount, uh, no doubt. Um, so maybe what's uh, the, what's the next step for the business? And uh, obviously, this this is a very big kick uh, for you to be able to move forward. Yeah, so for the business, we want to continue to invest in technology. There is no end. Hello, we can hear you. Sorry, there's no end to um, how much you need to invest in technology uh, to, to be able to get to the next level. If you think about remote sensing platforms, for example, um, it's, it's quite an expensive affair. And for us to really be able to scale our model, we have to do this. This is a must do. It's not, uh, do we want to do it or would we like to do it? It's a must do. So a bit of that uh, uh, raise is going to go into supporting that. Um, we are also looking at, you know, just getting out of the, 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 the uh, boundaries of Kenya quickly and fast enough into the region, into East Africa, Tanzania, uh, maybe even Uganda. So that the, the race is also supposed to support that, the expansion uh, strategy going forward, as well as, you know, building the processing facilities. We are, we are soon going to be building the first uh, sawmill in central Kenya in a location that we are yet to identify. We're actually working very hard to do that, but that's in terms of like use of funds, that's some of the things that you're looking at. Ah, that's fantastic to hear. Um, one of the things that I consistently thought about uh, during your presentation is um, how do you then do we identify finding a very good balance mix? Um, obviously, Comasa's efforts have been uh, geared towards ensuring that we have this environmental sustainability component, while at the same time um, ensuring that these projects or whatever activities are going about are commercially viable. So, um, in your in your view, how do you ensure you maintain uh, that right balance between ensuring that um, we're taking care of the environment, the farmer gets their benefits, uh, while at the same time, Komaza is still a profitable business despite having been a for impact business for quite some time? Yeah, great question, Eric, and uh, uh, rightly so. So, as a rule of thumb, we cut three, uh, I mean, we, we plant three for every single tree we cut. So our philosophy is we don't plant two for cutting one, but we plant three for cutting one. And right now, as we speak, we are really, uh, we've been planting a lot more than we've actually been cutting. For instance, we, we haven't started our so many operations, but we already planted 1.3 million seedlings this year um, in just in the coast region. So that obviously tells you we are net positive in terms of planting, we believe in planting more. And like you may be very much aware, uh, Eric, right now the coast region has suffered a lot of pressure on the mangroves, which you know is a very important ecosystem, um, simply because there isn't a lot of alternatives. People use the mangroves sometimes for shuttering, uh, even sometimes they sell it to the hotel industry that is using it for roofing. By us providing an alternative uh, source of raw material, for the people who are playing with the, with the hotel industry or building industry, then that in itself becomes a way to protect and conserve the environment. So the, it is twofold. In terms of 
making sure we're providing sustainable source of food supply in terms of we planted it, we can trace it, we can tell you when it was planted, who planted it, um, what the species was, what's the MAI, and having all that data in terms of traceability and also providing alternative use, you know, alternative uh, raw material for use in the industry because people are going to build anyway. So we might as well provide them with something that's sustainable for them to use to build rather than allow them to go into the natural reserves like the mangrove ecosystem to cut the trees from there. Um, the other thing that uh, likely comes about, and I, I'm very, very curious to also hear before uh, we venture out and hear the other questions, is um, how obviously indigenous tree cover has uh, for the last couple of years gone down. And a lot of that replacement um, obviously comes with trees that are faster, grow faster, a bit faster than anything else. Um, and then and, and how, again, uh, going back to that balance question, how do we ensure that we, we maintain that balance between um, ensuring that our indigenous tree cover continues to grow, but at the same time maintaining this very ambitious target of 10% forest cover across the country with trees that uh, will obviously not um, grow over a 50, 40 year period like the indigenous trees that we consistently have? Yeah, so again, to answer that question, we go back to the same uh, explanation earlier. A perfect example of indigenous trees that are really at risk is the mangrove. And we all know the importance of the mangrove ecosystem. Absolutely. Now, the trees grow in the coast region, um, in Kuala, particularly because of the agroecological climate. Uh, eucalyptus will grow in about five to six years. So that's really fast growth compared to the 40, 50 years that we'll be looking at for indigenous tree growth. So we are insisting that by providing alternative um, uh, solutions to the indigenous trees like mangroves, uh, we can actually solve the problem and solve the crisis of people using indigenous trees uh, to do you know, building activities and, and things like those. So we carry on growing fast growing trees like eucalyptus that have really huge uh, growth, growth rates. Um, and in that way, automatically protects the indigenous trees. Got it. Um, and before maybe we can look at some of the comments that we've received so far, um, my last question is, um, obviously, Komaza is a heavily technology driven company like we uh, you just showed us. Uh, I'm curious, what's your favorite part about working with technology uh, that's said and done uh, in, in, in your day to day job? Is it the data part? Is it the AI part? Uh, or is it figuring out uh, how to think around with all the machines that are involved in all the processes? It's really, I don't, I don't get the luxury to get involved uh, day to day, but for the teams, feedback I get is the ability to have 300 field staff with mobile phones, getting everything uh, sorted on their mobile phones. We can see data to talk about, that's talking about whether the farmer did their weeding or not. It's just mind blowing. I mean, the ability to pick uh, photos on the farm and send them to the back office and help us as management make decisions around what next needs uh, that needs to happen, that in itself is really, really exciting. I, I don't know what you would have done uh, without yeah. technology, yeah. the use of data uh, for Comaza. It possibly could not have been possible. So it's very awesome. exciting for yeah. mobile technology. Yeah, I think I think it's actually very very exciting, and to see all these things come alive, um, and obviously newer ways of uh, of doing things, um, it's it's quite an exciting thing. So maybe let me just try and sift through and see if we have any questions or comments. Um, ah, great. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, Matthias, for that. So um, the very first questions is how can you ensure our approach is competitive against large uh, plantations and their economies of scale and automation. Uh, and I think you tackled that in terms of uh, your very, very ambitious plants being amongst the largest commercial uh, tree planters in the country. But um, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, so in terms of looking at what really um, huge uh, traditional plantation forestry is all about, it's all about acquiring land. Um, land is an expensive resource as an asset. So the minute we are able to not have to acquire land because we don't own the land we're really not interested in the land we're interested in the trees growing that lowers our capex and basically even opex as well so uh, the fact that we don't own land first of all cuts down 
it really becomes very, very low capex uh, type of business, which means all the money that should have gone into buying or purchasing land can then be used to massively scale and massively get a lot more farmers to get involved. Also, the fact that um, it's kind of a decentralized model, it lowers a lot of the risks um, associated with the assets in itself. Think about security, for example, when the farmer is the one taking care of his trees in his Pastor, own compound. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. I can go on. Yeah. Sorry. So, so I was talking about uh, the risk element of, uh, you know, security, fire, uh, when plantations have to invest a lot of resources to manage risks associated with fires, for example, it is a bit, uh, a lot less of an expense and a, a lot less of a risk in terms of um, uh, the, the, the risk assessment being low because the farmer will take care of one acre or two acres of land. So that allows us to be able to massively scale because then you've, you've, you've cut across the risk across a lot of people. So lower capex in terms of we don't have to own the land, we don't have to own all the plantation equipment uh, that goes into plantation forestry, really, really helps us to massively be able to put those resources into scaling the model, into having a lot more farmers. And right now, as you're speaking, we're talking about 25,000 farmers looking into hundreds of thousands in the next coming years. That's exciting to hear. Um, and I think Peter has a question. How did you start off in the beginning and was it hard to convince uh, your first partnering farmers to join in? It wasn't hard to convince because um, usually you get the first few people to do it and when they can see the sense in it, it's kind of more of behavior, uh, but it's behavior that you can sell. You can, you can really uh, get people to see the sense in it. And part of when we do recruitment, part of the, um, the, the, the marketing the speech we send out there is a, fun, a, a, a typical illustration of when you get a child, when they're zero years, um, by 14, they have to go to high school. In the Kenyan context, for many years, high school was not free education, and many families would not be able to afford to send their children to high school. And the argument was, if you plant a tree the day or a year after the child is born, without a question, you will have resources to send your child to school. So because the communities we are working with could see the sense of that, they bought into the idea, and we have seen how the ideas really sold over the years because then they move away from not only sending a child to school, but also thinking about medical expenses or improving their, their, their structures, their homes, their houses, and where they're living, basically. So when we put it as an investment for the farmer, then it's easy to sell and it does get yeah. good. Okay, great. Um, so it looks like our time is running out. Uh, we have about two more minutes. Uh, I think there's a question on what is a shamba. A shamba pretty much means a farm. Um, and then uh, the two, maybe we can double them up. How do you calculate the market rate of the trees to make sure uh, the farmers get a profit? And what remote sensing technologies have you used to uh, quantify farm forestry resources given uh, that they are small scale farmers? So maybe we can bundle those two into one and uh, the other questions we can obviously uh, pin them to point to you and then uh, we can respond to them on email uh, possibly later on. Sure. So in terms of uh, figuring out the market prices, we actually uh, work with what's really in the market. And there's a lot of uh, buying that happens in the market. For example, there's buying of electricity poles by huge companies like the Kenya Power and Electricity Company um, that pays farmers. So they have already kind of set the standard for what the market price is going to be. Or have other players like KTDA or you know telecommunication companies that are buying poles. So really, the, it's not a difficult uh, question in terms of figuring out what the market prices are, because there's already a buying, uh, a selling and buying that's going on in the market. So we work with that, we check, we, we benchmark against what the other players and competitors are doing. And based on that, we are able to give a price uh, for the farmers, for the prices, for the value of their trees. In terms of the remote sensing uh, technology, um, I would say we are still in the very initial stages of figuring out what works best for us. So we've, we've been working with a lot of uh, different uh, 
technologies and other observation is basically the most bare minimum that we've used. Um, we, we've also been trying to work very closely with Kenya Forestry Service because there is some um, work that's been going on to do a bit of forest monitoring projects for the country, for the national forests, and we want to see if we can be beneficiaries as a private sector player to that arrangement. It's the Forest 2020. Most of the people on the platform might be aware of this Forest 2020 project, and um, it's it's being run by Ecometrica and uh, the UK Space Agency in collaboration. Great. Really exciting. Sorry to disturb from Vienna. Um, yeah. Esther, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we have a lot of unanswered questions, but I suggest uh, everybody who would be interested in getting to know what's the answer to those questions to get in touch with you directly. Um, we will have the permission of you to share your slides with our participants and we'll get in touch after the conference. Also, a big thanks to my colleague Eric in our Nairobi office, uh, Advantage Austria Nairobi. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much you. for sharing the next system. Yeah. The best wishes from Vienna. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. And we are jumping again uh, to a completely different region geographically and let's just see a short intro video for our next speaker all right let's see if we have a connection hello to singapore hello and welcome darren thomas CEO of Double Helix Tracking Solutions. Can you hear us, Aaron? Hi there. Yes, I can. Loud and clear. How are you? Very well. We have almost uh, yeah three quarters of our conference behind us today. It's in the afternoon in Vienna. And thank you for joining us, even though it's very late in Singapore. I see you are one Got of those people who's in the, in the home office. That's Maybe. right. <laughs> <laughs> just a guess, just a guess. And uh, we uh, will hear from you about trust in the, in the wood and in the timber supply chain and how your, your technology contributes to these, uh, these questions that are very important to know. Indeed. Wonderful. Thank you. Then I would um, say I give the stage to you. Um, we have your presentation on and everybody you can ask Darren questions as we move along. After his presentation, we will do a Q&A round. Wonderful. And this should only take about 15 minutes or so. 15, 15 minutes is perfect, 15, 20 minutes. And then we have some little time for, for a Q&A session. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Wonderful. Talk to you a little bit later. So uh, thank you very much to the organizers for arranging this uh, very sophisticated uh, online forum today. So I think it's probably the most sophisticated I've been involved in so far. Um, and also thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak to everybody. My name is Darren Thomas. I'm the CEO of, of Double Helix. Um, and uh, in this talk, I'll be focusing on using technology to secure supply chains, uh, but also to enhance marketing and communications uh, for the timber industry as a whole. Now, uh, we're fortunate in that the timber industry has an extremely positive environmental message to make compared to other man-made materials like concrete, uh, steel, and, and plastic. And because of timber's versatility and potential uh, to, to store carbon, uh, wood utilization is already at at record levels, I'm sure you all know. Um, I'll give you some stats though. Uh, in 2018, the, the global production and trade of all major wood-based products was up 11% from the previous year and at its highest level since records began in 1947. 
Global roundward removals grew 5% to a record level of 2.08 billion cubic meters. Now, of course, COVID has temporarily reduced these numbers. It's given us all a chance to take a breath, if you will. Um, but the trend towards ever increasing wood utilization is set to continue. Um, and this record consumption is being driven by demand for things like wood chips, wood chips for environmentally friendly biofuels, uh, more wood chips for processing into environmentally friendly textiles like uh, rayon, um, wood fibers to produce environmentally friendly bioplastic bags and other packaging, um, and more wood to construct environmentally friendly buildings, of course. Um, a lot of wood and a lot of environmentally friendly messaging. But concerns remain. Uh, are there enough forests in the world? How can it all be sustainable? Uh, what sort of damage is all of this uh, wood utilization causing? We, we see the pictures every day. And it's hard to square the environmental claims when there are still so many stories about deforestation illegal logging and corruption. Yes, even in Europe. Um, so at Double Helix, our approach to tackling these issues is simply to establish the means to know where all of these wood products are coming from. But at the same time, we'd like people to care about where their wood is coming from, just as much, say, as they care about their food and where that comes from. Um, consumer demands are changing in line with the younger, gen younger generation's values. Um, and don't forget that those same consumers with different values are entering the workforce and they're coming in as procurement managers, traders, or even enforcement agents. So we will all want to know with confidence where wood products come from and that the source is at least legal, but preferably well-managed, sustainable, and equitable. Now, the most reliable way to do that is through traceability of products where, to where they come from. The ability to trace a product back to a defined area, be it a region, a forest, or in extreme cases, a stump. Now, traceability creates the conditions for supply chain transparency, which in turn builds trust and confidence in the environmental, social, or ethical claims associated with the product, not just timber, but all sorts of things like diamonds and, and gold and mining and other commodities. Now, being open builds trust. And even if things aren't perfect, it clearly shows where improvements can be made. And that in itself builds a relationship of trust. Now, traceability also provides data and evidence to tell the story of a product. And from our industry perspective, that is what gives us, excuse me, um, from an industry perspective, that is what gives us the power to differentiate our products from the competition. By our products, I mean timber products. So the remainder of this talk is going to be taken up by three case studies, three examples of how science and technology are being applied in a practical way for a range of wood products and markets. Um, I'm gonna give you the short version of the stories. Uh, so please note down any questions if you want to ask more details about any of this at the end. Now, the first one is related to European oak flooring. Um, and it concerns a company called Brooks Brothers in the United Kingdom, not the clothing company, uh, there is a flooring company of the same name. They're a major UK importer and wholesaler of building products. Now, as such, they must comply with the EU timber regulation, uh, which incidentally will become the UK timber regulation. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, the regulation requires that the operator, uh, usually uh, the importer into the European Union, must demonstrate due diligence to ensure that no illegal timber um, is in the product supply chain. Now, Brooks import a variety of oak flooring products from China, solid oak flooring, um, multi-layer oak flooring, three-layer oak flooring, with oak always as a component. Now, the oak is supposed to be 
claims to be rather PEFC certified from Western Europe. Countries generally at negligible risk of illegal lugging. But uh, because the manufacturer of the product is in northern China, there is risk of mixing or substitution with undocumented Russian oak, which is at high risk. There's been several uh, investigations around illegal Russian oak. So how do you demonstrate definitively whether or not mixing with illegal oak uh, is taking place? Well, the data is there. The challenge is, is gaining the trust of suppliers to share their log purchase and production records um, and the opportunity to map out their own supply chains and their sources. But this is the basis of what Double Helix does. Um, at heart, we are auditors. Um, we are the guys that uh, go into the supply chain, um, talk with sawmills and manufacturers, uh, and really get to the bottom of, of what data there is um, and what that data is telling us. Now, in this case, we found that the Chinese factory imported oak logs directly from traders in Europe, and this was supported by ample purchase and, and shipping documentation. Uh, there was no evidence that we could find of oak purchases from any other oak producing countries like the United States uh, or Russia, or from the Chinese timber markets, uh, in which case there would be no documentation. On the other hand, we found that the factory switches suppliers quite regularly in order to secure the best quality logs at the best price. Uh, and why wouldn't they? They probably their buyers that are asking for that. Now, normally continued sourcing according to specification would be based on trust between the buyer and supplier to do the right thing. But these days, it's getting harder to spend the time to build that relationship and trust before placing an order. How does Brooks Brothers ensure that the factory continues to source and process only certified oak? And European oak at that. Well, firstly, there's the scientific solution. Um, isotope data already exists. And this isotope data, which is chemicals that the tree absorbs from the air, the water, and the soil as it grows, um, can discriminate between oak from North America, Europe, Eurasia, and the Russian Far East. The chemical combinations that the trees of the same species absorb in these different parts of the world are different to an extent than an isotope analysis can actually determine uh, where the tree came from in the first place. Now, that's really all the resolution that we need to verify a claim of European oak. We just need to know that it comes, or the isotope signature is European, as opposed to North American or Russian. And so we implemented a system to take random samples of timber from a combination of logs and final products, both in China and in the UK, for isotope testing. So think of it as a quality control procedure, except we're testing the claim of European origin rather than product performance. Um, in fact, the level of testing is very low. Only 10 samples of wood are tested per year. We take many more samples, but we only test, send test, <laughs> excuse me, we only send 10 for testing. There's a tongue twister. Um, but the fact that we're taking lots of samples sends a clear but friendly message to the factory that they can't mess around with this particular product or customer. So much of this is about communicating the steps that we put into practice to act as a deterrence to undesirable activity. Um, communication can also turn a compliance solution like this into a marketing tool, using transparency about the due diligence process to build trust and confidence with buyers. And as you can see on your screen now, all of this information is accessible through a QR code that is put onto the product packaging of all Brooks Brothers flooring. So that's where the technology solution uh, comes in. Um, sorry, rather, the scientific solution. Um, let me talk about where the technology comes into it as well. 
Now, at Double Helix, we use a system called Source Map to present traceability and supply chain data in a way that is useful uh, and valuable. This screenshot, for example, shows the number of consignments of oak shipped from each trader uh, over a certain period of time. Each arrow denotes a consignment. And the system can analyze all of this information to produce useful insights very quickly. So you can see the arrow there on the screen and, and associated data that we have chosen to put into the system uh, associated with that particular consignment. Now, once data like this is in the system, you can create very useful insights very quickly. Now, you can, uh, for instance, where are you sourcing? Uh, where is your supplier sourcing most of their timber from, for example, as a, as a very easy example. Now, you can also overlay risk layers. Um, I must say, not particularly useful from a European perspective. This one is deforestation data from Global Forest Watch. Um, and these are the locations of the trading houses, not the actual uh, harvest locations. However, the point being that if you were to uh, have new supply that comes online and you've identified the origin, uh, and that particular area is an area of high deforestation, according to the latest data from Global Forest Watch, you automatically get a, an alert. Same thing for fire risk, for example. So this sort of capability serves two purposes. One, better control of supply chains and access to information for optimization uh, and decision making amongst uh, uh, leadership, uh, but also Number two, the ability to communicate very clearly to your customers, consumers, investors, and the market in general that your products are exactly what they claim to be because they can see for themselves. Uh, these products can be trusted. And increasingly, that's, it's that sort of level of information that generates trust and customer loyalty. Now, the next case study I'd like to take you through um, relates to very high value timber species with a very niche application, uh, yachts. Now, the problem is that uh, teak from Myanmar, uh, natural teak, which is used the most in yacht stacking, is very controversial, uh, especially in Europe. So much so that alternative composite decking products such as this one from Sweden have started to make inroads into the yacht decking market. Now, the official position from the European competent authorities is that no teak from Myanmar can meet the EU timber regulation. Uh, and that's because of generally poor corruption, high cor uh, poor governance, high corruption, um, and historical mismanagement of Myanmar's forest resources by the ex-military government. Uh, this is a valid criticism, um, but I must say it is a little out of date. Now, we've been working in Myanmar for quite, um, quite some time uh, in partnership with the Myanmar Forest Certification Committee and also PEFC, um, which is looking to endorse the certification system set up in Myanmar eventually, uh, not yet. But the project is to launch a timber certification system that demonstrates traceability, legality, and, and control of the supply chain. Uh, but the problem with alleged systemic corruption um, is that the EU will not accept any government chain of custody documentation. They won't accept the authenticity of any government documentation um, because of corruption. It's a bit of a catch-22. So in order to build trust and confidence in Myanmar's new certification system, our approach has been, again, twofold. First, we've rolled out a system of DNA fingerprinting um, to scientifically prove that logs have been harvested from specific stumps that are claimed in the harvest plants. 
Now we've been taking wood samples from logs in the sawmill yard once they've been delivered to the sawmill rather. Uh, and then we've been using the government chain of custody documentation to trace back those logs to specific stumps in the forest. So the Myanmar system is actually uh, very precise in that way, um, but it is all paper-based, so um, <laughs> it's a real effort. Um, now, during forest audits, uh, we locate those stumps and we can take DNA samples from them as well, a piece of wood effectively, as you can see in this picture. Now, those sets of samples, paired samples now, you've got a sample from the stump and you've got a sample from the log that's been taken at the sawmill. Those sets of samples head off to the lab, either in Australia or Germany or wherever testing can be done. Now, if the DNA test confirms that an individual genetic match between the log and the stump sample comes from the same tree, right? The two samples that have been submitted actually come from the same tree, and that is confirmed genetically. Um, that implies that the entire set of records along the supply chain that we have used to trace back to the stump must be authentic and correct. The whole system through a single DNA test for that, for that particular log has effectively validated. And the chain of custody has been scientifically, independently proven to be trustworthy. And there's that word again, trust. Now, we're not gonna test every log or even every consignment using this particular system. Uh, DNA testing isn't that cheap. Um, but we will do enough testing to build back confidence in the Myanmar forestry system that they are now following their own rules after years of mismanagement and that the product is now what it says it is, legally harvested. Uh, and again, we take all of that data and we can present all of that evidence to the authorities, if necessary, in source map, as you can see here. What you can see is a, a supply chain map together with uh, on the left hand side at the top up to date photos from the field assessment uh, and satellite imagery showing the health of the forest, global forest watch data again um, and access on the bottom left hand side through links to all of the harvest records and harvest related information. Granted, this is an extreme example. Uh, it is very rarely that we would be asked to go back and verify specific stumps. Um, obviously, we don't have those sorts of reputational problems with other species or European timbers. But as a demand for European timber grows, raw material sourcing is going to expand to other regions like Romania, Ukraine, and Russia, it's already happening, which brings its own risks, um, as IKEA has learned in uh, that previous slide. So for my final example, let's come back to European mass engineered timber. Now, we are currently working on a major new uh, hotel resort. Um, that is utilizing or being built out of mass engineered timber across the whole development. I'm not going to show you the actual imagery uh, or the source map from that development because it's still under wraps. Um, but this is an example of a much smaller project. Um, the point is showing you that um, through a public version of this source map system, um, you could have people or visitors to the resort, for example, who would be able to access, uh, learn about, and, and really appreciate the wood that they see all around them. Imagine walking into your uh, hotel room surrounded by wood, um, and together with the menu for room service, you have a QR code where you can learn all about how this building was put up uh, and where all of that timber comes from, and all the environmental benefits that go along with it. All right, the content and information that could be included extremely flexible satellite imagery of course carbon calculators uh, videos of construction or harvesting you know in this situation the, the traceability data and evidence is being used 
to communicate and support the environmental credentials of a well-known hotel brand, right? Um, and there's a big difference between us and the industry using this and then our customers using this. You know, they are using this not to mitigate risk of regulatory non-compliance, but to enhance the value of their brand by telling the story of wood, encouraging a, a greater appreciation of wood products and building loyalty with their customers. And if as an industry, we can provide our clients with that and provide more value to that, then again, we've established loyalty uh, to your company, but also to mass engineered timber, right? Uh, amongst your customers and the public. So this hotel brand would not be able to do this without the cooperation of the manufacturer, uh, providing verifiable information about their supply chain, of course, and raw material sourcing. But in doing so, they are providing a defense against the inevitable attacks from concrete and steel lobby, um, but more importantly, building long-term trust in the environmental benefits of timber amongst the public. So to wrap up, I think these three case studies have some common themes. Firstly, in all cases, I think a technology approach is integrated within an existing framework. DNA isotope testing, even something like source map, doesn't operate alone. That framework could be a regulatory framework, such as in the Brooks Brothers EU timber regulation sense, or a voluntary framework like the Myanmar certification system. Uh, secondly, it's got to be practical, by which one can imply simple and affordable. Now, DNA or isotope testing is still relatively expensive on a per test basis, but applied on a sampling basis, such as I've described today, and like in a quality control program, or as a deterrence even, it becomes a very efficient method to making that whole control system effective. You only need to do enough testing to build confidence that the overall system is under control. And finally, it's, it's all about building trust and confidence in a system and a claim that works. So implementing something is important, but communicating how that system operates in a clear and transparent manner is what really makes the difference. So thank you uh, for listening. Uh, and if you do want to discuss this further after the event, um, too shy to ask questions now, then do drop me an email on screen or you, you can find me and the company on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Darren, for your presentation. We have, during the course of your uh, speech, received a couple of questions, which we want to pull up now. And let's see, everybody, you still have the opportunity to upvote questions from others that you want to have answered. Or if you cannot find the question that you would like to, uh, that you are wondering about, ask your own uh, uh, question using the tool on the right side of your screen. And we go on to the first question. Yeah, we have 13 minutes and 13 questions, just say. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. How expensive is the isotope testing per sample? Uh, between 400 and 600 US dollars, that's an easy one, uh, depending on how many isotopes need to be tested for accuracy. Um, there you go, less than a minute. Perfect. I think the second question, if you can see it, it's probably faster than I read it for you. It also goes in yes. the direction. Um, we, have, we, we have helped to build databases. Um, so you're right. Um, Wherever you have testing, there needs to be reference data to test against. Um, but this reference data has, is being built by various organizations around the world. Um, some uh, at the University of Adelaide, for example, with the, with the Teak example I gave you. Uh, some at the Tunan Institute in Germany. Some uh, with uh, laboratories and universities in America. Um, so part of our job is to understand uh, and where all of this reference data lies so that we can approach and work with 
the right institution for the right job. And increasingly, there are efforts to combine all of this reference data into a single platform that can be shared amongst different laboratories with the right capabilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think the next one is, is the, the easy one, probably the easiest one. Could you shortly summarize your business model? So how does Double Helix uh, earn money? Yep, we uh, our clients tend to be on the one hand importers into the USA and, and Europe for compliance. Um, and so we'll offer risk assessment uh, services to understand risk in the supply chain for a fixed fee uh, based on the day rate. Um, if there is risk and we implement ongoing systems to mitigate that risk through ongoing verification of documentation uh, or um, frequency of DNA or isotope testing, then we normally build that into a, uh, a monthly fee based on the value of the product, which it works out of between a half a percentage point to a percentage point of product value depending on volume and the value of the product, of course, so that it becomes a marginal cost of the product rather than a big annual fixed fee, uh, like an auditing program. Mm -hmm. uh, increasingly, our clients are uh, moving towards the big, the big corporate brand owners, such as those hotel brands um, or large industrial companies with consumer facing brands as well. And it's moving away from a compliance um, a compliance solution towards this uh, building of reputational uh, or mitigation of reputational risk so they don't get into trouble um, and the wrong end of the of the PR spectrum um, but also then to to promote themselves uh, being transparent and doing the right thing um, and trying to establish traceability in their supply chains great then next one, how do you classify the role of the labels in the pro problem of illegal paper? You just mentioned FSC and PEFC. Yeah, um, well, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I feel that PEFC and FSC, their strengths is in forest certification. And the more certified forest we have around the world, the better. You know, they have challenges with regards to certification of smallholder plantations and, and those small and those communities. But I think the more certified uh, forest we can get, the better. The problem, I think, comes with the chain of custody systems um, that they have that are not strong enough and that do allow uh, for problems to happen, you know, such as the ones that we, we've talked about. Um, so I think in, in my ideal world, the, the certification systems would be focusing on building area of um, certified forest in the world. Um, and companies like us would be making sure that wood products come from those areas. Good. Then we received one very interesting question via YouTube, via comment. I, it's, it's more process related. It states, how about the false declarations of wood volume entering the market, e.g. overloading the wood trucks? You're only addressing the source problem. Well, yes. I mean, illegal or timber of unknown origin can enter the supply chain at any point. Um, but by establishing traceability, it's, it's not a direct link from factory back to um, the point of harvest, right? It's traceability through every point in the supply chain, including transport back to the point of harvest. So um, with reliable data, it's a, you're able to see and detect those sorts of red flags where volumes don't start to match up between different points in the supply chain. Um, Sure, there's, there's always going to be ways to, to cheat that. The better that you know how the system works, there's always going to be ways to find a way around it. Um, but it increasingly gets more and more complicated uh, the more sophisticated things become. Yeah. Good. Next question. What's the geographical resolution that you can reach? Um, it depends on the reference data. Um, and if I may turn that around a little bit, um, 
it really also depends on the market and species issues, right? Um, in in theory, as I as I said with the, the the Myanmar example, you can match stump, you can match timber back to a specific stump, but in most cases that is overkill <laughs> and really not necessary. And the oak example, you know, the, the main issue here is in relation to the uh, mixing of, of unknown to oak into a supply chain that's supposed to be European oak, in which case that level of resolution is sufficient. Um, sometimes, or you know, increasingly, we're getting questions about, is it Western European or Eastern European oak? In which case, yes, you can still get down to that resolution. That's a, a belabored way of saying, um, with DNA, you could get down to very, very fine resolutions. With isotopes, you can, prob you, you can probably get down to a, a regional area. Um, again, it just depends on how the chemical combinations vary. Um, and with other techniques like wood anatomy or mass spectrometry, you're just really looking at the different species and therefore where are those different species found? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we look at the clock. Let's take two more questions. Uh, the, the, the one highlighted is an interesting one. If there is if there's any legal requirement in place for a solution like yours, or if this type of regulation is coming? Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, in a way, our, our system is designed to always stay one step ahead of what the regulations require. Um, I wish there was more stuff like the European Timber, Timber Regulation or the Lacey Act um, that would get uh, companies thinking a little bit more. Um, the Chinese have just introduced uh, an illegal logging prohibition regulation. Um, but again, it comes back to, you know, how w will it be enforced? It took a number of years before the first Lacey Act enforcement came in. Um, and the way the European timber regulation is enforced is, is pretty low key as well. Um, so uh, really, it's the enforcement, the level of enforcement that changes behavior in the industry. Good. And this brings me to the final question. Uh, that's again related to the, to the logging and harvesting process, which is quite different by region or even by forest or tree type. Mm. Uh, what are the minimum prerequisites for setting up a solution like yours? And additionally, what are the typical showstoppers? Yeah. Um, Logging practices vary by region. That's been a big issue. Documents are different for every different country. You've even got different scripts. So getting data into a system such as source map, that, that's the big challenge, um, which is why on, on our side, we're looking at AI as a means for um, machine learning, for reading such documentation and uh, character recognition as well, the latest um, the latest versions of, of character recognition technology. Um, but yeah, uh, normally there is some sort of documentation, right, between entities in a supply chain. There are purchase contracts, there are packing lists, um, and that goes all the way back to forest or at least farmer uh, or trader in, in community areas. So the data is there. Right. Uh, the issue is how do we get hold of that data? Can we build trust and confidence in the supply chain that will allow us to access that data um, on a regular basis um, that would make this useful? So that, that really is the prerequisite for setting up a, a tracking solution. It's that cooperation with the upstream supply chain um, to allow this to happen. Um, and that tends to be the so showstopper as well, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I find that once we've had an opportunity to explain what we're trying to do and why, then doors are opened and everyone is very happy to help and cooperate. But often we don't get the chance to make that explanation and meeting, and that's where things shut down. Cool, excellent. So. 
Yeah, there are still a couple of more questions, but we are running out of time. Not, not sure if you're still available afterwards because it's already quite late, I guess, in Singapore. But whoever is interested in what Double Helix is doing, um, please check out Darren Thomas's profile that he created, where he put a lot of uh, further information that you can download and check out. And probably you're also still available if there's somebody contacting you regarding a one-on-one -on -one meeting during tomorrow, Thursday. Uh, yes, I will be. Wonderful. Then best wishes to Singapore. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time. It was a pleasure having you. And thank you, gentlemen. It was a pleasure doing this. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. We'll have a, a one one minute break, and we'll just shortly introduce our next speaker. If you bear with us for a second. And. Hello, and we are back, and we see if we have a connection to Anja Höft from Kiel. Johannes. Hi. Hi. Hi, Anja. Yeah, uh, very happy to have you with us today, Anja. Um, Anja is representing a German traditional powerhouse uh, from the forestry sector, Stiel. Um, so, so we're very interested in hearing what uh, our European friends uh, doing right across the border, especially uh, in, in current times. Um, what, what we think is super significant and super relevant to this conference as well is how a traditional player like Stiel is transforming his efforts um, when it comes to driving the digital transformation, especially uh, in the forestry sector and especially when it comes to applying new technologies like artificial intelligence. But I don't want to take anything away from uh, your presentation, Anja. Thank you so much for being with us today and uh, telling us a little bit more about the efforts of Chile. Sure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Also, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope everyone can uh, hear me uh, fine. And, um, and we see your slides. Uh, you see my slides. That's perfect. And I'll just... Perfect. There we go. Yes. Thank you, yours. We see each other for the Q&A, and you can ask questions to Anja Stiel as we go along. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, again, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be representing Steel today for the topic of uh, digital forestry, the overview and trends um, of what we what we do within the sector. Um, let me maybe briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Anja Höft. I've been with Steel for two years now in the digitalization department, um, responsible for digital strategy and innovation and also doing a lot of strategic groundwork um, in the digital forestry, um, especially this year. So this is one of our focus topics this year. Um, let me maybe start with where we come from. So basically, Steel is a family-owned business. Um, it has been founded uh, in 1926, and we're basically a provider of outdoor power tools. We're especially, especially uh, recognized and known for our chainsaws, and we have a very, very strong vision, which keeps us um, also busy in the future, because it's basically making it easier for people to work in and with nature. And if you just look at the sentence, this means that no matter um, how far along we go and what we do. So we're always trying to um, have the customer in mind and to make it easier for him to work. And this used to be um, a lot of, let's say, uh, hardware prone. And of course, we we try to develop hardware um, to make it easier to work uh, in and within with nature. And in the last years, um, there's, of course, a transformation um, into also digital services that we're providing to our customers. 
Um, maybe it's also very, very interesting to uh, see where we're, um, what else we do. So, of course, forestry is one of our main, um, let's say, ecosystems or areas where we provide tools and also digital services, which I will in turn also um, present today. Uh, but we also have uh, products in the construction area um, for private gardens. For example, we have a robotic lawnmower um, that we sell. Uh, we also have uh, some products in the agricultural sector, and we're also very known and very big in the landscaping business, um, providing uh, hedge cutters and, and basically anything that a landscaper would need. I'd also like to give you just a very brief introduction of, um, of some facts and figures about steel. So we're... Um, we're 3.9 uh, billion uh, revenue we did last year. Um, and what's very interesting and maybe a little bit different than a lot of other companies do it, we have a very interesting sales channel. So we do have servicing dealers that have contracts with us. So they're basically partners with us. And we have 53,000 servicing dealers worldwide that sell our products because um, service is one of the things that's very, very important to us. Um, Steel has 17,000 employees. Um, we have 41 distribution companies and we sell in 60, 160 countries. Um, and what's also very special uh, for us is the vertical integra integration in our production um, uh, system. So we have 50% of vertical um, integration, meaning we're pretty much um, very independent regarding how we manufacture. And then Maybe let me lead over to why digitalization is very important to us. So our CEO, um, Dr. Kansiora, he basically um, sums this up in, in this quote saying that um, we want to define the market with innovations and we have a very strong passion for technology and top quality. Um, and this is also combined with um, the customer requirements that's very important to us. Um, and so for the future, of course, what we want to offer is um, next to new using new technologies and uh, applying new technologies also to have intelligent, connected solutions for our customers. And then forest is really our DNA and our history, and this is why it's so important to us. So um, we are... Um, so in 1926, Andrea Steele, the founder of the company, he... Um, he, he saw that uh, trees were um, actually like locked using axes or pull saws. And his idea was really to have like a, a saw that is coming to the tree and not how it was back then that uh, a tree had to, had to get to the saw. Um, and so this is how the first, um, how the first chainsaw, uh, electronic high performance transportable chainsaw was invented uh, back in 1926. Uh, so now, um, uh, flash to the future, our forests are very much in danger, and this is worldwide, and this is something that is very, well, this is something that, of course, um, is our passion to be able to, to also support um, the forest management worldwide. Um, because the consequences of climate change, and this is something that you all know, they're visible because we have a lot of droughts, we have wildfires, there's a lot of storm damages. Um, especially in Germany, um, the German forest, it's just really, um, we have a lot of problems with, pest, um, with pests, especially with the bark beetle, uh, because we have a lot of pine trees and uh, pine trees really don't like um, very dry areas. And when, when it's too dry, the bark beetle really has um, a lot um, of space to, to invade and infest uh, the wood. And then, of course, we also have like trends for more sustainability because reforestation is really something that's been adding to also uh, been getting a lot of media attention. There's sort of funding programs, programs in Germany, for example, we have a program uh, with like 700 million euros to uh, to support the forest management and the reforestation. And then, of course, um, the proper forest management and an efficient and effective proper um, forest management becomes more and more important. So what we did um, is um, we tried to understand a little. I mean, let's let me let me uh, rephrase that. So we're coming from a chainsaw. We're coming from wood logging, from wood harvesting. This is where we're home. Now we want to um, support our customers along 
let's say, basically the whole work in and with nature, meaning we had to understand what the user actually does during um, this whole process. So what we did is we tried to have a sort of life cycle of the tree to understand the topics that are important to the forest rangers and to like just basically anyone that's working within the forest. Um, so what you see here is uh, in, in, in orange is the life cycle of the tree. So first you have a lot of planning, um, then you reforest, then you have the young stock maintenance, which is very important. Like how do, how does, how do the trees grow? You have a lot of maintenance later on once the stock has grown. Then of course you have the wood logging, the transportation uh, through the skid trails, shipping it, um, and then uh, basically selling it. And then um, this is basically just, I mean, of course, a very easy way to just show what the life cycle of the tree, what, what actually happens during this journey. But it was very important for us to pinpoint some of the topics um, and to basically see where we have possibilities for, for digital services and for digital forestry to support um, our, our customers. And then besides that, we do have uh, some some adjacent topics like inventorization that's very important, and then uh, pests or storm damages, like all the calamities, um, like fires that can happen in the forest. Um, then we also have um, like the the forest, especially in Germany, is also a source source for retreat. So you wanna be able to have um, to have visitors, of course, in the forest. Um, uh, and then that there's that there's no danger, for example, for them or also for the people working in the forest. Um, and then hunting is also one of those topics. That's just something that's that also uh, belongs to to proper forest management. So now, what are we offering? So uh, Steel has, um, as of now, three different products. Um, in in like three different digital products uh, for our customers, um, and they're all let's say, um, around the, the wood logging, the wood harvesting. And what I would like to do is like introduce them and like talk, uh, talk to you about what these services do and, and why they're um, interesting and or why they are helping our, our customers. And then also discuss a little bit um, about um, artificial intelligence and, and why this is a technology that's um, becoming more and more important and that will help us a lot to, to gain traction with, with these services. So usually what you see in the forest is this, um, at least in Germany, <laughs> there's a lot of trees that have like sprayed numbers on top or, or also uh, crosses um, to, to basically uh, mark trees um, as especially important or to mark them as infested or uh, ready for, for, for wood harvest. So what the forest ranger us usually does, he walks through the forest, he, spray cans, uh, the, he sprays um, with his can on the trees, and then he has to manually give this information um, to the ones that are basically harvesting or logging the trees um, and like, kind of like putting it uh, manually into a map. And for, for this, we have a solution called Logbuch, the localization of trees. Um, so what happens is with, with Logbuch, with this app, and we also have a desktop version for it, you can localize trees. You get sort of like a digital um, forest map. Um, and you can invent inventorize your um, your stock basically uh, via app and most importantly via speech recognition. Because um, as I was saying, customer requirements are super important to us. And one of the things that we um, that we learned is if the forest ranger is walking through the forest, he won't be able to uh, to type stuff into his smartphone, or it just won't be convenient. So uh, the first order for us was to really develop a speech recognition possibility, um, so that the forest ranger is not not interrupted in his mode of operation. Um, we also um, have a spray can adapter, which you can put on the spray cans. And then he can use this app even phone free because it's a little Bluetooth uh, app or a Bluetooth dongle. And then he can activate the speech recognition with the spray can and is even less interrupted in his mode of operation. Um, we did some we did some studies on how it benefits our customers. And what's really interesting is so there's 25 percent time saving for tree search. There's 21 percent less walking for the forestry workers that are looking for the trees that need to be logged. There's 13 percent less trees. 
uh, less mysteries and there's a reduction of accidents um, because everyone knows um, where to go and uh, this is um, uh, this is really 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 interesting to our customers and this is also the argumentation with with which we uh, we sell it so then um, um, what you basically do is um, if the forest ranger walks uh, through through the wood he says hey logbook start a new um, order and then he can just really say new tree pine chest height diameter 45 and then there's a gps track set right at the spot where he stands and then uh, with this he gets like a digital forest map pretty easily The next I would like to introduce, the next digital product is the Stiel Holzliste. We're a German company and a lot of the products we're uh, in, in the digital sector that we're currently selling are still um, in German or sold in only in Germany. So this is why we don't have like English expressions some of the time, some of the times for our uh, product names. Um, but what the Stiel uh, basically would list uh, does is it captures data of individual logs. Um, so what once you lock the trees, uh, you can you can lock the individual um, you can you can log it the individual trees basically in lists, and then you have an automatic calculation of the volume and the cubic meter of timber, and it does an auto automatic bark reduction by tree type. Um, so you basically have your offline maps. Um, you have also um, as uh, rescue sites on the maps and like some some more points of interest that will be added in the future. Um, the data can be exported into Logbuch, so meaning that we have um, a little, let's say, platform already uh, where data is shared between our products. And uh, what we, um, what you can do is basically you, you mark the tree, um, you type it into your, into your list and you can, uh, you can uh, basically, um, uh, define the tree type and then it does an automatic bark reduction by tree type and then you can also say what quality type is is the tree um, and so it is easier to uh, to to sell the wood afterwards and then I also have a little um, a little animation for this um, so basically uh, you have log one uh, a specific length a specific diameter and with these um, uh, with these inf with this information um, put into the Stielholzliste, you get you get the you get the cubic meter instantly um, um, in the app that you see on the left, and then you can compile lists regarding on what kind of order number you're on. And the last um, the last product that we have is called Fovea. Um, this is um, a startup that we bought uh, in May. Um, and what it does, it's it's round wood measuring. So uh, we have two different types of uh, of products um, with Fovea. Um, the iFovea Pro is you basically you capture a picture of a timber pile on a truck or um, um, or somewhere else, and then um, it automatically calculates the cubic meters, the volume, and the log diameter, and uh, this can be uh, exported uh, as a PDF. And then um, the second product is uh, forest management. So it's an own developed cloud-based management software for the forest. Um, so you can manage the measured wood um, via the system. You have invoicing available. You have export uh, functionality. And uh, you have also extensive map functionalities um, and calculation of selling prices. Um, and so what's really interesting is um, here you can say there's already artificial intelligence with the image processing in place. Um, and one of the main things um, or one of the main challenges using um, artificial intelligence for the round wood measuring is that there's a lot of different tools out there on the market, um, software as well as hardware. It's not really easy to find the right combination that works best. Um, and there's, although there's a lot possible in this field, um, there's there's still like some some factors um, that inhibit to to um, basically develop this further very easily, right? And uh, with the Stielholzliste, maybe this is also something we we can discuss later on. Uh, right now, the Stielholzliste is of course something that where you have to manually log all of these different things. You have to manually um, put put the information into the lists. 
Um, and it would be, I guess, very interesting to have like also an image uh, recognition for the different trees in terms of like what, how much bark is there and have like an even more efficient and better bark reduction um, available. Then I would like to um, mention one other topic. Um, this is something that we're currently working on. Um, so basically my project within the forest is to really do some strategic groundwork. So what we do, we take some of those topics that you saw earlier. In this case, uh, the example that I brought with me is, um, is pests, uh, especially the bark beetle, which is very, very prevalent in Germany as of now. Um, due to the, the pine monocultures and to the, the dry areas and like we're, we're just lacking rain basically in Germany. Um, and so maybe this is also interesting what we do with these kind of topics in the early phase. Um, so uh, we, uh, we started a project with students, uh, pest control in the forest. Um, and we did a design thinking sprint to really understand better what's behind this topic and how can we what 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 is really the problem and what kind of solution would be fitting uh, so we used a customer centric approach we did interviews with stakeholder in the forest um, with private forest owners forest rangers um, also professors from universities and we did um, uh, we did uh, find out that recognition of pests is a very um, is a is a very personal intensive uh, topic. There's no real time information of the logging pre process, and that's bad because you do have a lot of uh, time pressures. Like within six weeks, um, um, or w some even say within two weeks, uh, the 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 trees that are infested should be logged and also. Um, uh, transported out of the forest and then there's also like this unpredictability you will never know when the ne next um, uh, pest inf infestation will happen or where it's actually developing as of now so you're always late you can you can always only react as of now and you can't like counteract um, so, but what we did is we we try to uh, to pinpoint the main pain point, which is the recognition of infested wood, just because it's very, it's 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 a staffing problem, as some of the uh, customers or stakeholders told us, because um, you really have to walk tree by tree, and try to find out um, which uh, which trees are infested. And I did this myself, and it's it's very hard to actually see it in the first place. Um, that that the tree is infested uh, with a bark beetle, um, so you have to have a good eye. At least me, I'm I'm not an expert, but at least for me that was very, uh, very interesting <laughs> and uh, let's say um, a challenge to to actually see um, when a tree is infested, um, and then to actually like recognize it early on because otherwise it will infest other trees is 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 one of the things that's happening if you don't um, detect it early on, and then again like it needs to be. It needs to be transported out of the of the out of the forest very very um, early or very fast. So um, what we got as a result um, is um, a tested digital service prototype, or actually two. I brought one with me here. Um, so we um, we thought of like a sensor solution um, to detect bark beetle. That was the one solution, and the other one was like the drone recognition and mon monitoring of pest investigation. So what we um, what we do in these design thinking sprints is we have like very very um, uh, early concept ideas and uh, put them into like a prototype that can be tested uh, with customers to actually see if this is something that could be potentially hitting the market. So the drone recognition with the ones um, that we with the uh, with the stakeholders and the customers that we tested uh, this this concept with, um, there was very there was very positive feedback. Um, and so now, of course, the question is, now we know a little bit better um, about pest control in the forest and what potential uh, services we could offer. Um, and uh, I brought uh, pest control with me as, as a topic um, for this conference because I think there's big opportunities for applied artificial intelligence. And as you might know, um, uh, there's a Stiel Digital, our venturing uh, unit uh, that is actually um, investing uh, in, in, in startups, but also um, trying to find uh, corporations or collaborations with startups that um, that will, um, yeah, basically uh, help us to to use the right technology and develop the right products. And I just brought two examples with me um, within this field. 
um, that could be potentially interesting for for pest control um, in uh, in the forest. And one is OCEL, the analysis of aerial images. Um, and this could be also like they did have some uh, they did have some some um, or there is let's say opportunity for uh, for not only uh, analyzing tree types but also maybe pest infestation in the infestation in the future. And then Skylab, uh, Skylab, which works more with uh, with drones, um, and also analyzes uh, images uh, for seedling counting. And they also even did like uh, basically a research project to detect bark beetle uh, bark beetles um, in in German forests. Um, this is still very early stage. Um, as far as I know, there's no solution out there that uh, can detect bark beetle. Uh, before the tree dies, this would even be more interesting because um, from the aerial aerial image, uh, images you can see it uh, from above once the tree dies because then it turns red and it loses all of its um, all of its leaves. Um, but it would be even better to detect it uh, before that happens. Um, so um, summing it up basically and uh, looking forward to to questions you have and to discussing this topic is that. Um, we basically uh, wanna, yep. Uh, we basically wanna uh, support our customers um, in the forest with hardware uh, products, with also services and digital products, um, and we wanna do this along the value chain, um, and we wanna do this along basically the working day of um, the forest rangers, of the forest workers, and just anyone that that plays a part um, in the digital or in the forest, basically, that works there. Um, yeah, that would be the end of my uh, presentation and I'm looking very much forward to your questions. All awesome. Right. Anja, thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving us some insights on the current activities that are going down at Stiel. And there are uh, a, a few questions actually that have flown in um, during your presentation. So let's start with the first one. Uh, you mentioned Stiel Digital as well uh, and the, the venture side that you guys mm -hmm. established. So do you have any open calls for startup collaborations at the moment? And are there any open calls for research corporations or just finished products? No, uh, we we're always open uh, for for startup collaborations. This is um, um, whenever there's something interesting for us, we'll be open to discuss and happy to discuss. And uh, so, um, whoever wants uh, to um, to to get in contact with us, of course, we're super happy about that. And w uh, regarding the second question, um, we're also open for research corporations. Yes, it's not just finished products. It really just depends if it's like a good fit. As, as always, um, but uh, uh, yeah. Very good. So the next question is, is more AI uh, related. Besides image recognition, which other AI methods are you experimenting uh, with at the moment? Um, to be honest, we're not too far along uh, with with the topic of artificial intelligence and really like making it um, into a tangible product um, on the market. Um, I w something where where um, artificial intelligence is 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 also uh, will be very much um, um, also something that we're um, using it more and more is regarding data analytics. And like really trying to make use of of the data that we have uh, that we're having or the data that we're um, that our products are um, are generating. Very good. I'll, I'll jump a little bit when it comes to the uh, number of the questions. Uh, a question regarding the Fovea solution, also because we heard something uh, interesting earlier from from uh, Anna Greta from Tim Beta in Estonia. How do you guys actually? calculate the, the volume of the trees by just measuring one dimension for beer. So to be honest, I'm not too <laughs> too much or too deep into the technolo technology uh, used by Fovea, but um, if this person wants to uh, like contact me uh, personally, I'll, I'll be super happy to uh, to bring uh, him or her in contact with uh, with um, the founder of Fovea. <laughs> Very good. Um, you mentioned it a little bit earlier uh during your presentation as well but but one question that came up as well is uh who are the typical customers that use your tree localization products 
Um, it's uh, it's uh, forest rangers um, that are using our product, and then uh, like the uh, gosh, the German uh, the, the English translation of all of these like German uh, terms of like the the um, basically let's say state institutions that own um, that own forest. They will they will buy the solution for um, for their uh, forest rangers and then this is uh, these are basically the ones that that are currently um, uh, using um, the product. Logbook. Awesome. So yeah. another question regarding Holz liste. Um, is Holz liste also used for the payment of the logs and is the tool complying with German law? No, as of now, it's not used for the payment. It's just giving you the cubic meters um, and that's it. So it stops there. It's basically just really documenting what you logged and making it easier. Um, and also what, what's very nice is you can you can put a number of the logs that you spray on them. Um, you can put it into the list so it's easier to, to, to match basically the logs, the tree logs and what you have in your list regarding the cubic meters. Okay, and another uh, question, which you also partially an answered, but I just want to uh, raise it again. Um, in, in terms of other areas of your business, like uh, supply chain, production, product optimization, product development, um, are those also topics that you are uh, the right contact person for, or is that something that's more catered to the activities of uh, Stil Digital? Um, so I'd say it's it's twofold. Um, Shield Digital is always uh, is looking um, uh, beyond the forest, of course. They're also um, looking for just new, very interesting tech and in all sorts of, um, you know, all sorts of areas that might be interesting for uh, for Stiel in general. So this basically, yes, we're looking into topics like logistics production, product optimization, or also development. Um, and then uh, regarding, so we also have, of course, steel, steel internal um, uh, departments that um, are, of course, trying also to to develop further our logistic uh, programs, our production. Uh, we do have a department taking care of smart factory um, projects. Um, so. Um, this is this is not something that we as a digitalization department do, but um, there's other um, areas in the company that take care of it. Awesome. Um, and maybe uh, another question uh, regarding um, the simulation based approaches that some of the other companies that also spoke earlier today um, were raising. Where do you see this fit and where do you see the fit with the current activities of Stiel? Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on what simulation-based approaches um, mean? The person who asked the question, maybe we can ask her or him to uh, elaborate on the simulation-based approaches uh, while we head on to another question. Yeah? Uh, just comment on your question. We see your comment uh, when you elaborate on it and we would mm -hmm. be very grateful for that. And Bernhard down here is also raising another one. Laser scanning is becoming more and more interesting in the forestry sector, monitoring forest inventory. Uh, is that also a hot topic for, for steel? Uh, I'd say yes, just because I'm, I'm not sure if we're actually working um, on, on something with this technology as of now, but we're always looking for new technology um, to, um, to implement in our products. So. Not sure uh, how the project, uh, if we're working on it project-wise, um, but regarding like we're always open like to new um, new tech to uh, to uncover and to make our products better or even like introducing new ones. Very good. And maybe uh, for a last question um, for the for the talk, uh, in in terms of sensors and equations that are used to assess tree volumes. Uh, once again, uh, we know it's, it's not very deep into the, the, the technical realm, but how many tree species are catered for in the current solutions uh, that Stiel is offering here? Uh, the tree types, uh, how many tree types? Uh, yeah, we are the, uh, I, I guess it's about the Holzliste. Um, I think it's about 10, if I'm not mistaken, around nine or 10-ish. 
it's it's of course like the most prominent trees um, that are um, that are planted in Germany as of now. Wonderful. Yeah, well, um, Anja, I think you have also been joining our other presentations uh, by by the other speakers, and you also had a look into our participants list. Maybe there's some company from Austria from anywhere in the world that might be interesting. Uh, that might be an interesting partner for you to collaborate with. Um, the call also goes out. You heard the presentation of uh, Anja from Stiel. And sorry for calling you Anja Stiel right in the beginning. <laughs> it's been a long day. It's been a long day. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> uh, please, uh, I invite you to get in touch with uh, Anja directly. She has a profile on our website. You can message her and she might still be able, available for one-on-one -on -one meetings. Thank you so much uh, for your Thank time. You. We appreciate it a lot that you have been part of our virtual Applied AI in Forestry Chamber and Wood Conference. And we wish you a nice evening. Best wishes from Vienna. And after a short break, just three minutes, four minutes, we continue on with the next speaker who will be joining us from the west coast of Canada. All right. See Thank you, you so much. Day. Have a great okay. conference. Thank Bye. So, and bear with me while I try and start the little intro video for our next speaker. And we'll be with you in a few seconds.
Hello and welcome back. And we see if we have a connection to our next speaker. Uh, warm welcome to Dr. Li Chi. She is the research lead at Lamasu Interactive. And this is a Victoria, British Columbia based company. So from Canada. So thanks, first of all, for getting up so early. I don't know if you call yourself a startup, but usually they also start at 10 a.m., don't they? <laughs> Yeah, and then you're already a little bit larger than a startup. Can you hear us? Can we hear you? Yes, I can hear uh, hear you well. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clearly. And you will tell us today a little bit about um, timber ops. I like the term a lot, and how to accelerate forest land management. A topic that our participants think is one of the main topics of AI, applied AI in forestry. By the way. So uh, you've come to the right place. Uh, let me just see if I can get your slides up and then the stage would be yours for about 10, 15 minutes. And please remember to leave some time for Q&A and all our participants can ask questions in the uh, question box here on the right, uh, slido.com, upvote other people's questions and we will ask them uh, at the end of uh, Lee's presentation. All right, the, the stage is yours. Here are your slides. We'll talk yeah. a little bit later. Thanks very much for the introduction. Yes, we are a company with a very unique name on the Canadian West Coast and happens to be in the morning time here. It's 7.40 uh, right now. Um, so good morning, everyone. It's really nice to see you virtually online. Um, we, uh, oh, I should click here. Um, for today's presentation, we're just going to do a very quick high level uh, introduction of Lamazoo, uh, who we are and what, uh, what we do for the forestry industry. And then we're going to try to leave more time for Q, uh, Q and A. So, so Lamazoo is a, a high-tech, high uh, small to medium-sized company. That's why we call them in Canada. And we are founded in 2014, based in Victoria, Canada. Uh, and we have a satellite office in Vancouver. We are a completely Canadian-owned co uh, company. And um, we have been publishing uh, our visual and analytics solutions uh, for the last few years, which has been used over uh, used by over six, 60 million users globally. Uh, and then um, the platform of the comp uh, uh, the platform of the company focused on creating a scalable platform to fusing and analyzing and vi uh, visualizing very big industrial data uh, data sets. So, uh, so we are kind of the la last mile data and and analytics solution integrator, and we always try to work with field clients, and we try to figure out what's the turnkey solution for each of the clients. And uh, the company has a fo focus on big data solutions for land resource uh, management use cases and neighboring sectors. Um, now I, I am the research lead of the com uh, of the company, and I um, uh, mostly coordinate the company's uh, technical and scientific uh, re research part. And we just do a, a quite a de decent amount of AI uh, to apply them in our analytics solutions. And my contact information will be uh, in the first and last slides of my talk. <coughs> So, uh, so the mission of the com of the company is very simple. We have these slogans called uh, "Change the way the world sees data," and the um, general thinking of us is that these days we have a lot of advanced data acquisition te techniques. Like every forestry company has these light lidar sensors and drones and flying around take, uh, taking data from the field. And uh, 
the the bottleneck these days for land resource management sector is re is re really not a lack of data, but too much data from the fields, and it's really hard to make sense of them. So uh, Lamzu position ourselves to be the data and analytics integrator, and we build this um, turnkey uh, endpoint solutions for uh, specific enterprise customers and specific use cases. Uh, uh, or in-house big data integration platform takes in analytics uh, functionalities from all major source of industrial standards applications, uh, in, including software, software applications and IoT hardware. And then we also integrate data from data lakes. Uh, and then we fuse all these different formats and traditionally uh, in all, uh, not, not inter operatable data and we put them into a common uh, unified uh, con context uh, for for data visualization and analyze. And uh, the best of all is that our visualization platform is also VR air enabled. So you can feel free to put on your uh, headset and experience the data in, in full 3D and in high fidelity. So that's the uh, high level introduction of the company's whole product line. Now we're going to focus a little bit more on our forestry sector solution, which we call uh, it's the Timber Ops SBI. <clears throat> so SBI is a acronym for Spatial Business in Intelligence Platform. Um, and I should say this is not one software, but Timber Ops is like a uh, so software platform with main, uh, with a lot of reconfigurable mo uh, modules that we can quickly assemble uh, into an end user uh, application for uh, specific clients and their special needs. Um, and the the platform combines very really high fidelity uh, data sets su such as LiDAR, GIS, satellite, and drone imagery and the analytics solutions uh, into a single visual analytics uh, pla platform. So there's a video demo at the end and we are going to look at this, uh, this uh, Timber of software in action. Um, uh, the platform is uh, developed by Lavanzuba with collaboration with Canadian uh, local research institutions like our universities and government uh, research institutions, and it's being used in the field for uh, local Canadian co companies too. <laughs> and let's dive into a little bit about uh, the platform's use case in a real world plan planning scenario. So, <clears throat> so we all know that for uh, forestry uh, operation, everyone has a. Uh, uh, huge two toolbox of domain specific tools like you have the your favorite cat block planning tools you have your favorite uh, road, road planning tools and in Canada we also have this thing called visual quality assessment and it's part of the environment assessment and you can't just cut down trees and destroy the uh, uh, recreational uh, values of the forest by uh, undermines uh, view uh, and appearance for um, for the residents and communities around there. So uh, Lamazoo's product is capable of in integrate uh, the functionality and the, the output of all, all these different domain specific tools into one unified visual and analytics platform. Uh, and bringing all this high fidelity uh, data into a VR AR in enabled environment. Um, so one can just dive in and flying around in this virtual for forest, which sometimes we call it a uh, digital twin of, of your forest. And has been validated by our, one of our big customer, Interfer. Some of you might have heard of them. It, uh, it's a multi, 
national pretty big four three company, and uh, it it may need to uh, fifty million to eighty million dollars of annual savings. I just uh, try to do the plan planning with a high fidelity visual data in office instead of occurring a lot of field tri trips. Uh, the other important aspect of timber ops is that it supports uh, land management and stakeholder in engagement outside of this direct in industrial application of where you are trying to harvest and, and re re replanting the trees. Uh, because we bring in all these high fidelity uh, visual data and the analytical results uh, into one single platform, uh, it's much more intuitive for 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 stakeholders and com community members to engage in the design and planning of the forestry land resources, uh, rather than to ask them to use a, a professional tool like any uh, command line based AI or data mining tools you might have been uh, root routinely use as a forestry technician. Um, and again, our capability of introduce high big data analytics in, in, into a VR AR enable platform uh, sometimes uh, will uh, facilitate this uh, in, uh, land management engagement and uh, 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 Stakeholder conversation a lot with with like governments and local com communities. Um, lastly, I just want to show some evidence of uh, actual savings by employing timber ops in one one of our clients. All these uh, estimations of uh, dollar savings are based on uh, for, for forestry operations on the Canadian west uh, west coast. And they can be roughly divided into three categories. So uh, first of all, by using timber ops in office and integrate all the high high fidelity da data into one place to to perform the integrated analysis, uh, we can save a lot of field trips. And sometimes people don't need to fly their helicopters in, into the field or or or, or, or incur this uh, lengthy and uh, risky on on foot trips into the remote lands and and that's the major big of part of uh, savings you can see in the first few uh, rows and the other two ca ca categories is um, on the uh, co community engagement and uh, environment assessment which is a, which is big topics in Canada. Uh, so by showing this forest before and after the industrial development with very high fidelity spatial data and especially um, uh, with the VR AR enabled analytics, uh, we can very easily get through the idea of how the development will affect the land and that will just connect people better uh, with the data. And uh, in the last two minutes, I just want to quickly go go, go through some other capability of the company. So Lambda's focus is on land resource management and large scale spatial data integration. So we also do a fair amount of work for the mining sector, which you can see here, we are uh, importing the planning data of drill hole holes on a um, mining pit and the, the geology and mineral uh, all, all, like compositions uh, of the underground materials. And we also have the capability of integrate CAD and BRM uh, and Latex data and tools into one unified platform. So you can inspect your forestry meals in the same uh, uh, app as you do cut block and road planning and try to build a fully integrated uh, for forestry operation plan uh, 
uh, from cut to from cutting to 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 processing to re uh, replanting the 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 trees in one high fidelity visual app. Um, that is all the slides, high level slides I got no, and I'm up to take questions. So I just try to play this video. It doesn't work in full <coughs> screen mode somehow, but that's our Timber Ops demo video. I hope I'm on time. Uh, uh, yes, you are perfectly on time. Thanks. So should I take questions myself or how do I see them? We will uh, pull up the questions right now. Just a second. Um, I'll just keep talking a little bit more. So, sure. Okay. Right. Um, here we here we are. Here we are. We have a couple of questions. Clemens. Yes. Uh, yeah. The first one is actually a very non-technical question. Uh, it's regarding the business model and the, the associated cost. If if a company decides to become a Lemasu customer. Yeah. So uh, we. We like to say uh, we are a software for as a service uh, company. So basically, what we do, as you see in the Timber Ops app, it's not just one software app. We have a, a in in house repository of all these different for for three components that we can assemble uh, a a a Timber Timber Ops app for any customer. Uh, according to their very specific needs. And then we will, uh, basically the business model is the cu the customer will pay us a subscription fee and we will keep updating the software and uh, putting in new components towards their needs and developing uh, uh, new components uh, according to the requirement. So it's a subscription encryption based and it's an end user uh, like case by case solution. I may add one follow-up question from myself. In which countries have you uh, rolled out so far? Uh, we have mo we are mo mostly doing business in Canada with a little bit outreach to the states. Uh, on our mining product line has a, a little bit wider audience. The fourth tree is in in Canada and US. Okay, good. Then the next question. Now we get into the technology and R and D. Uh, yeah, from a technical perspective, what are the main challenges in fusing together the different inputs like lidar, image recognition, satellite data, chase, and so on? Um, it's well, it, it's a case by case pro problem, and it really uh, take takes a deep field experience in the industry to 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 make sense of all this data for all kinds. And a lot of difficulty of this doesn't really come from the data for format, but comes from how each different customer use or exploit that specific data format. So we have to go into the field uh, and we have to sit with each of our customers and we need to understand their existing business model to make sure our pr product can fit in their workflow and incur uh, minimal change management overhead and this technology adoption overhead. Mm -hmm. Uh, next one is a business question again. I think that one is also very relevant for possible one-to-one -one meetings afterwards. Uh, are you looking for partnerships or 
which clients you're typically looking for? Uh, yes, we are, and uh, we are de we're definitely uh, working on expanding our business all, all, all reach to Europe and Australia. And uh, as I said, we are end uh, end uh, user solution company. So we're looking for two kinds of partners. The the first major pine uh, kind is, is what will become our customers. Those are the four three companies who who are operating in the field, and they have a workflow for us to understand, and we can help help the the company to improve their workflow. And the other kind of partner is that because we we stand on the last mile of the 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 the, the supply chain of this in, entire uh, tech technology stack. We are also looking for upstream uh, R&D partners who can supply us with like domain specific uh, solutions that just like address one pro problem. And we can try to introduce uh, these technology partners to more clients to introduce you to all kind net net network. And we can try to make like real world impact for solutions from there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then the next question is about on the availability of technology. It's about who is providing the drones and is, is this done by you? Or um, are, you, are you renting the drones or is this uh, partnering companies? The, it, it depends. Sometimes the forestry company has their own drone data, drone LiDAR data. So, sometimes we know there is public drone data from the government, but the forestry company cannot make use of that. And that's the real value of Lama is that we, we integrate all available data from all possible sources and we make an endpoint solution for you to address your problem. Mm -hmm. uh, if I may add a follow-up question to this one, uh, in Europe, it's a big topic, uh, how to say, the, to take an inventory of the trees within a city. You know, with global warming, is there enough shadow? Are the trees still alive and so on? Did you also have similar projects in Canadian cities so far, where cities or communities approach you and, and ask you, what is the status of our greenery? Yes, we, uh, we did quite a few projects projects for the land resource management around the city. Uh, so if you guys know, uh, the North America has really bad wildfire, wildfire seasons for the last few years. And mm -hmm. sometimes the fire burns very close to a city and it almost just burns the city out. Uh, and to understand the tree distribution and what's the situation in the forest around the city is something that we have focused on. We haven't really focused on the cityscape per se, like how you do all the bu buildings inside the city. Um, that might be something we're going to look at in the next while. Mm -hmm. Good. Then the next question is again a uh, yeah. technical, a sensor one. Do you use remote sensing? And if not, would it be something you'd, you would be interested in? Uh, we do, and we do use a lot. Now, Lambda is not a data acquisition company, and when, whenever we need this kind of data, we, I, we either go to find it, sometimes forestry company will already have it, or we find a con contractor to take, to take it for us. Um, so. Good, I, I think as far as the last two questions are concerned, you, you basically answered them by saying you're open for collaborations and partnerships everywhere in the world. You're not restricted to North America and so on. Oh. Yeah, I think on the mining sector, we have done something in South Africa already. So we definitely have a network to go to both Europe and uh, Africa as the two question mentions. And um, you are... Uh willing to share your slides with us and with our participants that uh, yeah. um, because some of them might be interested in getting in touch with you. Yeah, that would be great. Wonderful, wonderful. 
Well, we see the sun coming up in your in your office. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are, we are standing in, into the fall on the west, uh, west coast, so I wish you guys still have some good weather there. But uh, Canada will, uh, Canada west coast, Vancouver and Seattle will fa fa facing about two, two to three months of rain from now on. Okay, the Canadian autumn, wonderful. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Lee, for joining us. We appreciate it a lot. Uh, thanks for investing the time. And I hope you still join the one-on-one -on -one meeting sessions with a couple of our other participants. And we wish you a good start into your day. Thanks. Take care. And have a nice day. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right. And uh, we are at a point in our program where we have a short break planned. Um, the meeting uh, possibility is still open. We still have uh, most of our participants online. And now, actually, as I said before, the um, participants joining in from the North and South Americas are waking up and logging in. So use the chance, head over to the participant section here on the top, filter for the Americans. <laughs> and uh, request meetings if you see anybody of interest that you would like to collaborate with, uh, just as Dr. Lee Ji from Lama Zoo Interactive, based in Canada. We see each other in about 14 minutes with our next presenter and hope that you stay tuned. Um, see you in a little bit.
Hello, everybody. Um, we are back uh, from our little break, and uh, we already have an around eight hour long day full of presentations on applied AI in forestry, timber, and wood behind us. And many of you are still tuned in uh, or partly in meetings. We thank you for that, appreciate it a lot. And uh, we are about to uh, connect to Lisbon in Portugal, where we will say hi to uh, Remy Charpentier. He is CEO at Tesselo. Uh, Remy, Hello, can everybody. You... Good afternoon, Austria and the world. Uh, Hello. Hello. How is it in Portugal? Uh, it's okay. It's still, uh, no, still, uh, we're still in t-shirts. Still good weather. Um, it starts raining, so it's good for the forest fire. Uh, it's usually a, a dangerous moment now in Portugal for uh, for forest fire, especially if it doesn't rain. And we had uh, three good days of rain, so uh, we we should have a, a good uh, a good autumn. That's perfect. And okay. are you in your home office or in the office? I am at home. I am at home. Uh, my uh, uh, yes, we uh, we do half half now, half office, half home. Uh, but today I have my kid at home, so uh, I have to stay. Okay, perfect. Not working. Okay, so let me uh, let me present you uh, Tesselo. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, you can. We do see your screen. Uh, you have about 10, 15 minutes. Leave some okay. room. Q and A's, and yes. everybody can ask questions to Remy using the question box on the right. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Stage is yours. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So, um, I will um, uh, I, I will show you uh, today um, what we do at Tesselo uh, for forestry using uh, open satellite uh, imagery and uh, artificial intelligence. So um, a few words about Tesselo. So Tesselo, we are an environmental technology firm and we are specialized in, uh, in spatial intelligence. Spatial intelligence is an uh, art of uh, augmenting satellite imagery with artificial intelligence. And we apply uh, all technology to, uh, to different uh, sectors, forestry, insurance, and, uh, and utilities. Uh, our specificity is that we use only open, uh, open satellite data meaning a Landsat from NASA and the Sentinel system from the uh, European Space Agency. Uh, so today I'm going to showcase uh, what we do in Portugal for the pulp and paper industry. Uh, we do a continuous forest inventory uh, for, on, over all uh, the, the, the Portugal territory, which is 90,000 uh, square kilometers. And uh, we, uh, we compile a lot of data through our models we do a land use classification. We do uh, uh, we identify uh, tree species. Um, we uh, we characterize the tree with the age and uh, the volume. Uh, we analyze the life cycle of trees, uh, where are the new plantations, where uh, where it's been harvested and where it's burnt. And also, uh, we provide health information about the trees and uh, provide early warning about uh, pests that can attack. Um, the resolution of uh, the maps you are going to see is 10 meters, so it means that uh, each pixel represents 10 meters on the ground. Um, and uh, but you'll see, we, uh, even with this uh, relative low, uh, relatively low resolution, we can obtain uh, some some quite uh, interesting result. Uh, so first of all, the fact that we use open data allow us to work at any scale. So here it's Portugal, but we can work on uh, at country scale or continent scale very easily. Uh, and uh, we uh, we uh, we can obtain a, a very accurate classification of uh, of the of the of the land. And so here in this example, it's for the forest industry. So we have uh, defined um, uh, seven class of trees, uh, differentiating eucalyptus, the two kinds of pine, um, the rest of the pine, uh, some other leaf trees, uh, the cork oak, azinara, which is another kind of of oak, and we also differentiate from shrubs, which are smaller trees. Uh, which we don't consider as forest. And so here you can see on the right how the map looks at full scale. This is the whole uh, uh, Portugal. And here's a zoom in in, uh, in south of Lisbon where you can see the, the different trees and how it's, uh, it's distributed. Um, what we do, um, unlike many of our uh, of, of, of other companies, is that we, we do a land use, not a land cover. 
meaning that we uh, we classify uh, the, how the land is used and not their current state. So, for example, on the right you can see some 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 uh, some some harvested area, which is a bare soil. But our model will say it's it's not bare soil; it's cut eucalyptus. So we we provide a full context this is the land use. Uh, and then after, once we have this, this land use, where the forest, where are the different kind of trees, we can provide the status uh, uh, if, the, if, if the trees are cut, burnt, or uh, our LCR, etc. Uh, what we do um, also, thanks for uh, uh, using training data uh, from our customers. So they are the pulp and paper industry. So they send people to the field to, to take some measurement of the trees. And we use this field measurement to train model, to, uh, to, uh, to train machine learning model, to, uh, uh, to estimate the age of a tree and, uh, and, and, and the volume, for example. Uh, we also have access to some LIDAR, which is some kind of radar data with very high resolution. And with sample of LIDAR data, we have a very good model to estimate how high is a tree and uh, how, uh, how fast it grows. And when you plug all this data with some allometric maps, uh, allometric table, uh, we uh, we can also uh, estimate the biomass and uh, or the capacity for carbon sequestration. Uh, one of the models that uh, uh, we use a lot is uh, differentiating cut and burn. Uh, when you have a forest loss, when you see a, a loss of, of green stuff in, in the satellite image, it's often difficult to know what has been cut and what has been burned. And here we have a, a, a very accurate model that can give us exactly where are the forests that have been cut and what, uh, where, where the forest has been burnt. And uh, so that's very useful, for example, to monitor logging activities when you uh, when you have plantations all over the country and you want to make sure that uh, your uh, uh, the parcels are, are, are logged on time. Uh, you can see we create monthly image of Portugal, and uh, with that we have uh, the progression of uh, the log activity month by month, uh, or even uh, week by week. Um, and as we use open data, we can uh, use all the data there is because of that the raw data is free to acquire. So the only cost for us is to uh, ingest and process the data, but we don't have to buy it, meaning we can we can do a very dense analysis, especially over time. So for example, this is uh, the, the percentage of area which has been burnt, cut, and uh, of, of different trees, uh, for eucalyptus and, and the pine bravo in a district in Portugal. So you can see here in 2018, we had some big fires uh, in this region. Uh, and you can see how, um, how fast the forest is recovering for eucalyptus. Eucalyptus, they, they, they regenerate quite quickly, while for the pine, it's, it takes more time to regenerate. Uh, what we do also is uh, is health and uh, analysis. So uh, with uh, the Sentinel system from uh, the uh, European Space Agency, uh, we have um, uh, the usual indices that you can use to understand vegetation, like NDVI, the, the vegetation index, or we have also uh, the, the water content, so the, the soil and leaf index of moisture. And with these two information, uh, we can really uh, identify what are the trees that are performing better in terms of, of water and DVI and the ones that are performing worse. And that's doing an anomaly analysis. Uh, we can identify all the trees that are stressed by water, that are at risk of uh, catching fire or that are going to die. Um, and uh, we also developed um, for a very specific bug in Portugal called the Gnonicleus platensis. It's, um, it's a bug that eats leaves. And by looking at historical data, we could create a model that um, uh, that, it, that 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 send an alert as soon as we detect uh, the pest attacking a tree. Uh, the, 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 the bug eats the leaf of, of the tree and uh, we can see a, a reduction in, in foliage density. And this is a trigger for, for an alert. So you can act more quickly. Um, and um, our platform, so we've built all the platform to create all these models. And, uh, and so our customer can, uh, can access all these data through, uh, uh, through a web app that you can see on the right, uh, where you can explore uh, different mounts, uh, different uh, 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 models that have been uh, generated. And you can also have reporting, so having some per parcel analysis. 
Uh, we have also have a WMTS access uh, that's for connecting your uh, your map software like ArcGIS uh, directly to our platform, so you don't have to download uh, uh, these huge maps. And we can export any data to any uh, any kind of uh, of format that is useful for customers, like PDF reports or Excel table for analysis, or even shape files if you want to analyze map uh, offlines. And finally, we have a SDK, so we plug. We can plug our platform uh, directly into uh, into into partners' uh, web app. So, for example, we work uh, with a company called Tapio, which, which does a carbon offsetting, and they they, they connect directly to our platform uh, to know how their uh, the plantations are investing is uh, is is capturing car carbon and how much has been sequestered, and so all of that is done programmatically and automatically. And uh, that's it. Um, yeah, 10 minutes. Amazing. You are perfectly on time <laughs> to, to the second. <laughs> to the second, actually, yeah, which is quite refreshing after a long day like this. No, everybody was really awesome today. The, we, we actually have uh, received a couple of questions. Yes. Um, maybe some of those have been answered already, but maybe you can elaborate again. Yes. Again. Mm -hmm. So the first question is going in the direction of customers and usage. Yes, and so uh, our customers are um, as a pulp and paper industry, as well as a furniture industry. So they own or manage plantations all over the country. We work in Portugal, in Brazil, in India, and in uh, in Mozambique with this customer. We also work with insurance company uh, that provides insurance for forest fire. Uh, and finally, we work with utilities where we monitor vegetation around power line. Mm -hmm. So basically, the pipe and and we also do uh, illegal logging. We have early alert. We have a model that detects roads that are being built in the forest. And usually, before you uh, you you do illegal logging, you have to build the road to extract the timber. And so we have a, a special model that will detect the road being built, and so we can uh, provide an early warning to which area will be uh, illegally logged. And that for that we do that in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I see you answered a couple of questions. So pulp and paper might use your system for predicting prices or uh, just changes on the supply chain, which is very interesting. Also yes. the insurance use case. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, when it comes to the, the, the bugs, how do you identify them? Which type of sensor or data is used? So we use uh, mostly uh, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1. Sentinel-2 is a, is a multispectral uh, satellite with a 10 meter resolution. And its, um, its interest is that it has a lot of infrared. So uh, most satellites have one band on infrared and Sentinel-2 has 10 bands of infrared, which make it uh, ideal for vegetation analysis. We use also Sentinel-1, which is a radar uh, an asyn uh, a synchronous uh, aperture radar uh, from that will give us an idea of, of texture and change and uh, it, it has cloud penetrating capabilities so that's uh, that works all the time mm, second question is actually follow follow up to this one when it comes to health monitoring what is the price range per square kilometer um, it really depends. Uh, we we don't uh, sell by model. We sell a package of different models. So uh, of course, if uh, the price um, uh, depends on the area of your uh, of interest, the bigger the area is more expensive, and also on the number of models you you range. But if you are looking for Portugal, uh, typically the solution I've showed you is with, with five or six models uh, for all Portugal uh, will cost you uh, uh, between. Um, uh, one and two euro per square kilometer per year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. Then the next question is going in the direction of uh, annotation of training data and ground truth. Uh, how do you handle the, the evaluation of the quality of the ground truth data? Um, so here, as, um, well, we, we often use uh, um, the data from our customer. And uh, what we do is uh, we uh, we don't take all the data from our customer. The customer keeps some data secret. So we do an accuracy verification ourselves, meaning when we have some training data, 
we split the sample in two. We take uh, sixty percent for training and forty percent for validation. But the customer also have some secret data uh, that he used to verify the accuracy independently of our model. And so yes, we uh, we have in house uh, uh, a lot of expert in remote sensing. Uh, the image resolution is 10 meter, and we have also uh, some internal, uh, well, some uh, some in-house expert on forestry. Uh, but uh, the, we've worked a lot with our customer forest experts that have uh, been uh, providing a lot of, of input uh, to our models. Then one very uh, so next question is touching on a very recent topic that is getting lots of attention in the context of the wildfires that we see on the west coast in the United States. Yes. How can a solution like yours mitigate the effects? Like um, well, we, we, we cannot uh, uh, we can we cannot help really after the fact. Uh, what we can do is uh, is identify the areas that are very at risk, and so where the vegetation is dry, where is the fuel, meaning where is the dead trees, where are the dead trees, and especially what is the proximity to infrastructure. Most of the fire gets started close to power lines, to, uh, to factories, to houses because there's a barbecue, to roads because people throw uh, cigarette butts out of the window, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we create a risk map. Uh, we also have a different. Um, uh, we also compute the distance to the road for the firefighter. Uh, we uh, we also compute the distance for each forest pixel to um, uh, to water uh, availability, etc. So we create risk maps, and then after. Uh, this is a role of uh, the um, a big government to, to do proper forest management, and but also utilities. Uh, so that's why we work with utilities. It's to help them. Uh, this is the biggest risk to forest is the power line, and so we help them making sure that uh, the the uh, uh, power line is clear of vegetation. Mm, thank you. And final question is: uh, In which countries so far have you deployed your solution? Uh, so we work in, uh, in the US, in Portugal, in Brazil, in India, in Mozambique, in Ireland, and in Japan. Wonderful, concise and perfect. Are we allowed to share your slides with our participants? Yes, of course. Great, perfect. So uh, if you are interested in getting in touch with uh, Remy Charpentier from Tessello, Feel free to contact him using the platform. You can find him among the participants. Also, you find there are some of his colleagues who also registered. Use the chance and after the event, we'll send you the slides and you can also check out the recording of the presentation. Wonderful. Perfect. Thank you, Remy. Very well, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate a lot and have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Right. Um, dear everybody, this brings us to a short break in our program. Uh, use it for, as always, one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, check out who's there. And we'll be back in about one and a half hours where we have a live video connection to New Zealand, mm -hmm. to Seven, Wellington. 7 p.m. Central European time. 7 p.m. Central European time. Um, or one and a half hours later from now. Uh, thank you for staying tuned so far and we'll see you in a bit.
So, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of today's conference. So, I welcome with me Matt Lies from New Zealand. Hello, Matt. Can you hear me? I can. Good morning. Good morning from New Zealand. Yeah, so you're actually from the future because for you it's already September 24th. <laughs> I can tell you Thursday's looking like a beautiful day. <laughs> Excellent. Glad to hear. <laughs> and additionally, from the Advantage Austria Sydney, I also welcome Miss Kerstin Klein. So, hello, Kerstin. Good morning to Austria and all over the globe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as far as the time slot is concerned, we now have 20 minutes. It's up to you, Matt, if you would like to talk for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And during the session, we will take questions from the audience. And afterwards, uh, Kerstin will handle the Q&A with you. That sounds great. I think around 10 to 15 should be fine, leaving time for questions. Excellent. So just let me do the switch. I see you already started the presentation. So let's remove myself. Great. So please, the stage is yours. Great. Thank you very much. Well, good morning from New Zealand. Great to be uh, with you today. Great to be joining this uh, interesting conference. I, I did join the, the commencement before I uh, departed for my evening last night, and it was great to see some of the early, early talks. Uh, so today I'll be talking about the project we've been running uh, in New Zealand to look at uh, the, a change, the change in, in, in the plantation forest landscape um, through remote sensing and artificial intelligence. Um, so I'll talk through some early results that we're finding and, and the nature of our design approach um, and how the artificial intelligence models were put together and, and really how they depict um, in, in some detail the, the nature of deforested land. Just a little bit of context first. Uh, so we're a, we're a fairly new uh, company on the scene, just been around a, about a year and a half, established last year, based in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, so we primarily provide consulting services and research uh, around AI and machine learning. We actually are tagged to a, a US company called Linker, who provides services for uh, sort of federal government agencies and fisheries uh, in hydrology, coastal systems, climate change, and, and so on. Um, so we offer really a, a nexus, if you like, of, of compute, big data, data infrastructure, with artificial intelligence and geospatial analytics. And we think that the geospatial analytics piece is, is quite crucial really in terms of uh, best practice land coverage, surveillance, wetland mapping, um, land surface and micro uh, land monitoring. Um, so bringing those two capabilities together creates some really unique uh, capabilities and results that are, that are possible. So in terms of uh, the project that I'm going to talk about now, we were commissioned late last year to undertake a, a full inventory of the extent of forest loss across New Zealand during the 2017 and 2018 calendar years. Uh, so every two years, the, our Ministry for the Environment, who are responsible for greenhouse gas reporting to the UN and, and other uh, agencies, uh, undertake a survey of forest loss in a two-year period, but they wait for 12, full 12 months post-harvest uh, to do that analysis. Um, and in the past, that's been a combination of field checking, um, fairly laborious, you know, um, uh, uh, field work, or in some cases, satellite imagery was attempted, and in other cases, oblique photography, uh, all of which are fairly labor intensive uh, and quite involved. Uh, so what we proposed and uh, what we have gone ahead with is a, a more automated approach, uh, still using aerial photography, but applying a machine learning framework to that, to that information. We worked with a couple of partners there, a specialist uh, forestry observation firm, Carbon Forest Services, and a specialist uh, uh, fixed wing drone operator called UAV Mapping New Zealand, who we worked with to acquire the photography. So our design approach, uh, fairly um, sort of a, a, a sequential workflow here. So firstly, there was an aerial survey, which we undertook to, to, to scan um, a wide geography. Uh, and I'll show some numbers on that soon. Uh, we undertook some quality assurance of the photography, really to standardize the brightness, the contrast, the deal with shadows uh, and, and terrain. Um, there was a, a mosaicing process to turn um, each target, so each, each forest um, acquisition, into a, a, a useful product for machine learning. Then the crucial machine learning training and machine learning algorithm development 
uh, piece, which I'll talk a lot about shortly and, and show you some of the results of those. So th that was the phase where we turned those pixels into meaningful land cover determinations and a final recommendation uh, in terms of the current land use. Uh, there was some post-processing and vectorization, which is really where we turn that data back into um, sub, uh, you know, sub area definitions, i.e., the, the what's the nature of the of the the land surface? Is it is it still deforested, cut over, if you like? Is it is it uh, maturing? Is it replanted, and so on? Uh, is it has it been converted? In fact, um, and then finally, there was a multi criteria analysis, which was looking at all those compositions of each forest area to determine a final land cover within the total the total harvest site. So just in terms of the photography plan, uh, we did consider satellite imagery. We considered um, the high resolution, for example, Sentinel imagery down to this, the, the more high, high resolution uh, sensors like Planet, uh, Digital Globe and the likes, Maxar. Really the nature of our geography in New Zealand, um, the, the cloudiness, the ability to get uh, daytime coverage across such a wide sweep of land, um, 7,500 separate individual areas. Uh, some cases are a hectare, in some cases 30 hectares, uh, really prevented satellite imagery from being a viable option for us. So we chose to, to deploy fixed wing aircraft, capture 25 centimetre footage, uh, direct vertical imagery. Uh, in total, we, we flew for 220 hours. Um, that's an, a little example on the right hand side here of the flight plan around Christchurch, one of our cities in the South Island of New Zealand. And you'll see the, the, the photo number in the red flight path is really the, the plan. That was one day's flying, approximately 200 uh, forest targets. And we generally acquired four or more photos per target, which we use to produce our final image mosaic. Just to show some of the examples of the photography. So this is the raw imagery that we were working with. Um, so you can see here some quite nice examples of you know newly plantation uh, forest to the left. Uh, a, a fully harvested site uh, yet to be replanted in the center and really a combination of some mature forest a harvest site and some native vegetation uh, on the right hand side it wasn't always this easy it wasn't always this nice those are relatively straightforward for a, an automated approach to classify many of the uh, forested areas look more like this uh, and the upper two most examples for example show harvested land um, but with debris from the cut and also perhaps there's been a, a period of fallow where the, 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 the block is yet to be replanted. So we, the machine has to determine, are we looking at emerging vegetation or planted vegetation? Um, and often that depends on the, the length of time and the, the growth rate of the vegetation. Um, bottom left as well is, is interesting. Due to COVID this year, we had intended to fly predominantly through the summer. Um, we were forced to... to uh, Bring the aircraft back for it was seven or eight weeks with the New Zealand lockdown uh, back in sort of May, April, May, uh, and we uh, therefore recommenced flying in June, July, uh, and so therefore some shadows became an issue for us. And you'll see there um, in the bottom left uh, frame there's a number of, of dark shadows which which we had to deal with with with, the, with our models. Okay, onto the machine learning and the AI um, engineering. We at Linker focus a lot on, on active learning. Now, active learning is a, a quite a strong field of research in, in AI, uh, which is really around human in the loop computing. Um, it relies on a technique called entropy uh, sampling, um, which is used to advise a human trainer where a model may be struggling to, to uh, distinguish classes. Um, so to explain that a little, a little further, um, this little diagram here uh, shows an example, for example, if we take an unlabeled data set, take that raw photography that I showed earlier, um, we can build in stage one a weak model. We do some simple hand annotation, maybe a couple of hours to distinguish, you know, that, that mature forest from the bare ground, from pasture, from, from plantation seedlings, emerging seedlings. A weak model then can, can start doing inference. That inference will produ produce proposed labels, which will be fairly random. It won't be particularly robust at that point. But the model will actually report an entropy score, uh, which is a level of confusion or noise. Uh, and that entropy score will produce um, a guide to the human expert for further training. So if we move through the loop, a model produces uh, some proposed labels. Uh, that then allows uh, entropy sampling to predict 
will surface up examples that need further training. Uh, and then the human expert can continue that training process, but in a very guided way. Uh, and we spin this process multiple times. Just a little bit more detail here in terms of that process. Um, really looking here more at a high entropy situation to the right hand side of that uh, sort of stack of bricks. A high entropy result works would, for example, be in the bottom right hand chart where the model cannot distinguish particularly well between, say, those various forms of vegetation cover. Um, and in some cases, those classes are quite similar. Um, the left hand side is an example where class A is nicely separated from the other classes. Um, so that's a quite an ordered situation. And that's what we're trying to achieve. So the models essentially are trying to move from right to left in terms of that bottom right chart uh, using this approach. So with that engineering, what we do is we, we bring together the uh, uh, data into a, into a presentation web-based interface. We surface this to some of our forestry partner experts who are very familiar with these terrains. Um, and the machine itself was reporting those high entropy samples. In this case, um, you'll see I've, I've just noted there this particular example, and I've got two views of the, of the site here, which I'll talk to you shortly. Um, the model was predicting that to be grass pasture. Clearly, that's not. Um, so the human expert would uh, re-annotate that um, example to a, a plantation seedling uh, category. Uh, so this is the approach we use um, over time to train and improve our models. In the end, we've captured around about 15,000 training samples across our project to, to, to produce our results. And a little bit more here on the sort of example um, training um, records or classes. So I've got six examples here. We had about 12 to 15 total class categories uh, across the project. Um, and you'll note a two, a two scale view here. And this was quite an important design decision we took for the model, which I'll talk about the architecture next. Um, we asked the trainer to and the model to understand context at a 70 by 70 meter resolution, sort of 5,000 square meters. Uh, and 10 by 10, 100 square meters. Uh, so that's the zoomed up view on the right hand side and the more scaled out view on the left hand side. Um, you'll note with the plantation seedlings example, that's pretty clear really in both views. Um, the second view, the harvest track, is not quite so clear. Without that context of site, is that a, a, a area of bare ground uh, or, or of harvest or is that actually a, a, a cutting site or a, a cutting track or a transport route? Um, so we found a two-phase view, a two-scale view was very uh, important to the, to the model and the architecture. So the network architecture itself, um, we used a patch segmentation approach here, training on those two image chip pairs. Uh, so we used sort of various combinations. We used an Inception Vision 3 from Google uh, uh, convolutional neural network model. We looked at UNET and, and other models, and we really concluded that this two um, sort of dual approach model was really the smartest approach in order to classify in the end that 10 meter by 10 meter patch of ground. Um, this, that allowed us really to, to really understand both, both scales quite nicely. Uh, and and the, the Inception 3 network is a very good compromise, if you like, between efficiency and performance uh, overall. So in terms of results, I've um, just got four or five examples here that explain so the, the end game and the, and the outcome from, from the approach. So left-hand side, I have here the, the original photo. The red boundary is the target area. So these target areas were, uh, are known to be forest in plantation, uh, and those, are, those, those sites are audited under the New Zealand Carbon Accounting System model. So um, we're essentially trying to diagnose, um, has the land use fundamentally changed? Is it, is it, uh, has it been cleared and been replanted? Is it simply cleared and perhaps being prepared for replanting or has it been converted to another land use? Um, so the inference result you'll see in the center, this is the, the final result from our models. Uh, and we've got some categories there in the legend below. Um, largely the model's done a pretty good job here. It's, it's revealed that this is largely harvest site cutover. Um, it's picked up some definition of, of tracks and, and, and built forests, which is the sort of harvest sites and so on. Some sections of pasture sort of outside the polygon, bottom right, top left, uh, and some more mature forests. You'll see some more mature exotic forests bottom bottom left there. We run a final 
uh, filtering process across the data, really to remove speckle and remove what we consider inconsequential um, uh, areas, if you like. So the smaller uh, little patches of, for example, seedling plantation that the model has found, visibly it's it's determining that some of those smaller sites may be plantation they may be well uh, indeed plantation but in terms of overall scale that's not material to this site so the final classified polygon data set is to the right and our end of our decision criteria is not replanted in this case a more complex example here uh, we're seeing uh, a site that is that has had replanting in the center uh, and the top right um, however, around the edges of the of this this location, we're seeing still a lot of cutover, and and it's not clear to the observer uh, and to them therefore to the model that the the site is fully replanted. So the conclusion here is a partial replanting, uh, and these results go into an ongoing surveillance process. So every four years, if if there's not a conclusive result in the subsequent survey, then there's a uh, a landowner discussion around that that site and and how it's managed under the uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, program. An even more complicated side, and I wanted to show this one for a couple of reasons. Um, we have some fairly mature native forest here in this example, and the models pick that up rather nicely. Um, we have some plantation uh, or some cutover and emerging vegetation appearing sort of in the, in the right-hand side of the frame. We're also seeing some of that dark shadow through the winter photography here. And what we've done with that is, these are these sort of no data pixels uh, in the center and scattered throughout, is to uh, hold those um, as no data and not, um, not record those, just because that can actually sway the model uh, towards um, you know, an error position. Um, so that was sort of how we, how we handled that scenario. And the last one, which is a really quite a nice one, this is sort of the ideal outcome that most of the uh, data we're working with um, we want to produce. Um, and this is sort of the best practice where a site is fully replanted, it's appearing very clearly, um, and therefore it's a, it's a very clear and simple decision to, uh, to, to assign that as fully replanted. So in conclusion, uh, just some sort of key learnings from, from our project and, and what it means. We've found that deep learning is really very effective at learning patterns uh, in this sort of complex type terrain. Um, we've got a lot of heterogeneous um, land cover. Um, the data is complex and, and noisy and a bit ambiguous in places. Um, we find a dual multi-scale convolutional neural network model is quite a powerful technique, which sort of changes the problem from semantic segmentation to image classification at that 10 meter by 10 meter uh, patch, which is sort of what we think the human brain is is designed to do. So our training apparatus became far easier and faster to work with uh, on that basis. Um, active learning is a very robust method to, to, to train and quickly train in, in a very targeted way. And overall, the, the models we've, bu we've built here will hopefully have long-term future use. They, providing the imagery is similar, um, the, the training libraries and the, and the models architecture itself will allow ongoing surveillance, really lifting a lot of the cost and the repeatability and the effort out of future um, modeling work uh, for the Ministry for the Environment. So with that, I will pass back to the Chair and, and happy to take questions. So, thank you very much, Matt. That's that's quite something what you've shown. It's also very relevant if I think of the forest fires and wildfires in, in California at the moment, or it's actually globally, the forest depreciation also if I think of Asia. So for the questions, I would hand over to Kerstin. I would remove the speech now and add the questions we have received so far. Fantastic. Thank you again, Matt, for this presentation. I think it was really interesting and I'm sure all of our delegates also very much appreciated it. Um, so I will just start um, with the very first question, um, which is quite a long one. So Google Maps Endgame is having all places mapped. Um, recent statements from Facebook point in the direction that they aim for mapping all buildings, including interior. Uh, where do you see the end game for forest management? A global database, or what do you think is going to happen in our sector? That's a good question. Certainly, in the in the built environment, uh, yeah, there is quite a focus on building, you know, large 
definitions of, of buildings, of roads, of uh, infrastructure. Uh, but mm -hmm. those are more permanent structures, I think, in forest and natural landscapes. There's a, there's a change detection mentality that's probably going to prevail, which is using these sorts of techniques to produce point in time views of, of land cover. Um, and the value probably is in the models and that, that, that long term payback on can I then look at change across time through models? Yeah. So, not so much producing uh, a long term mapping data sets point in time, the ability to at any point in time uh, detect, detect change and look at current state. Yeah, makes sense. And then you pointed it out during the presentation, but could you maybe highlight once again why you didn't use satellite imagery? Yeah, we thought long and hard about this, and obviously it would have probably saved a lot of cost um, in some some respects. Really, in, certainly in New Zealand, and I think in any geography where there's such a wide uh, uh, coverage required, the, the kind of confluence of, of time of day, so it must be daytime, it must be really a good sun angle, it must be a cloud-free or near cloud-free, um, and, the, and these are small sites. So often the satellite companies have a minimum tasking size, and they're sort of designed for large-scale mapping not very small scale dis distributed mapping. So it sort of brought the, the aircraft into frame. And we did look at the other end of the spectrum with drones as well, but the amount of data management required to, to connect that data together and make that all work was, was even more laborious. So in the end, we felt relatively low flight fixed wing aircraft, um, not ortho rectified. So a single or two or three photos over a site was mm -hmm. the fastest, most efficient approach. Okay. Next question was, how many trees are needed to be classified as a forest? What did you use as a classification for a forest? It's a very good question. We, we didn't do any sort of counting as such, although that is, we think, quite a uh, achievable outcome, especially with this, this type of imagery. Mm -hmm. We were looking at the spectral response, really, of the vegetation. So we had experts in some ground truthing where we were looking at uh, uh, various species and the, the nature of native species versus exotic. Um, so it was more the spectral texture and color and 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 how that appeared on in the imagery rather than the, the density or the number of, of trees. Yeah, I feel like that's also a very specific thing to New Zealand, considering you have so many na native trees versus the ones that have been brought in later into the country. Definitely. Um, how much effort was needed for labeling the images? So how much of the project's time was invested in labeling? Did you any did you use any special tools or did you do that manually? Yeah, good question. The, the uh, little web browser interface that I showed with our active learning framework, we, we built uh, that a JavaScript application really to connect those algorithms into, into a, a more easy, intuitive uh, web application. So it wasn't a off the shelf tool, um, custom built for, for the project. We've developed that for, we think for, for other projects, an active learning web based interface is quite a strong candidate for training models quickly. The other part of the question in terms of time we spent, or well, probably around about uh, 50 to 100 person hours uh, training the model. We, we, we produced around about 20,000 annotations across 12 species or 12 land cover types. Okay. Um, is your service used anywhere else other than in New Zealand? No, right now we're using it only in New Zealand. We've done some work in fisheries and in uh, sort of urban surface mapping um, mm -hmm. in, in Australia and the US as well, but in forestry only in New Zealand. Okay. Leading into the next question, what's your next goals? Are you looking for new partners, clients, maybe going working with other governments other than the New Zealand one? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I'd love to talk to folks who've got a, an interest in this field and potentially see some value in, in, in similar types of projects. We uh, uh, believe that you know a continuous learning system is really the end game here where we're looking at an active learning framework, good neural network design, specialists like forestry experts who we partner with in this project. We've partnered with ecologists here in New Zealand for some wetland work, which uh, is another difficult category because they're quite heterogeneous surfaces. Um, fisheries is another one where the, a lot of fish species look very similar and it requires that that neural network design to separate you know species that are quite quite closely aligned so uh, and a lot of environmental natural habitat type monitoring and, and uh, 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 inventory type projects we think this is a there's, there's a lot of scalability here and love to talk to folks if they've got um, similar passion and interest in that field so you've all heard it get in touch with Matt and you can all in exchange the information you have. 
Um, thank you again for joining us so early, Matt. Um, thank you. And I'll give it back to Vienna. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Good. Thanks a lot, Kerstin. Uh, Matt, if you are looking for cooperations partners or something, uh, please do not hesitate. Either use the B2Match platform to, to set up one-on-one -on -one meetings or and or additionally send us a call to action that we will just in post on the LinkedIn channel of the conference. Wonderful. I'll, I'll do both. I'll be available on that uh, meeting channel and, uh, and happy to share some further information and talk to folks in Europe who might be looking at the same sort of uh, field and, and beyond, to be honest, anywhere. We are a yeah. global global world now, aren't we, as, as we can show with this type of conference. Yeah, and I could imagine that this is this topic is getting really hot. This is also, I mean, it's one of the reasons why we made the first, let's say, special topic applied to AI conference for forestry and the timber industry, because interest is spiking in the last months. And I don't think it will fade away, especially given the climate situation and in general, the environmental situation. I agree. And, and to Kirsten's point, the, the, the wildfire scenario in a number of countries is, is a really important topic and issue and understanding how we manage that risk and monitor sort of, you know, fire, where fire breaks are and how that sort of fuel source is, is looking and changing is, is quite an important risk mitigate. Mis risk Especially mitigate. here in Austria, because we live in forest cities. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I a certain someone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very well, yeah. Thanks a lot to you, Kerstin. Thanks a lot to you, Matt. It was a pleasure to having you. Thank and you very much, appreciate it. We definitely stay in touch and I hope you still can enjoy some productive meetings afterwards. So, <laughs> see you I soon. Have, I hit. Yes. have a nice day in the future. On Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, have see a great you. evening. Bye. So, ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the official conclusion of today's event. Uh, thanks for staying with us for so long. According to the timer, we streamed for exactly nine hours and 27 minutes. Yeah, if you have any questions or suggestions, please do not hesitate to either write us on, on our LinkedIn channel or contact us through the B2Match platform. The, the one-on-one -on -one meetings are still possible to schedule until tomorrow noon. And yeah, if any question pops up or if you have an idea for an additional event or you would like to give a presentation at one of the, of the next events, which will surely take place next year, just ping us. And with that, have a nice evening and see you soon again. Bye-bye.